Hello everyone! This will be a quick intro for what essentially represents the creative outlet of my life from over the last two years. This stupidly long video is in reality just 16 videos that I made one after the other, covering my blind journey through the Fire Emblem mainline franchise. Starting from me knowing almost nothing about the series when I picked up the first game, to having hundreds of hours of experience when tackling three houses. I present this whole retrospective series to you today simply for your long-form enjoyment. Obviously, after the first game's video, the time codes that are on the screen will not be accurate. However, if you look in the description or on the YouTube player itself, I will include chapter markings for each part of the individual videos. This is easily the most amazing project that I have ever embarked on in all of my years on YouTube. I hope you also enjoy it. Let's get started. Fire Emblem, Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light was released on April 20th, 1990 in Japan. It has never received an official Western release, and although a number of fan translations exist online, only the truly dedicated can be said to be very wise about the game. For this video, I played through it nearly three times over, and although there is a layer of Famicom-era mechanical limitation, extreme punishment for failure, and very complex leveling and character value systems to learn, I would never say that my time spent experiencing the debut title in the Fire Emblem series was wasted at all. Whether that time would be a waste for others is a different sort of question, leading me to the crux of this video. Would I recommend anyone else actually go back and play this game? Oof. What? Oh shit. No! Damn it, Gordon! Okay. I didn't really like Gordon. <laughs> That's a complicated question that requires a complicated answer. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I'm going to take a step back and take a broader look at this game in its own context. Perhaps through the explanation of the kind of experience that lies waiting here, you just might be able to make up your mind for yourself. For the purposes of brevity and simplicity, I'm going to be simply referring to this game as Fire Emblem Dark Dragon for the rest of the video. This is partly to shorten the name, and also to draw a distinction with its second remake from 2008, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon for the DS. The history of Fire Emblem Dark Dragon is also the history of its developer, Intelligent Systems. As far back as the mid-1980s, Intelligent Systems lended its programming support to many Nintendo classics, the most prominent of those being the original Metroid. By all accounts, the support lended to many of their early works was minimal, with the first game that they are solely attributed to being Soccer. That's it. That's the name of the game. Just Soccer. Soccer wasn't the only single-word titled simulation game that Intelligent Systems had a hand in making, with others including tennis, baseball, and golf. The development of the game that would become the first Fire Emblem began in 1987, as Intelligent Systems started to turn away from creating simulation games, with designer and writer Shouzo Kaga conceiving of a game that combined the strategic elements of a previous game by Intelligent Systems, Famicom Wars, with the elements of a role-playing game such as 1987's Final Fantasy, or the 1986 classic Dragon Quest, both of which were incredibly influential in Japan and the West. The result of this mixture was Fire Emblem Dark Dragon, which included the creation of a hero who has now become iconic of the series, Marth. Before I go into the story of this game, as a warning, there will be full spoilers, and perhaps more critically, while the overall thrust of the narrative is pretty straightforward, the extreme speed at which Marth goes from place to place around the entire continent can make it sound like a bunch of place names and people being thrown at you in all too short a time. I've done my best to make it a bit more understandable, but if you want to avoid spoilers or some head scratching, go ahead and click to the timestamp on screen right now. Also, as another quick note, there are a lot of different translations for the places and names that I'm going to be talking about, so I'm just going to use the ones that are on my map and were actually used in the translation that I played. Alright then, let's go. Music 
100 years before the events of the game, Akania, which is our setting for the entire game, was invaded by the Durhua Empire, led by the titular dark dragon Medius. Marth's ancestor, a young man named Anri, used the Holy Blade Falchion to destroy Medius, and a century of peace began. Two years before the start of the game, Medius was revived by an evil sorcerer named Garneth, who was in control of the mage country to the northwest, Cadane. With the Dark Dragon revived, the Durhua Empire and Garneth's Cadane allied with the western kingdoms of Grunia and Macedonia and waged war to take over the continent. Marth's father, King Cornelius of Arisha, took up Anri's sword, the Falchion, to battle Medius once again, leaving his two royal children, Marth and his sister Elise, in the care of the allied kingdom of Gra. Unfortunately, everything goes wrong when Gra betrays their ally, resulting in King Cornelius being killed, the Falchion being lost to the enemy, and Marth and Elise being attacked. In the struggle, Marth's sister sacrifices herself to be captured so that Marth can escape, which he does so accompanied by only a few knights. Among those include his most loyal of all, the veteran knight Jagan. The young Marth is able to find shelter in the far eastern kingdom of Talus, which is ruled by a kind king who is accompanied by his daughter, the Pegasus knight Sita. Living two years in exile from his home, the game begins with Marth at the age of 16, determined to finally set out on a journey to reclaim the Falchion, his sister, and his home. This actually begins when Talus is suddenly invaded by pirates, against which Marth leads his knights, along with Princess Sita, to fend them off. With some encouragement from the King of Talus, Marth finally leaves alongside the princess. Though many different types of battles will play out through the total of 25 missions, the most important ones happen when Marth arrives at a major location and liberates it, bringing new allies into his group with every step. This results in his group slowly beginning to be called the Liberation Army, and after gaining a few allies in the mountains east of his initial destination, such as the skilled swordsman Navarre, Marth's first major accomplishment on his journey happens within Orleans. Alongside the local Duke Hardin, who is actually an important character in the later remakes, Marth is able to liberate the country of Orleans and find the princess of a separate kingdom being held within, the Princess Nina of the large kingdom of Akania, the nation which also shares the name of the entire continent, and it is Nina who then grants Marth the Fire Emblem. In this game, the Fire Emblem is mostly just a symbol of Marth's authority, and is a rallying cry for his army. It is from this point on where you start to feel his legitimacy precede him. Commanders will curse at the arrival of his army, and usually suffer due to their poor leadership and cruel management before being crushed by him. Along the way to his next destination, which is Nina's homeland of Akania, Marth encounters a frustrated Princess Minerva of Macedonia on the battlefield, although she quickly abandons the front line, frustrated by the local commander's incompetence. Minerva then sends a secret message to Marth, explaining that she only serves Durhua due to her younger sister Maria being held as a hostage in a prison nearby. She implores Marth to set her sister free, and explains that until he does, she will have to continue to pretend to be against them. Although the others are suspicious, Marth decides to trust Minerva, and after rescuing her sister, Minerva stays true to her word and swiftly joins his side. This doesn't add much army strength to Marth yet, as her and her sister are basically outcasts from their homeland, which is still ruled by their cruel brother. But Minerva, alongside her allies the White Wings, Pegasus Knights, Katria, Pala, and Est, who are Ciri's staples, are some of the most skilled and renowned warriors in the continent. With the princesses of Macedonia freed, and with his several new powerful allies, Allies, the group finally heads to Princess Nina's homeland and liberate it together. Marth and company next travel to the small country of Gra, the kingdom which betrayed his family and ultimately was responsible for his father's death. He hopes that he will be able to find the Falchion here, but after liberating Gra, the Holy Sword is still nowhere to be found. Luckily, they are able to deduce that Garnef is the one who took it after his father's death and head to the land of Cadain to confront him. Arriving in the Magic Land, they are able to encounter Garnif, but find that he is completely untouchable due to his incredible magical power. Forced now to retreat, Marth is surprised to be suddenly telepathically contacted by the powerful sage Goto, who informs him that only the power of a magic called Starlight can take on Garnif's own dark magic. In order to gain this power, Marth must obtain the orbs of Star and Light and meet Goto personally in Minerva's homeland of Macedonia. Before setting out for this, Marth and company head south to his own homeland, the still subjugated land of Arisha. At long last, he liberates it, and while praising his beloved allies who got him this far, they soon discover that Princess Elise, along with the Falchion, is also being held captive by Garnef. 
With even more pressure to confront the Dark Sorcerer as soon as possible, they immediately head west to the Fane of Raman, a holy sanctuary where many treasures are being held by the Divine Dragon Tribe, including the orbs that Marth is seeking. It is here where a trap is laid for him, utilizing the brainwashed princess of the Divine Dragons, Tiki. With the help of her grandfather, Bantu, one of Marth's allies who had been seeking his granddaughter since near the start of Marth's journey, Tiki is brought back to her senses, and Marth gains an incredibly powerful ally in her, at the same time as retrieving the two orbs that he needs. The only thing that remains between him and gaining the power of Starlight are the countries of Grunia and Macedonia, which he fights through, first by besting the sympathetic Grunian general Camus, who had set Princess Nina free and was loved by her, followed by the completely unsympathetic Michaelis, Minerva's evil brother who is finally taken down here. While in Macedonia, Marth finally meets face to face with Gotol, who creates the magic of Starlight for him. With this in hand, he speeds back to Kadane and confronts the sorcerer Garnif in his tower, and by using the magic to finally defeat him, Marth obtains the mystic sword Falchion and reunites with his sister. With all other countries of the land liberated, wielding the mystic sword Falchion, and accompanied by his numerous powerful allies, Marth, who is also known as Star-Lord Marth at this point, arrives in the remains of the Durhua Empire, and after cutting through the near-endless dragon army, defeats the seemingly unkillable dark dragon Medius in his stronghold. As the many allies who joined Marth's liberation army during what had been three years of war go off to continue their lives, Marth and Sita settle down in his homeland and declare their love. As the people now set their minds to reconstruction instead of war, it's a happy ending for all. And despite this adventure being rather epic in scale, spanning multiple cities and kingdoms, this is overall a pretty simple story. Unfortunately, the way that I told it is not the way that the game tells it. This story summary which I just went through was put together from my own experiences with the game, this very handy map which I wish could have found some kind of representation, and a whole lot of research. For those who don't look this up before they begin to play, the only story to go on in-game mostly happens just at the beginning and end of chapters, where you will get a sudden burst of text from somebody with little time for elaboration. I assume that this is due to the era in which this game released. Introductions to these characters are meant to be done by looking through the instruction manual, and it is assumed that if you are playing the game, you already took the time to look up where the places you're going to be traveling to are in relation to each other. I had no idea what was going on for most of my playthroughs, and it was only in the writing of this video that I could start to retroactively put what I had experienced together into a coherent order of events. All things considered, the journey Marth takes does make sense, with just enough twists placed in it to keep him from taking too direct a path to his goals. Even though he is mainly going from important place to important place and slaughtering commanders, there are a number of missions which take place outside of the main plot locations, where Marth just has to fight through the resistance which is mustering against his own actions. Which actually does give his journey a kind of friction, and makes it into an interesting struggle once it is finally understood. Overall, I have to call this plot a success, but there is a huge disparity between what is written and what is actually delivered. I have no doubt that this is certainly an area which later games will fix, and I'm also especially interested in seeing how this game's own two remakes handle in delivering it. While the characters Marth meets in this game are many, of which several will go on to be icons for the franchise, in reality, in this plot, outside of Marth and Nina, there is actually very little character development to go around. This is mainly due to the harshness of these battles, and the severe consequences that you can suffer for carelessness, or in some cases, a simple lack of foresight for the tricks that the game is going to throw at you without mercy. Though you may come to treasure some of your soldiers, mostly due to their stats and rarely from their simple personalities, when they fall in battle, they are gone forever. Literally the only character whose death can cause a failure state in the game is Marth, and any particular soldier that you intend to keep through all your battles had better be tough as nails and experienced. As such, it is much wiser to pick a consistent team of heroes early on, and level them exclusively in order to make them as tough a squad as possible. And although they will never be death-proof no matter how much you grind, due to the prevalence and devastation of critical attacks, three or four extremely high-level soldiers can be way more destructive than ten low-level characters due to this game's battle mechanics. 
Each mission will generally play out like this. Before a battle starts, you will select 10 or sometimes more soldiers in your army to bring with you into the fight. You can scan the battle ahead of time to get a sense for which characters to bring, however, there isn't much to think about here in terms of weapon matchups. This early in the series, there is no basic weapon type that has an advantage against any other. For example, swords do not counter axes or anything of the sort. Once the battle begins, you can move your soldiers around one by one, although the space that they can move isn't displayed to you, and instead must be kind of felt out by moving the cursor as far as it can go. This might seem appalling to modern Fire Emblem players, and may in some cases cause them to instantly turn away from this entry, but I was surprised to find out that this is really not as big a deal as I thought it was going to be. With this game's rather limited number of classes, it actually isn't very hard to quickly understand how far each character can go, and as soon as the third mission, I had already personally gotten a feel for it. Even in modern games, you still need to click on an enemy or ally to see how far they can move, and the only real difference here is that just a little bit more is now done in your head. After moving a unit within striking range of another unit, you can attack them with any weapon in their 4 item inventory, with damage being inflicted based on your unit's power, the weapon's strength, and the enemy's resistances. Your accuracy is based on the kind of weapon that you're using, and modified by the terrain that the target is currently standing on. The most accurate kind of melee weapon is the sword, and others, like the axes and spears, hit harder but are less accurate. The different types of terrain which will help the target's evasiveness range from the basic plains, which has no evasion advantage, to forests, hills, or even open water. While Dark Dragon does not have a classic weapon effectiveness chart, the few special weapons do kind of serve as one, giving you enhanced damage against specific types of units. These weapons include things like the Dragon Sword and the Night Lance, among a few others, and though they do give a strong advantage early on, they can sometimes feel a bit underpowered as the missions go on and your enemies get stronger. These weapons and others can be obtained in a number of ways in the game, either through enemy drops or by buying them in specific shops that are represented on certain battle maps. Inventory management for your character's weapons, spells, or items is a very important aspect of this game, and also one of its weakest. In order to get into why, I'm going to have to first establish a little bit of context. Battles in this game are where absolutely everything happens. There are 25 missions in total, and from the moment you start a new game and are thrust into the first fight, you will never move a character or access a menu that isn't inside one of these missions. There is no way to to adjust your equipment or items prior to a battle, and you can't manipulate the items a character is holding when a battle finishes unless you choose to take them into the next battle. On top of this, buying, equipping, trading, and dropping items are all actions that take up turns during a battle, and when it comes to buying items, only the character who's currently standing on a shop is able to buy from it. What this means is that once you have found your first shop that would allow you to buy stronger weapons, the most efficient way to fill everyone's four inventory slots with items from that shop would be to set up an actual queue line mid-battle, although ideally this is something that you do either as soon as the battle begins in the rare times where you start out by a shop, or at at the end of the battle, after you have already defeated all enemies and captured all the forts, which may leak reinforcements while you get your item management done. How it actually plays out is a nightmare. When you're ready to shop, you send any characters that you want to make purchases to make the ideal queue line. Then you'll send your first shopper into the shop square, and potentially use their action to drop any weapon or item that you no longer want to keep. Then you'll need to end your entire turn, where the enemy's turn will likely pass with no action. And when the next turn begins, you'll have your chosen shopper use their action to buy any items that you want them to have. They then cannot move from the shop once that action is finished. So, you have to end your turn again, let the enemy turn pass again, and then move the first shopper off of the shop square. You move the next shopper onto the shop, and then repeat all of this again. For every single character that you want to hit up the shop. Thinking of ways to handle your shopping or item distribution is a very important early game decision. One way that I recommend trying out is to use high mobility characters such as Pegasus Knights as a delivery man or delivery woman. You give them no items to hold and simply use their opened up inventory slots to buy weapons or items for the other characters, and use their mobility to deliver them to your units throughout the battle and then head back to the shops. In my second playthrough, I basically used one of my characters as a personal Amazon Prime, and although it did cut out on a lot of 
shopping queues, even this method was not efficient enough to fully avoid them. There's really no way around it. This system of item management is a chore, and I mean that in the literal sense. It is the thing that you have to do in order to keep the game working for you. Just like you have to throw out trash regularly at home to keep it from piling up and stinking up the whole place. As bad as this is, it actually isn't the largest hurdle that one has to overcome when it comes to enjoying this game. That honor goes to the game's undoctored run speed. I'm not quite sure how to say this without coming off as an impatient modern gamer, so maybe I'll try to head this off by giving some of my qualifications first. I began gaming in the early 90s, and I grew up especially loving JRPGs, starting from my elementary school days. My first RPG was Final Fantasy IV for the Super Nintendo, and my first Pokemon game was Blue. In my frenzy to get my hands on more JRPGs, I played through re-releases of the original three Dragon Quest games on my Game Boy Color, and I played through the original Final Fantasy games when they were released on the PlayStation 1, in the Final Fantasy Origins collection. The point that I'm trying to make here is that I am not a stranger to slower paced RPGs, and in general, I'm a pretty patient person. However, I am simply not patient enough for 50 hours of this. What you're seeing right now is the game's original run speed. The faster paced footage that you saw previously was the game running with a frame skip mode activated in Virtua NES, making the gameplay roughly twice as fast as usual. Everything in this game feels as if you're taking a modern tactical RPG and playing it at 50% speed. And let me again stress that on top of this, this is not a short game whatsoever. On my first playthrough, I played through the first five battles of the game at its intended speed, each of which took me about an hour to beat. As the game goes on, the battles get longer and longer, culminating in the final battle, which if done without going on a mad dash to the end while ignoring casualties, can drag on for nearly two hours, even at double speed. For most wanting to experience this game today, this situation results in a hard decision to make. Even with the item management issues, there is an excellent, although severely aged, tactical RPG experience to be had here, but nothing can save a tedious experience. Turning up the speed of the game makes it play in a similar fashion to a modern Fire Emblem, but the severe downside of this is that while you are increasing your own satisfaction, you will be absolutely murdering this game's excellent soundtrack. This is definitely a real shame, because there are some very memorable and catchy tunes to be heard here, the strongest of which to me is of course the classic Fire Emblem theme. Often, as I sat down with this game night by night to play, I would linger a bit too long on the opening menu, drawn in by the joy and encouragement that this track would inspire in me. Afterwards, I'd have to feel a bit sad before turning the game speed up and turning the sound off just so that I could enjoy myself. If you do decide to play the game with the speed up, I definitely recommend turning on the game's original soundtrack on a different device nearby while you play. Or if that's something that you can't do, maybe you can just take a moment to slow things down occasionally so that you can still enjoy the classic sights and sounds of this game together as they were originally intended. While most players' first challenge with Fire Emblem Dark Dragon is the struggle to find a way to make an enjoyable time out of it, with an understanding of this game's faults, as well as an appreciation for the wellspring of new ideas it brought to the table on a Nintendo console, it's really hard to come away too negative on the whole experience. My early nights playing the game were a rough couple of hours, and as the battles dragged on even at 200% speed, I questioned whether I really wanted to keep on proceeding through such an aged experience. However, when I decided to play the game again for a second time so that I could record it for my Let's Play channel, I found myself eagerly anticipating coming back to it time and time again, as there's definitely some kind of primal enjoyment to be found simply by having the fortitude that it takes to conquer the game and navigate its immense challenges. This second playthrough, where I managed to successfully beat it without a single recruited character's casualty, kind of, was immensely satisfying to pull off. Wand. Oh, there we go. Gordon! Come back! You useless burden! He's still holding his his messed up bow gun that he started the game with. Oh, I'm happy to see you, actually. Other than the final two battles, where the RNG and the inability to choose where your characters start out in a fight turned some of that fun into frustration, on the whole, I still came away from this Fire Emblem 1 experiment very pleased. The question remains, would I recommend anyone else to actually go back and play this game? The answer, in most cases, is gonna be a no. 
Unless you're someone like me who is foolishly devoted to playing through every single game in a long-running series first before allowing themselves to touch the newer stuff, I think it's safe to say that you can skip this whole experience. If, however, you just want to experience Marth's adventure for story or curiosity reasons, while I haven't gotten to them myself, remember that both Fire Emblem 3 Mystery of the Emblem for the Super Nintendo and Fire Emblem 11 Shadow Dragon for the DS are remakes of this one, and apparently have additional content on top of that. I think it's fair to say that if the developers think the game is so far out of date that they have already made two remakes of it, it might be safe to give this one a buy. On the other hand, if you want to play this game out of a kind of archaeological curiosity, playing through the first couple levels at this game's original pace can be a pretty eye-opening experience. Fire Emblem Dark Dragon was extremely influential back in its day, leading to a series which still remains beloved nearly 30 years later. In its time, with less competition back then for a player's attention, a slow-paced tactical battle was still an hour away from the real world, as you got lost inhabiting the role of a fantasy battlefield commander. It's really not a bad way to spend a few hours. Who knows, you might even find yourself getting determined to best it, just as I did. As for me today, I have more than a few hours to spend getting to know the second Fire Emblem adventure. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us to a new continent, and on to two brand new heroes, Alm and Celica. Be sure to join me next time as I explore the black sheep of the franchise, Fire Emblem Gaiden, for the Famicom. Thank you for watching. There's something of a strange conformity to be found within many of the Nintendo Company's long-standing series. The first game is The Trailblazer, which sets the bar and the standards, while the second game, although appreciated in its time, eventually becomes less remembered or liked due to it being too far away from the original vision. This is the case with Super Mario Bros. 2, The Adventure of Link, and quite a few more games I could mention. The second Fire Emblem game, Fire Emblem Gaiden, meaning Fire Emblem Side Story, absolutely fits right into this category. Released for the original Famicom on March 14, 1992, Fire Emblem Gaiden told the story of new heroes Alm and Celica and their intertwining adventures on the new continent of Valencia. Like its predecessor, Fire Emblem Gaiden was never released outside of Japan, and also like the previous game, it has received very complete English translations by fans, with the translation I played being much stronger and more understandable than the one for the first game. At a surface level glance, Gaiden appears to be just like any other game in the franchise. These battles look pretty much identical, with the same overhead grid-based combat of the previous and future entries, and most of the classes are recognizable immediately, yet still, without a doubt, Gaiden is the black sheep of the franchise. Why is that? Any person who's played it, in addition to the others, could answer that question right away. The underlying systems and mechanics of this entry are so completely different that it gives an uncanny feeling to the entire proceedings. Many of its changes and innovations were completely disregarded when moving on to later games in the series, again, exactly like the bevy of black sheep contenders in Nintendo's catalog. This brings me to the crux of this video, and what I will be attempting to answer. If most of the systems of this game were later discarded, does that mean that Gaiden is actually bad? Or that its new systems and mechanics were simply worth forgetting? The best way to answer this, rather than listening to anybody else, is to actually play the game for yourself, front to back. To best give my own answer, I completed Gaiden twice, and in the following segments, I will explain exactly how this game expanded upon the concepts of the previous game, and what its worth as an entry in this series adds up to, starting from the actual development of the game itself. Development for the sequel to the first Fire Emblem game began after the previous title, Fire Emblem Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light, became a confirmed success in Japan. The developer, Intelligent Systems, whose track record from before was mainly in giving programming assistance to Nintendo R&D 1, finally had a strong series of its own in order to move forward with. Fire Emblem 1 writer and designer Shouzo Kaga this time became the director on top of those prior roles, replacing Keisuke Terasaki. Returning as the producer was Nintendo legend Gunpei Yokoi, and returning to handle the music and sound design was Yuka Tsujiyoko. 
Together, these three were incredibly influential in the early days of Fire Emblem, and in what would be the first sequel to this franchise, a lot of emphasis was placed on addressing issues which the prior game carried. This manifested in sweeping changes to the inner systems, particularly targeting map navigation and item management, two areas which I think definitely needed improvements. But besides these tweaked mechanics, a much greater emphasis was also to be placed on storytelling. Kaga, in particular, wished to create a much stronger narrative than before, both in writing as well as in the ways in which it was told. This again led to sweeping changes with how the player interacted with the world. The results of their effort was Fire Emblem Gaiden, which despite its large amount of changes to the formula established in number one, definitely did not fail to please at the time. At release, Gaiden was positively received. Japanese critics, such as those at Famitsu, gave it a 28 out of 40, with some who played it there saying that they enjoyed it more than the first, while others called into question some design flaws while still being positive overall. For fans, it was quite liked at the time, doing well in popularity polls and showing that the team at Intelligent Systems could consistently deliver in this franchise. However, there was definitely still room to grow. Fire Emblem Gaiden has since been released on Japan's virtual console multiple times. For Japanese gamers, the release of its first official remake with Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valencia in 2017 was a nostalgic return to the early days of the franchise. But for Western fans of the series, the tale of Alm, Selica, and the troubled land they inhabited was a fresh experience and one that brought new, interesting characters and struggles for them to experience for the first time. Looking back at the way that the story was handled in Gaiden is sure to feel a bit quaint, but compared to the first game in the series, it's a whole new level of polish. True to its moniker of Gaiden, the second Fire Emblem game is not a direct sequel to the first, although certain characters from the prior game do appear. First, a word of warning. The following story segment is going to contain full spoilers. Please keep in mind that the most recent Fire Emblem game at my time of writing is Fire Emblem Echoes, a remake of this one. As far as I know, Echoes contain some additional scenes and some things will play out rather differently, but because the events of Gaiden will surely overlap, if you want to avoid all spoilers for either game, you can jump to the timestamp that is on screen now. Also, one extra note. The names and place names I will be using come from the translation which I played. I'm using the names that anybody else who goes on to play this game using the translation I've linked in the description will see. And for when those names change in the future, I'll be making notes of the official translations for both this and Fire Emblem 1's names when I actually get to the games that use them. I hope that that kind of makes sense and that we're all on the same page now, because it's time to start the story. Long before the events of the game, two gods lived in the land of Valencia, Mila and her brother Doma. Both of these gods carried certain values higher than others. The older brother Doma was obsessed with power and despised the corruption that he saw in mankind, whereas Mila valued love and peace above all else. Eventually, the disparity in their ideals led to the two gods splitting the land of Valencia in two, with the north ruled by Doma and the south ruled by Mila. As centuries passed, two kingdoms sprang up, the Doma worshipping land of Rigel to the north, and the Mila worshipping land of Sophia to the south. The two gods had a heavy hand in influencing their respective kingdoms, and thus the people eventually became reflections of them, with the Rigelians valuing power and the Sophians valuing peace. And, much like the gods before them, these clashing ideologies eventually led to tension. In order to avoid disaster, a pact between the two nations was made, forbidding the gods and their countries from warring. But regardless over time, the tension continued to rise. It is in this moment of turmoil that two children were born to the separate royal families of Rigel and Sophia, who would soon find their countries engulfed in war. After some time has passed, the first chapter of Fire Emblem Gaiden begins, from the perspective of Alm, a 17-year-old man growing up under the tutelage of the Knight Mycen, in the southwestern village of Ram in Sophia. Alm's friends, whom he trains with, are the local villagers Robin, Gray, and Cliff, and they have a pretty normal peaceful life. However, this is all shattered when Luca, a soldier of the Sophian kingdom, arrives, bringing news of a sudden attack on Sophia Castle that has killed the king and seized the capital. The war, which many felt coming but was supposed to be forbidden, had finally broken out. However, in response to the sudden aggression, a Sophian liberation army had arisen, and Luca had come to the village in search of the famous General Mycen in order to have him assist them. When approached with the opportunity, Alm is surprised to find the Great Knight refused to take any part in this fight 
and naturally our hero Ulm offers himself up instead. And alongside his loyal village friends and Luca, they set off together to meet up with the rest of the resistance and to take back Sophia Castle. Along the way, Ulm fights through bandits and camps of Regellian soldiers, freeing captured innocents with each step, until he is finally face to face with Clive, the leader of the Liberation Army. After Clive admits that he sent Luca to Ram in order to get Myson to lead them, the position is instead offered to Ulm in light of his recent victories, to which Ulm agrees and becomes the leader of the resistance. Before setting out for the castle, Ulm learns what it is that allowed this war to happen. The goddess Mila, who would have protected Sophia in the case of war, has suffered a sudden disappearance, suspiciously shortly before the Regellian kingdom invaded and took Sophia with little resistance. With only Ulm and his new army to defend the land, he launches his attack on the captured castle, and after successfully cutting through the Regellian defenders and driving their commander General Dozer out, his liberation army succeeds in freeing the land for now. Even though he has control of the castle, Ulm really has no desire to claim it for his own, and instead he sets about finding the lost princess of the now slain royal family, and to also prepare for the eventual Regellian counterattack. With much to think about, Ulm is surprised to meet Mysen in the castle, who tells him that he now accepts that Ulm will have to find his own path in life, and that he knows that a certain red-haired girl who will help him will soon be arriving. As chapter 1 of this game ends, we can already see that a lot has changed in terms of storytelling since Fire Emblem Dark Dragon, and that the story itself is also being communicated in a much clearer fashion. There are a lot of unanswered questions raised in these opening events, but for now, chapter 2 begins as we take command of Selica, the red-haired girl whom Myson mentioned. Selica is a priestess in a priory on the islands to the southeast of Sophia Castle. In truth, she is actually the missing princess of Sophia who had been sent away to the priory in order to protect her. Although her father father is now slain, she is reluctant to return to the castle and lead her people, and instead focuses on solving a different crisis. Selica, as a priestess of Mila, is for now more concerned with the strange disappearance of the goddess, something which her caretaker, the bishop Noma, agrees must be looked into, as the return of the goddess can stop all further war without issue. Alongside her magic-wielding friends, Selica departs by ship, battling her own way through hordes of undead creatures roaming the land and pirate crews roaming the seas, before she finally arrives at Sophia castle. Upon arriving, she is surprised to find her former caretaker, Knight Myson, there, and that the castle had already been liberated by a local hero, someone whom she had been very close to in the past. Alm and Selica had once been both under the care of Myson, before he was forced to send the secret princess away in order to protect her from a plot to kill off the Sophian royal children before the oncoming invasion by Rigel. Myson now sends Selica to speak with Alm, and the two are happy to reunite after many years apart. While it is clear that the two care for each other, Destin pulls them apart yet again, as Alm has become convinced that the only response to the recent attacks is to retaliate against the North, while Selica instead focuses on her original target of bringing peace through the return of the goddess Mila. With Alm still unaware that the missing princess that he's seeking is actually his childhood friend, Chapter 3 begins as the two depart Sophia Castle, and for the first time, the player can continue their two stories simultaneously. Alm's goal takes him west to Dozer's Fort, while Selica heads east to the Temple of Mila. At Dozer's Fort, Fort, Alm manages to catch up to and slay the slimy General Dozer, retrieving a legendary sword which Dozer had stolen from the castle, which Alm mysteriously is able to wield despite it being enchanted to prevent anyone except for those with the royal blood from using it. At the same time as this, Selica liberates a captured priestess of Mila from the leader of the pirate gang whom she had been fighting back at sea. This priestess gives her a royal circlet which proves her identity and her true name, as the Princess Antes of Sophia. Back to the west, Alm next leads an attack on the Sluis Gate, which the Regellians are attempting to keep closed in order to flood the land of Sophia. After defeating the Domo worshipping Arcanist Tartara, from whom he is able to rescue a new ally from mind control, he finds the Sluis Gate still stuck, as it cannot be operated without cooperation from a second one at Mila's Temple. Fortunately, Selica had just then arrived at the temple, and after freeing it from the dark shamans of Dolma who had taken it over, she finally learns the fate of the goddess Mila. Shortly before the invasion, the dark god Dolma had given King Rudolph of Rigel a special sword called the Falchion, a blade which was capable of sealing away a god. After an attack on Mila's temple by the king himself, the goddess had been sealed away into the blade, and the blade had then been given to the high priest of Dolma, Jeddah, who sealed it beneath his tower to the north. With both Alm and 
and Celica now needing to head further north. Both gates are activated, which lowers the river and allows both of them to continue forth as Chapter 4 begins. Like in the previous chapter, players are given control of both Alm and Celica simultaneously, with Alm's side of the adventure seeing him cut through even more enemies' forces before arriving at the infamous Dragon Mountain. Atop this mountain, Alm is suddenly trapped when both ways of escape are cut off leaving him and his soldiers to endlessly fend off the undead creatures which live atop it. With Alm in mortal peril, to the northeast, Selica arrives at the Tower of Doma, and confronts Jedha, who instead of attacking, shows her a vision of Alm struggling to his death atop the mountain. He offers her a deal. He will use his magic to free Alm, but only if Selica allows herself and her friends to be sacrificed to Doma. Selica, who of course is in love with Alm, ultimately agrees, and surprisingly, Jedha remains true to his word. He next takes Selica and her companions to the altar of Doma below, where they are to be slowly sacrificed, feasting the dark god Doma with their pain and misery. With Alm's way ahead cleared, he heads forth, cutting through the last of the Regellian defenders before arriving at the castle. After a long battle, he finally penetrates the castle's defenses, but he's surprised to find that the king refuses to attack him, and instead allows himself to be defeated. When the killing blow is landed on Rudolph, the king gives one last confession before his passing. Over time, the dark god Doma, who had once treasured power and despised corruption, began to lose his mind, something which also led the nation of Rigel into madness. In order to protect his son, King Rudolph had sent him away under the care of Knight Myson, whom he hoped could raise him into the kind of warrior who could eventually become powerful enough to stop Doma. As you might expect, Alm is secretly the king's own son, Albion Alm Rudolph. And before the king passes away, he urges Alm to recover the falchion, which rests in a passageway between the castle and Doma's tower, and use it to defeat the dark god at last. With the king's death, Alm is now the ruler of Rigel, and chapter 5 begins. In order to fulfill his father's last wish, Alm, who is now joined by Mycen, uses the underground passageway, and after a difficult test, he recovers the falchion. Taking it with him, Alm is able to arrive in time to discover Selica and her group still undergoing their torment by the servants of Doma. In a climactic final battle, Alm and Selica, together again at last, are able to rally their combined forces, slay the High Priest Jedha, and use the falchion to seal away Doma in the same way that the goddess Mila had been. With his last words, the god Doma passes on the land of Valencia to Alm, urging him to rule fairly with both his power and Mila's love. Following the war, Alm and Selica marry, and the lands of Rigel and Sophia are at last combined into the single kingdom of Valencia, and so begins a long and prosperous rule, the rule of the Holy King Alm I and of the Queen Selica. One of the greatest benefits of playing games in release order is how one is able to see exactly how a series is actually growing and improving without the knowledge of later games getting in the way. If one of Shozo Kaga's biggest priorities going from the first game to the second was connecting players more to the characters in the game while crafting a better narrative, then it's easy for me to say that what was delivered here was an unprecedented success. This is one of those rare, all-time great leaps up in production quality. And even though we aren't quite there in terms of developing each individual soldier on the field, Field, there's no doubt that the tale of Alm, Selica, and the fate of Valencia is a much more engrossing story than what had been seen previously. In just about every regard, the storytelling has been improved. And my favorite way that he did this was something that I believe a lot of stories, especially game stories, can benefit from, scaling things down. Even though Fire Emblem 1 and 2 both concern themselves in the affairs of spunky young heroes leading liberation armies against an overwhelming invading force, the land of Valencia is much better characterized than the land of Arcania. Even though Marth visits a total of nine kingdoms across his game, there really isn't much to say about the actual culture of the people in each land that he liberates. About the most we got there was that this is the place where the mages are, or there are lots of dragons here. I'm not trying to say that the plot of Gaiden is anything special, especially compared to games of today, or I'm assuming later Fire Emblem games. But what it really did which was significant was that it brought the series into step with other RPGs of its time. The stories of the early Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games were nothing to write home about, but they gave the necessary context for what you were doing and explained themselves well, and that's part of what gave them such a lasting appeal. Even without glancing at any explanations afterwards, I could have told you the story of Fire Emblem Gaiden from playing it, and that is significant because the first game left me scratching my head the entire time. It may seem like an obvious feature of any RPG, but the fact that this game has a world map alone does a lot to give players a sense of progress and place, even with 
with two protagonists. Mapping out the adventures of Alm and Selica versus Marth does a good job on its own of showing just how much more coherent this adventure is. Again, it isn't all perfect, just a huge step in the right direction. While the number of characters with actual personalities and development has increased, the majority of the cast of the game still consists of generic fighters, with their only individual features being a single unique portrait and some ending text in the credits. We are still far away from support conversations and quirky character writing for everyone in the cast, but characters like Alm, Selica, Mycin, King Rudolph, and the gods Mila and Doma are not ones that I'm going to forget anytime soon. All in all, I had a fantastic time experiencing the story, partly because I could actually understand it, but mostly because it does successfully use theming and some subtext to craft an interesting series of events for two likable, yet very different leads. However, while the storytelling of this game is a remarkable leap forward in quality, the changes in the mechanics and gameplay make for a much more complicated picture. In the very first Fire Emblem game, uh, director Keisuke Terasaki and his team managed to successfully set the groundwork for every game in the series thereafter. Comparing the first game in this franchise to the very latest shows a clear adherence to the same grid-based strategy-oriented mechanics for the last 30 years, something which holds true even if you do this with some of the 3D console entries, or gameplay from the first Fire Emblem for Nintendo Switch, Three Houses. Very few other game series as old as Fire Emblem can show such a correlation, even taking a look at Breath of the Wild, which was absolutely meant to be a return back to the design priorities of the very first Zelda, shows at a glance how the ways that the player interacts with the game has become orders of magnitude more complicated. That simply isn't the case with Fire Emblem. Every game in the franchise controls in the same basic way, and advances in hardware mostly just increase the gameplay speed and the quality in presenting the story. What differs with each entry here are the inner mechanics. In other words, it isn't the frame, but the engine that changes each time. And it is within this context that that the ways in which Gaiden differs from the rest of the series has forever given it the title as the Black Sheep Fire Emblem game. When the director's chair passed over to Shouzo Kaga, he set out not only to more effectively bond players to the characters through storytelling, but to also place an even bigger priority on addressing issues with gameplay in order to make Gaiden a much more pleasurable experience. To say that some of these changes were sweeping would be to undersell it. Under the titular premise of this game being a Gaiden, Kaga and his team felt safe changing things up quite dramatically dramatically, using not a scalpel but a sword in order to fix systems which were not meeting their expectations in the prior entry. In my last retrospective, I mentioned that although the first Fire Emblem game was a good old-school strategic experience under the hood, the speed at which it played made it a tedious chore which could hardly be tolerated, especially given the length and difficulty. It certainly was not lost on the team at Intelligent Systems that they had made an incredibly complex, unenjoyable experience, and almost all the mechanical changes made in Gaiden seem laser-focused on improving the tedium found in normal play. So, if you watched the last video, there's something that you might be asking. Does this entry still play as intolerably slowly as the last game? Well, the answer is no, but in the context of our modern expectations of the speed at which strategy games, and especially Fire Emblem games, should play, it is still pretty slow. Almost everything in this video is going to be the sped up footage at which I actually played the game. On my first playthrough, I made it into Celica's chapter until I chose to speed things up, mainly due to this ridiculously slow animation. Again, I'm going to recommend modern players to speed up the game to whatever level you feel comfortable. And unfortunately, again, doing this will spoil the great soundtrack. At the very least, this is the last time I'm going to have to make this recommendation, because from here on out, the rate at which the games play becomes much better. Even though the Famicom technology limited the team in speeding up the gameplay, it's easy to see that in every other way, the team was doing their best to remove the other issues which turned the first game into a tedious chore. First of all, the item management nightmare that was one of Fire Emblem Dark Dragon's sorest spots is simply non-existent in Gaiden. There are no shops in the world, and in fact, you never earn currency of any kind. Although there is now an overworld to navigate, this is purely to get from battle to battle, and to allow you to visit some consistent locations for speaking to NPCs or grinding dungeons. When it comes to your individual soldiers, there are no item or weapon slots to even think about. In the previous game, all characters had four slots to fill with either items or 
or weapons. And on top of this, most objects, be it sword, tome, or key, would degrade as you use them, with them eventually breaking forever when used enough. This kind of system was perfectly fine. However, the trouble came with trying to manage so many individual inventories, which completely lacked a central form of storage. In short, the inventory system was severely in need of reworking. Unfortunately, Gaiden's answer was to just cut it. Now, other than a single special item slot for each character, nobody has or needs an inventory. Instead, each character is already holding a weapon befitting their class, which will simply never break. There are no decisions to make between using swords or shields, or making spaces for healing items or keys, and there's also no way to upgrade. The replacement of this system is kind of a double-edged sword. While making ridiculous digital queue lines at shops is a thing of the past, which is a good thing, this also means that there's less preparation and strategy to think about outside of just how to kill things. It's kind of hard not to feel mixed on this simpler system, especially when some parts of it show signs that the team was halfway to getting the original inventory system perfected anyway. As I mentioned, all characters have one and only one space for special items. This space is used to hold a number of different kinds of items, like weapons or shields or rings. They all will use the same spot. The best way I can demonstrate how this works is like this. Let's take a standard archer as an example, which in Gaiden has an attack range of 2, which means that he can happily fire arrows in that range all that he likes, because his default bow will never break. Certain enemies in this game might drop a special bow item, which can be given to her archer, taking up his single special equipment slot. Special weapons like this also do not have durability, and what it will do is massively increase his range and damage at the cost of reducing his speed. Our archer can still do what he could do before, but he's just upgraded with lower speed. This isn't his only option, as putting other items in the slot will benefit him in a couple different ways, like a shield giving him increased defense, or a ring which could give him healing each turn or extra luck. He can't use special swords or spears, but of course, other units can. Just like in the previous game, soldiers can pass or exchange items that are in this special slot. And thank god there is also a way to manage these items outside of the battle as well, working exactly as you might expect. This might not seem like a big deal to you, but for anyone who has struggled through the original game, and I have, I gotta tell you, this is a really big deal. It doesn't even end here though. Given that this game has two protagonists who each create their own separate armies, who therefore can't easily exchange items, Gaiden thoughtfully has special NPCs found in a variety of locations in the game world, which allow you to send any of these special items on one-way trips between Celica's group or Alm's group. Here's a uh, pro tip by the way, send the angel ring that Celica's group can pick up to Alm's group before going on to her last battle in chapter 4. Believe me, you'll thank me later. The fact that these trade NPCs were even thought of being put into the game definitely shows the huge amount of self-awareness that the developers had when it came to acknowledging the former game's flaws. It's not a perfect solution, but without a doubt, they are hitting on the right idea. I'm not so sure that everyone will have the same feeling when it comes to the magic system. Rather than the mages in this game casting spells from magical tomes in their inventory, for the first and I believe only time in the Fire Emblem series, magic users learn new spells by gaining levels, and rather than being limited in castings by the remaining durability on their tomes, mages are limited instead by each spell costing health in order to cast. This may sound like a bizarre system, and admittedly it kind of is, but it isn't a design which goes wholly against the gameplay priorities of the series, and in fact it kind of fits extremely well into this game's overall mechanics. Each of the two main characters' journeys in this game are remarkably different, with Alm's battles being the more militaristic soldier-on-soldier -soldier combat, and Celica's being more against monsters using an assortment of magic users. As each of her allies uses up bits of their own life in order to burn the abominations before them, Fire Emblem Gaiden does a great job at teaching one of its core strategies, which all players of the series need to learn, especially new players, and that is the importance of positioning. In my first playthrough of Fire Emblem Dark Dragon, the first game, I was able to get through most of the early battles by just advancing carefully, letting most of my enemies come to me themselves and then dogpiling on them repeatedly until I won. This was a strategy which worked for me until the battle at Port Warren, where the rush of the overwhelming horde of enemies had me getting wrecked with this previous strategy. The solution to that situation was to stop thinking about each member of my army as an individual soldier, but instead as just one piece of a formation of soldiers which could be altered as necessary. 
Think about it like this. If four enemies are advancing on your front lines, any ally that is not standing next to another is able to be attacked a maximum number of four times per turn. Given that most units, even some of the strongest ones in the game, cannot last being attacked twice or three times consecutively, leaving any soldier in such a position during an enemy's turn is suicide. However, by positioning an ally next to the previous unit, you are already lowering the number of times that they can be attacked. As you continue to spread your units out, connected to each other, even in just a simple line formation like this, you're not only reducing the number of directions from which they can be attacked, but increasing the real estate of space that your troops are inhabiting on the battlefield, which forces your enemies to get around them if they want to attack any person more than once. This is exacerbated when you're using your formations in tandem with each map's landscapes and choke points. These are just the basics of area defense in a 2D grid map, and if you're familiar with the board game Go, these are the exact kinds of concepts that beginner players of that game must learn. And realistically, it's really just coming to understand how the surface area around a single piece on a grid changes simply by placing it next to another. It seems like simple stuff, but for new players, it's an important skill to learn. And the lessons that you learn in positioning take an even higher priority in the second Fire Emblem game. Early on in Chapter 2, when Celica departs her island by boat, she finds herself under a attack by pirates. Even though battles like this ship one will quickly wear out their welcome due to their eventual overuse, in these early pirate battles, the abundance of ranged attackers on Celica's side makes the solution to this battle especially clear. You need to choke the point with someone who can take some hits, and get your ranged users in positions where they can all blast the boarding party apart. Due to your magic users having health loss from each time that they attack, you really cannot afford to let them be vulnerable. And the best way to ensure that they are not attacked after they use some magic is to use your formations to limit the enemy's movement and attacking potential. In other words, this is a level which teaches the basics of positioning in a Fire Emblem game much less punishingly than the Port Warren chapter. Good positioning and creating formations are skills which will last the player throughout the entire game, just becoming more complicated or flexible as each player becomes more confident in their learning of the AI systems and of their own limits. I actually do kind of like the health for magic system, if only for just how much it prioritizes positioning alone. It's a clever system of risk and reward, even if it is just exaggerating the vulnerabilities of casters to an extreme level in order to make its point. Many other great design decisions abound in Gaiden, at the same time sitting shoulder to shoulder with its massive blunders. Take, for example, the new Auto Command system. At any point in your turn, you can select one of these, which orders all of your remaining units to use their turn doing some kind of simple action, like going on the assault towards the nearest enemy, or simply gathering up around either Alm or Celica. These commands can cut out huge amounts of wasted time. However, the Assault command is of very limited use, and can very easily change from being an efficient time saver to just a suicide button. Using this command will have all of your units who haven't used their turn yet attack whoever is closest, which ignores the all-important sense of self-preservation that this game requires. This is especially deadly with high mobility characters like Pegasus Knights, who are glass cannons whose every move has to be carefully considered in order to keep them from being caught out and slain. The Gather command, on the other hand, is one that I use constantly, and it really was a godsend, cutting out on a lot of the busy work of just moving units where I would want them to be anyway. But the fact that it is sitting right next to an option that can lose you the entire battle if you press it accidentally is a bit worrying to say the least. Next up on the enemy side, surprise reinforcements are no longer a thing. There are no forts to capture or surprises to worry about in the battles, something which cuts down on 100% of the frustrating, unforeseeable deaths that the first game could penalize you with. While you might think that this makes the battles less tense, which it kind of does, this mechanic is actually just replaced by the addition of a new enemy type, the Shaman. In the battles where they appear, enemy shamans can continually call in near endless hordes of monsters, ranging from weak shambling zombies to undead dragons with a crazy amount of mobility. There are a lot of brilliant changes here that make this a much more preferred system of adding in dynamic enemy reinforcements to a battle, simply from the number of balancing features which are included. For one, the monsters the shaman summons cannot attack on the turn that they appear, which gives you a chance to move an ally that may not have been in the best position before you were surprised. Secondly, healers on your side will eventually gain the ability to summon in shadow soldiers in a similar manner, who seem to be designed in order to draw enemy aggro, which can be an effective counter against a big horde of enemy summoned monsters. There is a downside to this, as one healer gains the ability to call in slayers, also called dread fighters, which can turn some of the strategy of the mid-game battles into simply pressing the ninja button in order to just let you win. 
Thirdly, there is also a spell for healers which can de-summon all but one or two of the enemy shaman's creatures. There are definitely drawbacks to each of these balancing mechanics, and none of them are really that well polished, but the fact that there are responses to these enemy reinforcements, and that you won't just suddenly be put in an awful position, is what makes all the difference here. Something that I like way less is what it takes to actually kill a shaman once you've reached them. Which brings me to what is perhaps this game's most ridiculous excess in design, the terrain bonus system. If you don't understand what I mean by terrain bonus system, in a nutshell, the kind of land that a unit is standing on will typically add to their evasiveness when they're attacked. In Fire Emblem 1, the strongest terrain evasion bonus that one could get was from standing on a castle or open water, both of which were unlikely events by the way, but it did give you an extra 30% chance to dodge. This is a strong defensive bonus to be sure, but it's definitely one that could be dealt with, and it wasn't always a sure thing if you were trying to defend your units. In Gaiden, however, these evasion numbers are super charged. Found in every map are certain pink squares, which not only recover health each turn to those standing on them, but also, for no reason that I can think of, give them an extra 40% to their evasiveness. Keep in mind that these are on every single map. If random healing squares, which made you more secure than standing on a castle wasn't enough, these gravestones, which are found in the undead battles throughout Celica's adventure, give an absolutely absurd 60% bonus. These and the other terrain types, which give greater evade bonuses across the board, start to look really ugly when combined with certain units. Like either the shamans mentioned above, dread fighters who already have great evasion and magic resistance, and other types of long-range units like archers. Shamans in particular will almost always be camped on one of these recovery points and they have no reason to move either. They're just going to be there summoning in their own endless army, defending themselves with ranged spells, dodging most hits that come their way, and healing off any chip damage that does connect. The extra high evasion in this game can become incredibly frustrating, and can also lead to some very ridiculous looking situations, such as this time when it took 17 of my soldiers just to bring down one unfortunately located dreadfighter, due to a combination of excessive evasion and resistances. Now I've had to kind of go up and down in these gameplay sections, which will just add further complication to my original question. Does this game actually hold up or not? Are its innovations worthwhile or not? Let's simplify this down. When you come to understand what Shozo Kaga and his team's design intentions were with this game, almost every bizarre system introduced here kind of makes sense. Personally, I do see a lot of promise in the systems that were implemented, and I actually kind of adore a good amount of them. Other Fire Emblem players looking back on Gaiden after seeing how the later games turned out will probably be less charitable than I am, which to be honest is kind of fair. If the one word that best described Fire Emblem 1's gameplay was tedious, then the word that best describes Gaiden's would be sloppy. The developers were sloppy when they dug out old systems and slammed new ones in their place. They were sloppy when deciding on the final numbers, which would define things like range, resistances, and especially evasion. I have to admit that it wasn't skillfully put together, and yet, despite everyone and their mother trying to warn me away from this entry, at the end of the day, I still kind of loved the experience of playing this game, far, far more than I would have expected. I can easily admit that the way that Fire Emblem Gaiden handled trying to improve on the former game was not a healthy way to handle developing the sequel. Maybe this was due to the change in director, but the product at the end of the day seems like it was a bit too willing to throw out the old and bring in the new. Like they were taking the Gaiden moniker a bit too literally, and felt like they absolutely had to alter everything under the hood in order for it to qualify as a side story. Without a doubt, Fire Emblem Gaiden has earned its Black Sheep status, but I want to stress, this alone doesn't make it a bad game. It truly does have some brilliant ideas and good intentions, which makes it such a shame that nowadays it's so easily disregarded. As far as I'm concerned, this is a much better starting point for anyone seeking one of the oldest Fire Emblem games to jump into the series with. I don't have to say that you have to be dedicated in order to see it to the end like I did in the last video, when all that I'm doing here right now is just recommending a game that is a bit annoyingly weird in parts, but still shamelessly fun to play. After journeying our way through the anomaly of the series that was Gaiden, our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective is going to be a familiar one. As the series steps into the 16-bit generation for the first time, we are about to return to the shoes of the heroic Marth for two adventures in one in Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem for the Super Famicom. I hope to see you there, and as always, thank you for watching.
In 1990, Fire Emblem Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light introduced a series and established a winning formula for developer intelligent systems. In 1992, the sequel Fire Emblem Gaiden continued that formula while making sweeping changes everywhere that took the overall design in a very different direction. These two Famicom games, both beloved in their own right and at their own time, represented solid paths that the company could model their future games on, as both held a lot of potential for refinement. Yet only one path could be taken. A series that is unsteady or unsure, changing drastically with every single release, is not a series that can withstand the test of time. If you're familiar with Nintendo's history, then the idea of the threes cycle is likely something that you've thought about before. The first game is the Trailblazer, classic but flawed. The second game is the Risk Taker, liked at the time but later seen as controversial and the black sheep now. What then is the third game? The answer, when it comes to Mario, Zelda, Castlevania, Dragon Quest, Star Fox, Kirby, and many more, is a masterpiece. By the third game in the series, the developers have learned what makes their game fun, and also they have learned how to inject new elements into that formula without straying too far away from the initial appeal. Many of these series found themselves in the same situation as Fire Emblem, needing to choose between the first game's style or the second's. Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem, like many of these other series, chose the first. Not only is the third Fire Emblem game a throwback to the original's design, it goes one step further as to include a remake of the first game on the same cartridge. Releasing in Japan on January 21st, 1994, Mystery of the Emblem went on to outsell both the first and second games combined, and cemented a love for this franchise throughout its home country. Over in the East, Mystery of the Emblem has been consistently rated highly as one of the best games for the Super Famicom, and it has seen multiple re-releases which have kept it alive for many of its loving fans. If you choose to take the dive on this one, you will quickly realize that Fire Emblem 3 is truly massive, with both the remake content and its original content, separated in the game as Book 1 War of Darkness and Book 2 War of Heroes, each taking as long as a normal Fire Emblem game. For this retrospective, I played through both of these books twice, in order to really get a good feel for the mechanics and the impact of this entry. When embarking on this massive endeavor, the question I most held in mind was, does this beloved entry into the series truly hold up, and does it deserve to hold the same kind of renown as the other famous thirds? I am going to be answering this question and more in time, but for now, let's stop for a moment and take a look at how this game came to be. The development of what would be the third Fire Emblem game began in 1992, still during the development of Fire Emblem Gaiden. In the early days of this series, three names stood out. The first was Shozo Kaga, the designer for the first game, designer and director for the second, and now designer and director for the third. Then we have the composer for the first two games, Yuka Tsujioko, who also continued her role here. Third, we have the legendary Gunpei Yokoi, who was the producer for this and the previous Fire Emblem games. Mystery of the Emblem was originally simply going to just be the sequel to Fire Emblem 1, expanding the story of Marth and his companions following their victory in that game. But eventually, it was decided to include a remade version of the original game as Book 1, with the original story content and stages being contained into Book 2. Not only were these sections divided in the game, they were also developed separately within the team, even having completely separate soundtracks made for them. This decision was only possible due to the extra storage space granted by this being the first Fire Emblem game for the Super Famicom, as well as this being the first game period to use a 24 megabit cartridge, and even with this, sacrifices had to be made. Five stages and several recruitable characters were forced to be removed from the Fire Emblem 1 section. Probably the most notable one of these characters was the Great Sage Goto, who still appears in the story but never steps in to help at the end as he did before. Personally, other than not having Goto at the end to help, I never really noticed these absences, as Book 1 is plenty long as is, but that's just me. Regardless of how I might feel, these lacking stages and characters would go on to be some of the only negative points mentioned in what would 
be an incredibly successful game launch. 22 months after the release of the previous game, Mystery of the Emblem came out in early 1994 to roaring success. For nearly the next decade, it would be the highest selling Fire Emblem game, as well as having the best first week sales of any of these games until 18 years later, when 2012's Fire Emblem Awakening came out. It's easy to say that Mystery of the Emblem is beloved in Japan. Review scores at the time also reflect that, with Famitsu giving it a 36 out of 40 score, ranking it far above Gaiden's 28 and Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light's 23.4. I would argue that it was this game, rather than the first game, which made Marth so iconic in Japan, if only from the sheer sales numbers alone. Like the previous games, Mystery of the Emblem has also received later Japan-only releases on Nintendo's virtual consoles, coming to the Wii in December 2006, the Wii U in April 2014, and the 3DS Store in June 2016. The Book 1 portion of this game would later receive another remake with the previous cut content restored as 2008's Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon for the Nintendo DS, which of course arrived after the time Fire Emblem had already made the leap into the West. Unfortunately, Book 2's content, which also received a remake in the follow-up game to Shadow Dragon 2010's New Mystery of the Emblem, was not brought to the West, meaning that the new story content seen in this game has never been officially released in English, even after both parts received remakes. Fortunately, and like the previous two Fire Emblem games, Mystery of the Emblem has received a full fan translation, which of course I'm going to link in the description, and this time it is both a very complete and much more understandable one. While I intend to use the people and place names which come from this translation, I should say now that there are some key differences from games both prior and later, such as the country known as Durhua in the Fire Emblem 1 translation, now being called Doluna. It shouldn't be too hard to figure out, and I should also say that in case you want to avoid spoilers or just want to skip right to the later gameplay discussion sections, here is a time code for after the story section. And if we're ready, 3, 2, 1, let's jam! Since the first half of Mystery of the Emblem's story, the remake section, does not really deviate too much from the first game, I'm going to give a simplified version here to set the stage for the new content, but be sure to check out my first retrospective to get the full story. Here goes! Our story starts in the land of Acania, a land which is broken into various kingdoms. Marth and his family are the rulers of Altea, but when Marth is 14 years old, a war breaks out on the continent, sparked by the alliances of a few kingdoms which are mostly led by the kingdom of Daluna. In the chaos, Altea is betrayed, Marth's father is killed, his sister is kidnapped, and he is forced to flee to the eastern kingdom of Talus. Two years later, Marth sets out to free the world from the Dalunian Empire, gaining allies and freeing kingdoms with each step. Along the way, Marth uses two orbs, the Star and Light Orb, to make a magic capable of defeating Garnef, a scheming pontifex who had taken Marth's sister captive and was holding an ancient sword called the Falchion, which Marth then uses to defeat the ruler of the Dulinian Empire, a near-immortal earth dragon named Medius, after which he brings peace back to the world. That's the plot of Fire Emblem 1 and Book 1 of this game in about 170 words or less. So again, if you want the full version, just jump back to my old video after this one to see it in far, far more detail. With these events out of the way, we jump into Book 2, also known as the War of Heroes. Time has passed since Marth's victory, and it is one year later. Hardin, the younger brother to the King of Aurelis, had wed Princess Nina of the major kingdom of Acania. As the most powerful man in the land, Hardin began to aggressively pursue the restoration of his holy empire, and one day he sent a message to Prince Marth to request his help with a rebellion which had broken out in the western kingdom of Grust. As a lesser kingdom which held allegiance to Acania, Marth and his Altean forces had no choice but to agree, and set out on this Grust expedition. In Grust, Marth encountered the local Acanian General Lang, a thoroughly distasteful man who ordered Marth to clean up the remaining rebels and to hand over the Grustian royal children, Yumina and Ubello, to him, in order for them to be executed. Though Marth and his company found the request disgusting, they had no choice but to comply for now, and watched as their former ally Lorenz, shortly before his death, pleaded with Marth to protect the children shortly before General Lang appeared to take them away. After this victory, Marth was next ordered to travel to Medon, 
the land of the Dragon Riders, to rescue his former ally Minerva who had been taken prisoner in a military rebellion. After traveling to this region and fighting through some scouts, Marth runs into the mage Lind, who delivers him the mystical shield called the Fire Emblem, which had been sent directly from Nina. This item being sent to him was a bit of a strange message, as Nina giving it to Marth signaled that something was gravely wrong, and a hero for the land was once again needed. With a lot to think about, Marth arrived at the castle where Minerva was being held, and although she was spirited away at the last moment by her brother Mikolas, the man who they had thought dead from the previous war, at the castle, Marth and his retainer Jagen finally pushed back against the vile General Lang. Jagen, who was ultimately disgusted by the man, actually went so far as to challenge him to a duel to the death, to which General Lang responded by immediately fleeing. Marth's journey finally started to right itself when he arrived in time to support his ally Algma, who had taken it upon himself to rescue the Grustian royal children. While Marth and his company were catching up to him, the swordsman was assisted by a mysterious knight who called himself Sirius, a man who looked strikingly similar to a former sympathetic foe. After the rescue, these four joined up with Marth. However, this positive development was very short-lived, as right then, Marth's fiance, the Princess Sheeta, who had accompanied him all throughout the last war, arrived with grave news. While Marth and the Altean army was away in Grust and Medon, his kingdom had been attacked and swiftly defeated by Hardin's Akanian army. With this shocking news, the world suddenly looked very different. Marth and his allies were once again rebels with a tiny force, who were facing up against an entire continent which opposed them. While the last year of Marth's life had been truly filled with new love and restoration, the story behind those at the top of the Akanian kingdom had been very different. First, though Hardin and Nina had been wed, and Hardin had truly loved her, Nina had already long been in love with Grust's General Camus, who, due to his honor and loyalty to his country, had been forced into a losing battle against Marth in the previous war. When Hardin came to understand that her side of their marriage had been entirely political, and that she didn't truly love him, a darkness began to grow in his heart, which made it the perfect time for the still lingering spirit of Garnif to approach Hardin disguised, offering him further power through the use of a new orb, the Dark Sphere. Similar to the light and star spheres used in the previous war, this item gave Hardin incredible power unlike anything else in the world. However, unbeknownst to him, the Dark Sphere's power also corrupted him completely, leading to his jealousy of Marth boiling over into a plot to destroy him, while also causing him to subjugate the other kingdoms so completely in order to form the Akanian Empire. Jumping back to Marth, even with the news that his country had fallen, he still endeavored to do good, and abandoned his former orders from the corrupt Emperor Hardin. He took his current forces and traveled back to Groost, where he cornered the horrible General Lang and slew him in his castle. Imprisoned in Groost, Marth found the Bishop Wendell, the man who had been restoring the Magic Kingdom of Cadane, but had since left it in the hands of his two pupils. Wendell had been given a mission from the Archsage Goto, the mysterious man who had helped Marth so crucially in the last journey. Now joining Marth, Wendell endeavored to retrieve the Star Sphere for Goto, which had since shattered into 12 pieces after it had been used to create the magic that Marth needed against Garnif in the last war. It is here where Marth also learns that, including the star and light spheres he held previously, there were a total of five of these tremendously powerful objects, with the others being the Earth, Life, and Dark Spheres. Together, Marth, Wendell, and their allies traveled to the Holy Fane of Ramon, where they discovered that the temple had already been destroyed. Continuing their escape from Groost, they fall into a trap led personally by the corrupted Hardin, who is completely invulnerable to damage due to the power of the Dark Sphere. Marth and his company only barely escape this ambush, sailing to the land of Kade to the north. After settling a dispute between Wendell's former pupils, Marth is again psychically contacted by Goto, who on top of bringing Marth up to speed on why Hardin had turned against him, also tells him that only the strength of the Light Sphere can counter Hardin's Dark Sphere, and that he will lend it to Marth if Marth can only reach his location, which is far to the north of Kadain, in a land whose only former human visitor had been the hero Anri. This dangerous path north, known as Anri's Way, consisted of a sweltering desert, a volcanic hell Escape, and also a bitterly cold frozen plain. After fighting his way through the elements and countless dragons, Marth and his company arrived at Goto's compound, where they also found the slumbering Tiki, a young but tremendously powerful Manakeet who had helped Marth before. Marth learns now that not only Tiki, but also Goto and Zane, who was his ally who found him along Anri's way, 
were all members of an ancient and powerful race of Manakeets known as the Divine Dragons, and that Tiki herself was the daughter of the legendary Naga, the leader of the Divine Dragons, whose power was so immense that she was frequently mistaken for a god. After the previous war where Tiki's caretaker had awoken her, and after Marth's group had to previously restore her senses in the last war, Goto had once again put her to sleep for fear of her massive power going berserk again. With Marth having successfully fulfilled his word, and actually made it through Henry's way, Goto allows Tiki to be awakened again, officially entrusting her into Marth's care so that she could lead a normal life. Goto next lives up to his word by forging the 12 fragments of the star orb together and giving Marth the light orb as promised. He goes even further than this by using his powers to teleport Marth and his company directly to Altea, where the now massively strengthened rebellion forces of the Star Lord Marth once again liberate his homeland retrieving the Geosphere along the way, which had fallen into the hands of a thief. Marth next continues his reclamation of the continent, and with great speed liberates the neighboring kingdom of Gra. After this, he realizes that more and more battles will only take a toll on the continent, and so Marth then decides that a direct assault on Palace Castle, where Hardin resides, would lead to a faster end to the war. He then takes another nigh-impossible route through the mountains in order to arrive right at the castle's doorstep. Along the way, he encounters the King of Aurelis, Hardin's own brother, who then proves the justice of Marth Marth's cause by giving him the Life Sphere. With Hardin's outside forces abandoning the corrupted Emperor with each passing hour, Marth arrives at Palace Castle, where he fights through the massive Acanium army, cornering Hardin in his throne room, and with the help of the Light Sphere, strikes down his corrupted former friend. With his last moments, the darkness which had consumed Hardin relents, bringing back his old personality in order for him to admit his mistakes and to tell Marth that he begs Nina to forgive him. After taking the Dark Sphere, from the deceased Hardin, the five orbs which are in his possession immediately attach themselves to the Fire Emblem. Shortly after this happens, Queen Nina and other priestesses who had disappeared, including Marth's sister Elise, approach the group. As they are congratulating them, luring them closer, the Fire Emblem, now called the Binding Shield with the addition of the orbs, releases an energy wave which reveals the priestesses to be illusions sent by Garnef, who, having been the one who corrupted Hardin beyond reason, was the true culprit of this crisis. Learning that Garnef was hiding at the Dragon's Altar, a place where the slain Earth Dragon Medius was trying to be resurrected as an even more powerful Shadow Dragon, Marth fought through even more relentless waves of dragons and local barbarians to arrive at the evil Pontifex's location, fighting first through Garnef's own troops, and then using the Starlight spell again to destroy the remainder of the evil man, Marth arrives at the site of Medius's rebirth. Unfortunately, the ritual was completed, reviving not only Medius into a horrifying new form, but also corrupting the four priestesses. To save them, only the ones whom they loved the most were able to break them out of the sway of Medius. Merrick, Marth's friend and Wendell's pupil, who was also in love with Marth's sister Elise, used his words and love to bring her back from this corruption, as did the thief Julian for the gentle Lena, Princess Minerva did for her little sister Maria, and the mysterious knight Sirius, whom Nina recognized as the presumed dead General Camus, brought her back in time. With Medius's corruption eliminated, his Earth Dragon allies being warded off constantly by the power of the Binding Shield, and with the mighty Falchion in hand, Marth faced off with and slew the reborn Medius, bringing an end to the crisis once and for all. With the conflicts of the recent year put to rest, Marth this time steps up to become the new leader of the continent alongside his beloved bride Sita. And as the fallen are mourned, and the victorious move on to the next stage of their lives, the story of both the Wars of Darkness and Heroes draws to a close. The prior game, Fire Emblem Gaiden, represented a massive leap forward when it came to fleshing out its characters and presenting its tale, and Mystery of the Emblem definitely improves on both of these in a number of ways. I recall saying in the Fire Emblem 1 retrospective that the mere inclusion of a map would do so much to make the story more coherent, not simply from outside sources, but actually within the game itself, which is one of the first and best changes that Mystery included. On top of this, chapter narration is given before each and every battle, 
which adds to the sensation of scale and place, which nearly entirely gets rid of the feeling of all of this just taking place in a bunch of names only, without a mental picture to attach them to. For as much as I like the steps taken in this game to better deliver its story, my analysis of how it was delivered is not going to be without criticisms this time, and that is simply due to one major issue, exposition dumps. If you're not familiar with this term, an exposition dump is when one character spends a long time explaining backstory or lore to another character or group, which is actually just meant to teach the audience said information in an in-universe kind of way. This is called an exposition dump because rather than bits of this information being built into the natural progression of the story's events, or parts of it being picked up through context clues, instead here the flow of the story has to come to a screeching halt for the character to give their long-winded speech. There are many of these in Mystery of the Emblem, all of them far too long, and also all of them contained in Book 2. Likely because the writers felt the need to add the lore that they wanted to retroactively place into the background of the first game in the non-remake section of this one, where most players were likely to actually spend their time. These exposition dumps include the story of Andre, the tales of Naga, Tiki's true backstory, the five orbs, the binding shield, etc, etc, etc. Some of these are acceptable, for example, the story of how Harden became corrupted by the Dark Sphere, or how the star orb broke into 12 fragments, because those are directly related to the story of Book 2. It's definitely true, even to this day, that many who play this game never touch or only briefly visit Book 1. So it might have all had to be added to Book 2, I accept that, but I would have liked to have seen them happen in the battle narration part at least, which seems like a more appropriate location for them to put this kind of lore, not to mention it being easily skippable for people who've already seen it, rather than putting these in long dialogue sections at the start or end of the battles themselves. While I actually really like the lore that they made, and especially enjoyed the truth behind Anri, the curse of the Fire Emblem, as well as Tiki's heritage, it's still not hard for me to say that the writers were not yet very good at the implementation. So when it comes to analyzing the story's delivery as a whole, I have to say that the dry way that they added the lore has kind of made my final takeaway a bit more of a mixed bag. I can't help but feel that Mystery of the Emblem is definitely on the right track for how deep and complex a Fire Emblem plot should be. But without delivering it to the player properly, this much information and character building lands more with a thud than the grace it deserved. I have a feeling that this is something that is going to be worked out in the next game, especially given its beloved reputation, but I suppose that is something that I'm going to see for myself next time. For now though, it's time to look at how Mystery of the Emblem transformed its gameplay, and if it was able to pull off this aspect of it more successfully than its story presentation. With the developers having chosen with Mystery of the Emblem to continue the trends set by the first game and not Gaiden, it naturally meant that a lot of refinement was going to be necessary, and thankfully, that's exactly what Intelligent Systems delivered here. First things first, this is THE Fire Emblem that introduced the now standard movement capability highlighting, removing any guesswork or tedious counting when it came to measuring both your and the enemy's marching potential, something which was possible in the previous games, but became overly complex complex to do in your head when dealing with things like the movement modifiers of negative, fortified, or unknown terrain. This is undeniably a positive addition to the series, but in this entry it's more of a step in the right direction rather than the true refinement of this accessibility function. For one thing, movement is shown in grey rather than the later standard of blue, and the attack ranges are entirely not included yet, meaning that there is still a little bit of thoughtful consideration needed rather than simply getting the information you want at a single glance. Even though the lack of attack ranges makes this not really the ideal system yet, it's not too much of an issue because for the most part, we are back down to one or two maximum attack ranges for units. This is a big difference from the insane sniping potential of archers and other units in Gaiden, whose attack ranges sometimes went up to four spaces or more away from themselves. To be fair, in Mystery of the Emblem, there are still some enemy types which do have high ranges, but they are typically static units like catapults or mages wielding 
wielding certain spells. When it comes to hitting foes with your weapons, a major feature, or should I say blunder, of Gaiden has also been changed, and that is the absurdly high dodge chance numbers from the previous game. Mystery of the Emblem has fixed these and put them back to an acceptable level, with very few hit chances ever dipping below 80%. And in most cases, if a target is not on special ground, you're probably going to have a 95 to 100% hit chance. For me, if anything, this is a bit too high, and I would have liked to have seen just a little bit more chance left of things, but it does also make the game much more enjoyable to play, because you at least know that the damage that you earn through your strategy would reliably pay off, which has to be better than a system which allows for situations like this. There are many other small refinements, most of them bringing this game closer in line with the first, while also removing many of the experimental design decisions of Gaiden. But for all the things that I could mention in this video, I simply have to prioritize most of my time praising the one spot where the first game needed the most work. And if you watched my prior video, you can probably already guess what that is. The inventory system. Here's a quick recap for those not in the know, but in Fire Emblem 1, all inventory management was done within the actual battle. This meant that A, you could only trade items to or from units that you had actually brought into the field with you. B, units had to use their actions to do any kind of inventory management, which required the player to constantly fly through turns as each unit did their one action to contribute to your intentions. And C, in order to best upgrade your units or sell nearly broken gear, actual digital shopping lines were required to be made in order to have everyone pass through the one or two shop squares, leading to so many more actions spent and turns passed that it all became a huge time-consuming mess. Well, I am so happy to report that all of this is no longer a thing in Mystery of the Emblem. Through a few simple improvements, the most monumental of which being the ability to organize your army's inventory all at once in a menu between battles, and the fact that units now have eight total inventory spots split between four weapons and four item slots, replacing the four general spots that they had in number one. This system isn't the easiest to navigate, but after a little bit of experimentation, I eventually learned how to manage my inventory en masse. With an understanding for how to do this, combined with Marth's new ability to always be able to access the supply even while inside battles, all of my inventory complaints have become null and void. It's safe to say that when it came to fixing inherited problems from number one, Mystery of the Emblem did not pull a Gaiden. In other words, this game did not simply chop off the systems that were heavily flawed to replace them with brand new flawed systems. Rather, it took these issues head on and successfully refined the systems which needed refining. However, this game is a lot more than simply a patched over version of Fire Emblem 1. And in the next section, we're going to be taking a closer look at how this game innovated in its own right. While new features were built upon past systems, such as movement potential highlighting technically originating from this game, there is an iconic system of the modern Fire Emblem games which also got its start here, and that is the unit support system. Almost too vague and unseen to know that it's there without really looking for it, when two units in this game who have a prior relationship, such as two characters who are in love or have a familial bond, are fighting close to each other, they will have increased stats. This can help you deliver important blows or when you're planning out a defense, but without a relationship level system to worry about, it mostly just serves as a small boon to use or ignore as you see fit. To be very honest, if I hadn't done some research into this game on outside websites, I wouldn't really have even known that it was there, as I never purposely used it during any of my playthroughs. Although I imagine that I must have benefited from it at some point, which kind of makes it just an invisible way of making the game a little bit easier for you. While this support system is very forgettable, the other big innovation of this game is, well, also kind of forgettable to be honest, and that's the dismounting system. Mounted units are now able to take a turn to dismount after choosing their movement, and within the same turn can attack any units next to them. From then on in subsequent turns, the unit will be changed to a ground unit, limiting their weapon choice to a sword or bow depending on their class, and also completely removing their mount's movement and stat bonuses, which is a trade-off for gaining benefits from terrain that flyers would otherwise not be able to utilize, being able to pass
pass over some terrain which horses can't enter onto, or simply avoiding extra damage from weapon types which are effective against them, such as bows against flyers or horse killer spears against cavaliers. In both of my playthroughs, I found this feature to be very situational, but it was one that I did intentionally use on occasion. For example, if I was running a Pegasus Knight into a small group of archers and I wanted to take them out while being safe from the next turn's damage. While it is nice that I had this option, at the same time, losing a turn to low mobility and needing to remount at a later time had me preferring to just not place my mounted units in this kind of situation. They had the mobility to avoid it anyways. About the only other notable thing about this feature is that mounted units are now forced to be made into ground units for the entirety of indoor battles, an entirely unnecessary change that can invalidate a lot of the satisfying payoff of carefully raising your selected units. And that goes doubly so for Pegasus Knights, who not only lose their extra movement ability, but also the increased magic resistance that makes keeping a Pegasus Knight unpromoted actually worth it. Come to think of it, many of the most climactic battles in this game, including a series of battles at the very end of it, are entirely set in indoor location, which means that this inclusion can end up hamstringing you, especially if you intentionally brought along your strongest spears, which, other than the very slow-moving armor knights, cannot be used by ground units. It's really nice that our heroes are polite enough to not want to rub horse dirt off on the carpet, but if you could fit a dragon inside a castle, you could fit a horse. That's all I'm saying. Fire Emblem 3 Mystery of the Emblem was a whole lot better at refining than it was at innovating, and I really wish that the detail given to these two systems were actually completely swapped. At the end of the day, the very prominent dismounting system ends up being either superfluous or a nuisance, while the barebones support system is a huge case of missed opportunity. This is especially true given this game's unique feature of actually being two stories, complete with its own new generation of fighters in the second half, which end up fighting alongside the veterans of the first war. From what I hear, I don't think I'll have to wait long for a more complete support system to come into the series, but for right now, the beginning of Book 2 in this game, where Marth is gaining new, fresh-faced recruits at the same time as bringing back his old friends, actually affords me the chance to talk about a certain system I have been itching to talk about ever since the Fire Emblem 1 video, and that is character growth. For newcomers to Fire Emblem, such as myself three games ago, there are many confusing terms that the community throws around which can be a bit mystifying at first, and this is why I have devoted a section each to these early retrospectives into explaining them in a simple way. When it comes to Mystery of the Emblem and its unique dual game structure, I feel there is no better chance than to talk about how character growth works. Put simply, character growth is the way that a character's stats improve upon leveling up, but what makes this a whole lot more complicated and honestly a bit frustrating and defeating is the fact that some units in these games, from Dark Dragon on up, have either really bad level ups resulting in no or only slight stat improvement, or stat growths that don't really fit their class. This basically means that some units are simply less effective than others, and are always going to be like that without the use of expensive and rare buffing items or very excessive grinding. And as hard as it may be for some players to deal with, accepting that some units in these games are going to be better than others, and that simply just choosing your favorites may may make a squad that is less than ideal, is sort of just the price of admission here. It's not all bad though, so hear me out. While it can be frustrating for these new players who just want to use their favorites, the character growth system actually adds a lot to these games. Probably the most significant one of these is the way that it keeps the permadeath system in this game an actual threat, because you know that others taking the place of one of your mains, even if they're the exact same class and level, may actually never truly replace them. To be sure, character growth is a bit of a punishing system, but if any game thus far in the series were the most open about it, it would be Fire Emblem 3. I was first struck by how Mystery of the Emblem actually tried to make this a bit more accessible at the start of Book 2, when it is directly stated by the characters that Marth could just use the Paladin Eren to kill all of the enemies at hand with ease, but that doing so may make it harder on him later because his other troops will not get the early XP and level ups for themselves that would then turn them into even more powerful units. You see, Eren in this game is what is called a Jagan, named after Marth's own retainer who is an already promoted Paladin right at the start of the first game. The Jagans of this and later Fire Emblem games are characterized by both being promoted or having very good stats right off the bat, but having bad character growth, which actually limits their use into the mid or late game. The existence of Jagans helps to highlight the actual value of this system, as conventional wisdom would tell you to ignore the Jagans and go right for the characters which can pay off in the late game, which is the strategy that I've opted for. But in other situations,
situations, such as in the harder modes of the later games, propping up the Jagen can actually pay off just as well. These are just the basics of character growth, and this especially is a topic that is simply too big to be explored in just one video about one game in this franchise. Each game thus far and later in the franchise would have its duds and studs hidden amongst its cast, and it's ultimately up to the player to either ignore, experiment with, or outright research who they want to use for any number of reasons. While this underlying system can feel a bit random at times, it is also what has helped games like Fire Emblem stand out from other strategy RPGs, as well as other JRPGs like the Final Fantasy series. To draw a comparison, you can be certain that Cloud and his friends are going to be beasts by the end of the journey, but in Fire Emblem, if you're not careful, you may put a ton of effort into raising a young warrior that you thought would turn out to be a great knight, only to find out later that you might have chosen unwisely. This might all sound like a criticism, but trust me, it's not. In fact, the openness of how much each player wants to embrace this system is actually what has made it possible for me to play games like Mystery of the Emblem, as ridiculously long as it is, twice over without much complaining. Unless you're just boringly following a guide, just about every player's finished playthrough of these games are going to be completely different from the other. And personally, I think this is a hugely underappreciated aspect of the entire Fire Emblem series. Well, I think it's about time that we finish this thing. Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem is a hard game to pin down, possibly due to the sheer breadth of it all. Tackling this game in one video is tough, as it is basically two entire games with major systems, refinements, and innovations that make it both a retread and a true sequel. As tough as it is to contain this one massive game into a single nutshell, I still want to answer the question I proposed at the beginning. Does this entry hold up, and does it deserve the same place of renown as the other big thirds? The answer is going to be no. But, to be fair, it's a bit of an impossible standard. For as many improvements that this game made, Mystery of the Emblem stands more as a start to something great rather than an instant trend-setting masterpiece. All in all, it is a game that I thoroughly enjoyed playing. Book 1 is a much better way to experience the events of Fire Emblem 1, even with the cut content, but Book 2 was very much the sequel I was hoping for. Looking back on it all, I can say that I had an overly long but very enjoyable time, and I can definitely see why this game has gone on to become so iconic in Japan. While the first two entries felt like experiments, Mystery of the Emblem proved that not only did intelligent systems have a clearer picture of what they wanted to make, but they were also willing to put in the effort to make it better and better each time. I imagine looking back on this entry after its remakes does make it a bit harder to appreciate now, but when you actually put in the time to complete it, it really is no mystery why this game became so emblematic. With our revisit to the origins of Marth and his newest battles behind us, it is time to finally enter a new era for the Fire Emblem retrospective. Next up, we will be diving into a very beloved entry into the series with Fire Emblem 4, Genealogy of the Holy War. Thank you so much for watching, everybody, and I'll see you next time. The fourth Fire Emblem, subtitled Genealogy of the Holy War, is certainly well known amongst the Fire Emblem community. But like the other Japan-only entries in this series, the exact specifics of its legacy are not that well known to the greater gaming public. Ever since I announced this retrospective series, there has been one comment which I have seen constantly appearing. Fire Emblem 4 is going to blow you away. You can say that it was with great anticipation that I played through the earlier entries of the series in order to get here. Whenever I went online or was reading the comments, it was with great trepidation to keep myself from seeing a spoiler or even that much detail about this game's mechanics and systems. Surprising to me, my efforts were successful, and by the time I started up Genealogy of the Holy War, I knew next to nothing about the game. So it was with only my experiences with the previous three games to prepare me for the fourth that I started my journey into Jugdral. Like with Dark Dragon, Gaiden, and Mystery of the Emblem, Genealogy has received 
received a full English fan translation, with the newest and most complete being Project Naga. Meaning, no offense to the prior game's fan translations, the work done here by Project Naga is on a completely different level. Thanks to this very complete fan translation, anyone can play and enjoy this entry without compromise, and I'm very appreciative of their work. So, with all that said, I think it's about time we actually get to it. Let's examine Genealogy of the Holy War, and really understand the direction that Intelligent Systems took the Fire Emblem franchise with this. Let's get started. Of all the games in this series thus far, it's easy to say that Genealogy of the Holy War had the most turbulent development. After the release of Mystery of the Emblem in early 1994, production on the next game began. At the helm was of course the big three of early Fire Emblem history. Shozo Kaga as the director, designer, and scenario writer, Yuka Tsujioko as composer, and Gunpei Yokoi as producer. I've been primarily mentioning these three for their large impact in launching the series, but it's also worth bringing up the work of Katsuyoshi Koya, who handled the character designs of both Genealogy of the Holy War and Mystery of the Emblem before it. Compared to the prior game, development on Genealogy was far more chaotic, as staff within Intelligent Systems moved teams, at the same time as many production team members moved offices. On top of this, the changes which were planned for this game were so drastic that it began to be moved away from the Fire Emblem brand, potentially donning the names Holy Sword Emblem Kaiser, or simply Sword Emblem. This game could have been the birth of a new franchise for its developer, as within its development time it teetered between being a squad-based statless strategy game, or actually being closer to a typical JRPG with an even higher reliance on role-playing mechanics. But eventually, it balanced out in more of a typical Fire Emblem direction, and was given the series moniker once more. On May 14th, 1996, just short of 10 years after the founding of Intelligent Systems, the fourth game in the Fire Emblem series was released in just Japan only. Even though, at the end of the day, Genealogy of the Holy War did not exceed Mystery of the Emblem sales, many of its gameplay innovations and systems have gone on to influence the overall franchise more so than any other entry. Oh, and of course this game has consistently been re-released on the various Japanese virtual consoles. Well, it's time to dive into the epic story that Shozo Kaga wanted to tell with this entry. But first, I'm going to speak very directly. Genealogy of the Holy War's story is absolutely best experienced on your own blind. I feel it's obligatory to give spoiler warnings and time codes in any video like this, but I want to really stress how important it is for this specific game. Sorry to spoil a bit of my own analysis later, but I feel that Genealogy of the Holy War not only has the best story yet in any Fire Emblem game that I've thus played, but it actually contains some of the most powerful moments I have ever experienced in any game, period. In many ways, though positively motivated, the Fire Emblem community's air of reverence around this game can make it seem more intimidating than it actually is to get into it. And if you're watching this video simply to get a primer on this game without having to play it, then please pause the video and seriously consider if you want to watch through this story segment or not. Having gone into this one completely blind, I can tell you that just jumping in and figuring out things as you go is really not so bad. Even if you play poorly, your main unit in the first part of the game will get just about any player of any skill level to the the juiciest stuff. And I also want to give a special thank you to the fans who made sure that I had an untainted experience getting there myself. So if you were in one of my blind streams and kept spoilers to yourself, or moderated others who were about to spoil things as I was playing, then I just want to give you a very special thank you. Alright, it's your last chance to avoid spoilers. The timestamp on the screen will take you to the later gameplay discussions, where I'm also going to avoid showing footage of any of the big spoiler moments. Oh, and I'm going to do as best I can with the pronunciations, but a lot of these names have Norse origins that I'm sure I'm not going to say anywhere near perfectly. I'm obviously going with Project Naga's translation, Translation, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to get all these right, so just be understanding. Oh, and I'm going to be splitting this story recap into two parts. It's very, very long, so strap in. Okay, here we go! Three, two, one! Our story begins in a brand new setting, the continent of Jugdral. 
which is divided into multiple lands, the Kingdom of Grand Vale in the center, the Kingdom of Verdun to the southwest, Augustria to the northwest, the Kingdom of Celeste to the north, the Kingdom of Isaac to the northeast, the Yid Desert, the Thracia Peninsula to the southeast, which is split between the Manster District and the Kingdom of Thracia, and finally the Militos District to the south. Our story opens with the continent divided as such, but in the past, all of Jugdral was united under one massive dark empire. Empire. At the head of this empire was a man known as Gaul, who made a pact with an evil earth dragon named Loptus, granting him immense dark power. In response to this man and the evil dragon's power which he wielded, a separate god, the famous Naga, along with eleven other gods, bestowed their powers onto twelve rebels, who would later be known as the Twelve Crusaders. Together, these heroes brought an end to the Lopter Empire, and in the aftermath, seven crusaders banded together to create the kingdom of Granvale, while the five others went their separate ways to form the independent kingdom surrounding. About 100 years after these events, a war between Granvale and the northeastern Isaac had broken out, with almost all of Granvale's soldiers going northeast for the invasion. They were led by Granvale's Prince Kurth, the current prince in line for the throne of all of Granvale in the capital city of Belhalla. With most of the Granvalian army absent, the neighboring land of Verdun invades from the west, with the eldest son of King Batur of Verdun, Prince Gandalf, yes, Gandalf, leading the charge onto Castle Jung Fighting through its meager defenders, the lady of the castle, Idine, was seized and taken, which is where our hero for this adventure, Sigurd, takes the stage. Sigurd is the prince of the duchy of the nearby castle, Chalfi, a powerful knight who is a descendant of the crusader, Baldur. The lady Idine and him had been friends since childhood, and so he set off to free her from the clutches of Gandalf by mustering up as many willing souls to help him as he could. Sigurd, along with his young friend Oife, who served as his advisor, were were assisted by some of the most notable fighters at the time who were available, including Azel, a descendant of the crusader Fjallar, and his friend Lex, who was the youngest prince of Dozel and descendant of Nier. Also showing up was one of Sigurd's closest friends, Quan, who was also joined by Ethlin, Sigurd's sister who was married to Quan. Quan is the crown prince of Leonster, the capital of the eastern Manster district on the Thracian peninsula. The loyal Finn, a knight in training of Manster, also joined Quan and Ethlin. These fighters, amongst many others, vowed to help Sigurd in his journey, and even the powerful mage Arvis, who was Azel's older brother, temporarily showed up to assist Sigurd by giving him a powerful sword on behalf of Prince Kurth. With their powerful weapons and allies, Sigurd and the others were able to clear the Verdonites out of Granville, but he was sad to learn that the Lady Idine had already been spirited across the border, and thus he prepared for an invasion of the barbarian kingdom Verdun to get her back. At the border, he met his old friend, the Augustrian Knights leader Eldigan, who was a descendant of the Crusader Hazel, to which Sigurd stated that his only intentions in Verdun were to get Lady Idine back and to stop this conflict, to which Eldigan permitted and agreed to help keep Augustria neutral in the conflict between the two countries. Just after Sigurd launched his invasion into Verdun, the youngest of the Verdunian princes, Jamk, freed Lady Idine himself urging her to escape out of the clutches of his vile brothers while he went back to his father at the castle to convince him to end this fighting. After reuniting with Idine and seizing the castle Genoa, Sigurd discovered a captured young boy named Shannon, who was actually the captured young prince of the kingdom of Isaac. Even though their two countries were technically at war, Sigurd believed that the young and innocent, whether they belonged to the current enemy or not, were blameless in such a conflict, and so he agreed to shelter and protect the prince until he was able to return him back to his country, which was an act which gained him the loyalty of Shannon's aunt, the incredibly wild and dangerous swordmaster Ira. Marching even further into Verdun, Sigurd cut through the vile Prince Gandalf and seized his castle of Marfa, where he had yet another unexpected meeting, this time with a mysterious and beautiful woman. After their brief conversation and her departing, he learns from another man in the town that her name was Deirdre, and that she was a maiden of the spirit forest nearby. Legend said that she was forbidden from ever marrying, as calamity would befall the world should that ever happen. Ignoring these warnings, Sigurd moved on, as the last step in his mission in Verdun was to get to the capital, where Jamk had failed to convince his father to stop the fighting. King Batura of Verdun had been deceived by the sorcerer Sandima, who had convinced them that he needed to attack Granville in order to ensure his country's future. As Jamka was ordered to go out and stop Sigurd by his father, Sandima then secretly murdered the king in his absence, seizing the Verdanian army for himself,
himself by simply claiming that the king had fallen ill. Before reaching Castle Verdun, Sigurd and his army had to march to the spirit forest that he had heard of, which is where he ran into Deirdre yet again. Sigurd, who was in love at first sight with her, was very happy to see her again, and faithfully, she had decided to join them in order to help them stop Sandima using her powerful magic. After admitting his love for her, Deirdre joined up with them, and using her silencing magic, Sandima was made helpless as Sigurd's army moved in and slayed him discovering too late the dying king in the seized castle. Returning back to Castle Evans on the northern border, Sigurd was given orders to govern the region from Granvale, and in the coming months while he was stationed there, he married a Deirdre. Due to Sigurd's unexpectedly elongated stay in the region, the lords of the neighboring country of Augustria began to grow restless. While the previous king of Augustria was a pacifist, he had suffered a mysterious death and was soon replaced by his son Prince Chagall, who immediately ordered his lords to invade Verdun to get rid of Sigurd. Eldigan, who had always sworn to back up and support Sigurd, rode to speak with his king, trying his best to convince him to stop this invasion, to which the king responded to by immediately having him imprisoned. Calling him a traitor, Eldigan's castle of Nordion was then targeted by the other lords of Augustria, with only Eldigan's sister Lady Requesis in charge of its defense. Knowing that they will soon be coming for her, the Lady Requesis requested aid from Sigurd in order to bring everything in the country back to order. Sigurd, who felt indebted to Eldigan and his family, not only out of friendship, but also due to Eldigan's direct protection of his backline in the previous battle, our hero agreed to march out once again. Moving into Augustrian territory, he first rescued Princess Requesis at Nordian Castle, and then followed this up by seizing castles Herhine and Anthony in the northwest, which is where he also happened to meet up with the world-traveling Lewin, who was actually secretly the prince of the Kingdom of Celeste to the north, who had disguised himself as a common bard. Lewin was also joined by his friend Sylvia, a dancer, and in the conflict with some of the sellswords in the region, Sigurd and his army were able to recruit the legendary mercenary named Beowulf. While heading to the eastern castles of Makili and Augusti, Lewin met up with the Celestian Pegasus Knight Aaron, who had been searching for him, and with her and Sigurd's help, they were able to arrive right on King Chagall's doorstep and take him down. The king was only spared his life at the request of Eldigan, who had suddenly been set free shortly before Sigurd's arrival. This was a suggestion given to King Chagall at the request of a mysterious man named Manfroy. Manfroy, who was the leader of a sect of dark priests, had been the one behind Sandima's actions in Verdun, unbeknownst to Sigurd. And it was at this time that the news that Prince Kurth had been successfully assassinated while in Isak reached him. With Manfroy's plot still hidden, Eldigan stopped Sigurd from proceeding further into Augustria, with him getting him to agree to return the rule of Augustria to Prince Chagall after a year's time. With the current conflict settled once more, Sigurd now also governed Augustria while allowing King Chagall to be sheltered in the north, in which time Deirdre gave birth to their son named Selif. Six months into this tepid peace, King Chagall broke their agreement and sent out the remaining soldiers of Augustria to try and oust Sigurd. After successfully captured Mandino Castle in the north, blunting much of the Augustrian attack, Sigurd ran into Father Claude, the descendant of the Crusader Bragi, and his bodyguard Tailt, who informed him that the lead suspect in Prince Kurth's murder was actually Sigurd's own father, Lord Byron. And before he left him again, Claude told him that he was going to the nearby Tower of Bragi to pray and find out the truth of the prince's death through his divine connection. After Claude left, Deirdre then wished to see him once more, and leaving Selif in Shannon's care, she headed out of the castle in order to find him. Not far outside of the castle, however, the mysterious Manfroy suddenly appeared, claiming that he had found the daughter of a woman named Sigyn at last. Using his magic to sedate her, Manfroy then took and disappeared with her completely under the noses of everyone. Enraged by the failures of his Augustrian troops, King Chagall then ordered Eldigan himself to lead his legendary cross knights against Sigurd, and being loyal to his country to the very end, Eldigan rode out against his best friend. It seemed like a horrible clash was about to take place until Eldigan was convinced by his beloved sister Requesis to turn back and try speaking to the king just one more time. However, when Eldigan returned yet again to try and convince Chagall of something he didn't want to do, Chagall this time had him immediately seized and then, in front of everyone, beheaded. Arriving soon after this act, Sigurd finally put down the Mad King, discovering the body of Eldigan on the floor. Regretful of how it had all turned out, and filled with concern for his now missing wife, Sigurd's new holdings in Augustria were then immediately assaulted by a gang of pirates who had long resided in the islands to the north. 
Following a revolt against their former leader Bridget, who was a descendant of the crusader Ulir and the long-lost sister of Lady Idine, Sigurd and his crew next marched north, saving the besieged former captain and reuniting with Father Claude. Father Claude had finished his prayer and discovered that Prince Kurth had been killed through the actions of the Dukes Repter and Langbalt, the leaders of the Granvalian duchies of Frege and Dozel respectively. And of course, these two had then used the assassinated prince's death to frame Sigurd's father. This information was too little too late, unfortunately, as just after stopping these pirate hordes and reuniting with everyone, Augustria was invaded from the south by Grand Vale armies looking to capture Sigurd based on his connection to his framed father. Escaping capture by them thanks only to the sudden intervention of several Pegasus knights who arrived from the country of Celeste, Sigurd and his crew were spirited away to Lewin's homeland to the north where they were then sheltered by the queen. Without Grand Vale's support, Sigurd was massively weakened, and so Quan, along with his wife and their knight Fen decided to head back to Manster in order to bring their own army to Sigurd's aid. While they were away, a sudden civil war arose in Celeste when Lewin's uncles, being unhappy with the prince's return, decided to quickly take the country over themselves. Though Sigurd and Lewin headed out to stop them, they were unable to prevent the capital in the south from being seized, following a wholesale slaughter of the country's Pegasus knights, including Eren's sister Manya. Even though they were too late to prevent this slaughter, Sigurd was able to take back the southern lands for the queen. And, finally accepting his duty as the prince, Lewin was presented with the tome for Seti, the weapon which was used by his ancestor, the crusader Sed. Staying safely in Celeste for a bit longer, Sigurd then decided to take a bold action and march directly on Belhalla in order to settle things. At the same time, Sigurd's father, Lord Byron, who had been mortally wounded by Duke Langbalt, charged through the fields towards his son in order to pass down their holy blade, Tyrfing, seeing his son for one last time and passing on the heirloom shortly before his death. Using this powerful weapon, Sigurd then charged through Duke Langbalt's army and slayed him, seizing the castle of Lubeck in the process. Having arrived on the border of the Yid Desert and Izak, Sigurd then lived up to his word and allowed the Prince Shannon to return to his homeland. Before letting him go, however, Sigurd entrusted his young son Selif to his care, and then sent away his friend Oife to go with them to ensure his son's safety. As Sigurd began to move closer to Belhalla, across the entire Yid Desert to the south, Quan and Ethlin arrived with a small army in tow, as well as their young daughter Altena in Ethlin's arms, having left their other child Leif in the care of the ever-reliable Finn. Intending to reinforce Sigurd, they began to march through the desert with their army, when suddenly a pack of Thracian dragons Dragon Knights arrived, led by the King of Thracia himself, Travant. Being completely out of their element in the desert and unable to escape this hopeless situation, all of the knights which were led by Quan were picked off one by one, which was then followed by the murder of both Quan and Ethlin. Finding their child Altena, who Travant knew would later be able to wield Quan's legendary crusader weapon, the tricky king took her and then returned back to Thracia as the rest of the Dragon Knights assaulted Sigurd from the south. After Sigurd's army fought them off and secured the desert castle of Fenora, our hero sadly learned of his best friend and sister's untimely demises, suffering yet another horrible tragedy. Regardless, he was forced to continue on towards his goal. With only Duke Repter in the castle of Veltomer between him and Valhalla, Sigurd marched through the desert yet again. When Duke Repter headed out to face Sigurd head-on in front of his castle, Arvis, who was awaiting Sigurd in Belhalla, had his secret agent Ida betray Repter from behind and use her squad's magic to help Sigurd secure victory over him. With both the traitors who had been responsible for Prince Kurth and his father's death taken care of, Arvis gave him a royal welcome, surrounded on all sides by the magnificent soldiers and mages of Belhalla. Finally seeing him again, Arvis congratulated Sigurd on his long journey, just before revealing his ruse. All of this had been a trap, and Sigurd had just delivered himself and all of his friends right into it. Revealing that he wielded power in the city due to his marriage to Prince Kurth's secret daughter, Princess Deirdre, he brought his new beloved wife out to present herself to Sigurd. Deirdre had had her memories completely removed by Manfroy, all in order to set up her union with Arvis. Realizing that Deirdre could no longer recognize him, Sigurd had now lost absolutely everything. Before being allowed to speak with her further, Deirdre was taken back into the castle by Arvis's guards as a new massacre began. Arvis used his legendary spell Valflame to incinerate Sigurd himself, bringing an end to the conflicts which had ravaged Jugdral over the previous years. Everything had worked out exactly according to plan. 
In the East, Izak had already been weakened through the war, but the actions of Sigurd, though well-intentioned, had also severely weakened the lands of Verdun, Augustria, Celeste, and Manster. In the years that follow, Arvis used the momentum he gained to once again unite the entire land under one empire, with him as its new emperor. Amazingly, we are now only at the halfway point of our tale, but fortunately from here, things tend to move a lot faster. Picking up 17 years after the slaughter of Sigurd in what came to be called the Battle of Belhalla, we start in the land of Izak, where in the isolated village of Tiranog, Selev had been raised to be as much a hero as his father, and had come to be known by the people as the Scion of Light. Though Deirdre had had two children by Arvis in the meantime, Selev was the oldest of her children, and therefore he was the rightful heir to the Granvalian Empire. Still, dreams of him reclaiming the land from Arvis and his son Prince Julius were very far away, as on this day the Empire had finally discovered his location, and the local Imperial commander Denon sent his troops after the young Selif. Whomever Selif is joined by at this point is largely dependent on if the women in Sigurd's army had children during the previous events. But regardless of who joins him, Selif heads out onto the battlefield, accompanied by the now adult Oife. Meeting the Imperial forces head-on, Selif first secures the castle of Ganeshire to the northeast, where he is met by a familiar face, Prince Lewin. Having survived and somehow escaped the Battle of Belhalla, Prince Lewin had despaired and gone on to hide from the Empire while also supporting Selif's eventual rise. Together, they discuss about how Prince Shannon had gone off to find the crusader weapon of his family tree, Balmung, which had been hidden in a shrine in the Yid Desert. And next, they discuss about a girl which Lewin had discovered in Valhalla years ago who had been horribly injured, and whom he had been sheltering ever since. This mysterious girl who had lost her memory was named Julia and leaving her in the care of Selif, Lewin leaves, having business to attend to elsewhere. Selif now leads his troops to fight two more armies to the south, possibly recruiting one of the two sons of Danan, who are both in love with one of Selif's companions, before arriving and liberating the imperial headquarters in the region, Rivo, from the evil Danan. Having so quickly achieved the liberation of one major region of Jugdral, Selif moves on from this to try and meet up with Prince Leif of Leonster, who is Quan and Ethlin's son, who had been leading a revolution of his own all over the Thracian Peninsula. On his way to find Leif, Selif met up with Prince Shannon, who had successfully retrieved his family's sword, and together they next witnessed the efforts of a mercenary named Ares outside of the city of Darna. Ares, who was the son of Eldigan, wielded his father's crusader sword Mistletane, and at first he was furious to meet Selif, believing that Sigurd was Eldigan's killer, before Selif calmed him down and convinced him to join in their fight. The Liberation Army arrived arrived just in time to rescue Prince Leif, who had been protected by the loyal knight Finn all this time ever since his parents' demise. And together, Selif and Leif combined their armies and goals and became an even fiercer rebellious force. And next, Selif's group readies to head into the kingdom of Thracia. To the south, they clash with the mighty Ishtar, who also happens to be the beloved of Prince Julius. And although they defeat her in the field, she's able to be spirited away by Julius before she loses her life. As these two groups were fighting, King Trevant had been watching, and he orders the girl he stole and raised as a daughter, the lost sibling of Leif, Altena, to slaughter every last man, woman, and child in Manster. Altena, who has a kind heart, refuses to follow out such an order. However, the other Dragon Knight commanders around her have no such compunctions, and so they head north to attempt to wipe Manster clean. Selif's army is able to greet them head on, and along the way they merge with another rebellious group calling themselves the Magi, which empowers the Liberation Army even further. After the Thracian flyers are warded off, the group next heads deep into Thracian territory and seizes the castle of Capothogia. From this castle right in the middle of the kingdom, the full weight of Thracia is thrown against Selif. Fighting desperately, the Thracians send countless Dragon Knights against them, but each wave, one by one, is taken down by Selif's group. Eventually, Altena goes after them herself. However, Prince Leif is able to convince her of their connection and her theft as a child by Trevant, and after confirming this back home, she too decides to join with the Liberators. Although it causes everyone involved great pain, Selif, Leif, 
Altena, and all of the others continue to wade through the Thracian defenders, and eventually Trevon's cruel actions catch up to him. Even the loyal Thracian general Hannibal is recruited to Seleph's side, as his company is able to free his adopted son, whom Trevant had been using as a hostage. When everything is said and done, all of the commanders, including Trevant, are wiped off the battlefield forever. With Thracia now under control, all of East Jugdril has now been taken in the name of Seleph. And much like his father, he decides to stop delaying the inevitable and head right for Granvale in order to finish this. His route there takes him through the last section of our map, Miletos, where the harsh life for those under the Empire's rule truly comes to light. In Miletos, as well as other parts of the Empire, child hunts had regularly been being performed in recent years, and any children who had been captured were to be delivered to Belhalla where they were changed in some way. As Seleph fought his way through Miletos, they encountered Prince Julius and Ishtar again, and discovered that Julius was nigh invincible. Managing to outwit them and to bore the pompous prince, they next finally cross over into the mainland and land at Granville, where Emperor Arvis had stationed himself as a last defense at the city of Chalfi. However, this isn't the victorious, proud emperor you might be expecting. The Arvis that we meet here late in his life is a thoroughly broken failure of a ruler. This man, who had so mercilessly plotted to use Sigurd as well as many others before disposing of them for his own imperial ascension, by this point had realized that he himself was nothing more than a pawn in a different game. Manfroy, the mysterious leader of the Dark Priests, was actually in charge of the Cult of Lopter, and had been planning everything from the start. In order to bring back their lost god Loptus, who had seemingly been vanquished by the Twelve Crusaders, a new inheritor of the Dark God's blood was required, which is why the last two genetic holders of the Loptus blood, the two children of a woman named Sigyn who carried it, had to be brought together and reunite if you get me. Yes, the two children of Sigyn, who were born to different fathers, were Arvis and Deirdre. And everything that had happened in the previous generation, including stealing away Deirdre, wiping her memory, and orchestrating an event where Arvis would find and fall in love with her, had all been to make a child who would inherit the full blood of Loptus. Early in his life, Julius was a sweet and caring brother. However, at the age of 10, he was presented with the Loptus tomb by Manfroy. And at that point, his life was effectively over. He became nothing more than a vessel for the Dark God just as Gaul had been over 100 years prior. One of Julius's first actions as Loptus was to attempt to kill his sister Julia, due to her blood allowing her to use the Book of Naga, which he would be extremely weak to. The Empress Deirdre attempted to defend her daughter, and used her magic to warp Julia to safety just before Julius murdered her. After this event, Emperor Arvis, who had truly loved his wife, was completely heartbroken. And to top it off, he could now not oppose his son's twisted, impenetrable power. From that moment on, he was merely a puppet emperor. But at the very least, he did do all he could to hide away the children who were being brought to Belhalla so that they couldn't be changed by the Lopter Order. When Arvis saw Seleph's army approaching from Miletos, he made one of his last acts, which was to entrust Sigurd's family blade Tyrfing to a priest named Palmark, who he ordered to flee the castle in order to help Seleph retrieve the sword. He next entrusted Julia, whom Manfroy had captured just as Seleph began his march from Thracia, with the circlet that her mother had always worn. Although he tried to keep her with him, Julia was taken away to meet Julius again in Belhalla, and so Arvis resigned himself to see what his final fate would be within the castle of Chalfi. Unknowingly due to the Emperor's actions, Seleph is able to retrieve Tyrfing, and with great pity for the thoroughly defeated man, they strike down Emperor Arvis for good. Meanwhile, Julia had been taken to Belhalla, and although she was about to be murdered by her brother, Julius was then convinced by the priest Manfroy to let her live instead so that her incredible magical powers could be used against the Liberation Army, a move which would actually seal the fate of every player in the Holy War. After fighting through the remaining dukedoms of Granvale, a controlled Julia was sent against the Liberation Army, but evading her on the battlefield and bypassing Belhalla altogether, Seleph and his army discovered and killed Manfroy the Master Manipulator, which effectively freed Julia from his control. Although they looked all over Manfroy's lair for the Book of Naga, which is the one weapon which could equally oppose Julius's Book of Loptus, they eventually discovered that the key to where the book was stored was hidden within the circlet that Emperor Arvis had just given to Julia. 
and this is what gave the Liberation Army exactly the weapon that they needed to take down the Possessed Emperor. In the final showdown, Julia's power of Naga thundered against Julius's Loptus, whilst Seleph took him on using his Bloodline's Mighty Blade. And at long last, the Scion of Darkness was defeated. As the dragon Loptus faded away, Seleph rightfully claimed the capital, marking the beginning of a long and prosperous reign, as peace once again returned to the land. It's hard to find the right words for just how much a leap forward this game story was in its complexity, both in its character depth and the overall events which led to the actions of everyone involved. As the sheer runtime of that story recap might have told you, this is one beast of a game. There are so many characters, countries, cities, cultures, and backstories to get through that nailing it all in the entry that first introduces us to them all seems outrageous. And yet, Somehow, they did it. As I spoiled earlier, this section is going to be filled with praise. But let me just get the obvious one out of the way first. Sigurd's tale in Generation 1 and all the other characters in his groups, or on the periphery, completely outshine their Generation 2 counterparts. To be fair though, how could they not? Sigurd navigates through a complicated mess of shifting political allegiances, through his actions fighting back at only the initial symptoms of the mess that the Lopter cult is about to enact upon the world. While I would say that Sigurd is one of the best Fire Emblem characters I have thus seen, it's really not due to his personality. Just like young Marth, Alm slash Selica, and then older Marth, he's brave and just and would do anything to protect his friends. Like a young knight would be, he's honest and romantic, and this actually makes him rather naive, which is what ultimately leads to his downfall. He's really not unlike Ned Stark from A Game of Thrones, which is fitting because both of these works actually came out in the same year. There's a lot to dig into when it comes to analyzing Sigurd and the world that he finds himself in. Selif, on the other hand, well... Stop me if this sounds familiar, but an inexperienced boy of prophecy takes up arms in order to get vengeance on the empire that killed his parents. Yes, this is just Marth's story yet again. And just like the story of the Star Lord Marth, Selif mainly just travels from place to place, winning every single battle. Hell, Selif even does one better than his predecessor by skipping conquering the entire world before just jumping right to the end and finishing off the entire evil regime which had held the entire continent in a stranglehold for the last 17 years. Compared to the struggles and tragedies seen in Generation 1, Selif wins so easily that it kind of seems like everything that he went through was just set up for him to win, and oh, hey, wait a minute, that's exactly what happens. We find out throughout the course of Generation 2 that besides being the rightful heir to the Empire, Selif actually did have multiple people who were working to prop him up, with two extremely important ones being Prince Lewin and Emperor Arvis. Selif is absolutely set up to win, and even though he definitely does accomplish a lot on his own, at the end of the day, his struggle feels a lot more artificial than his father's, or even to those around him. Arvis in particular, whose rise in Generation 1 and fall in Generation 2 makes him one of the most fascinating character studies in any RPG that I've ever played. After tricking and roasting the entire Generation 1 group, you'd think that this character would be completely irredeemable for the rest of the game. Arvis takes drastic action in an unforgiving world in order to take his power, it's true. And although his rival Sigurd is the one to die first, Arvis is actually punished worse by being forced to live through the crumbling of his own dreams and empire. It turns out that even though Arvis is willing to do anything to achieve his dreams of peace, he ends up being the victim of those who would do even more. Due to most of Generation 2's best moments actually happening in the background and not to our protagonist, even great tragedies like the decline of Arvis don't hit home in quite the same way as some of the key moments in Generation 1. Man, are they gonna kill Ethlyn's baby as well? Hold tight, Altina. I'll protect you no matter what. Huh. <sighs> Come on. Goodbye. Finn, I entrust Eth Leaf to you, huh? I'm sad now, you guys. I really liked Quan and his wife. I don't think it's a good idea if she's the heir of Naga. Is she gonna do nothing about it? Huh. Damn you, Arvis. Yeah. <laughs> 
Huh? Huh? And thus comes the end of an era. Well, many heroes lost their lives on this path. Quan, the Prince of Leonster. Oh yeah, now Quan, Eldegan, and Sigurd are all dead. Aww. It's safe to say that nothing in Generation 2 hit me as hard as any of those, and that seems to be the case for most of the players that I've heard from. Still, even though the story's strengths and weaknesses are extremely lopsided, the scope and impact that it had as a whole are really on a different scale compared to the previous three games. Shouzo Kago was able to deliver on a new narrative in a new setting with an even bigger scale, and accepting its few flaws, it's no challenge at all for me to call this one of the greatest plots I've ever seen. I really can't give enough thanks to the people who recommended that I went in blind to this one, and also a big thanks to the people in my chat during my streams to make sure that I stayed that way. Even though we have just spent a massive amount of time tackling the story of this game, we're actually only getting started in our analysis. On top of this unprecedented tale, when it came to its gameplay, intelligent systems also delivered their most diverse and different entry yet, and we have a lot to tackle in the sections to come. <laughs> In some ways, Genealogy of the Holy War is like an alternate version of Fire Emblem Gaiden. The final product, at the end of the day, was unmistakably a Fire Emblem game, but the core concepts and interpretations of its elements were so fundamentally different that it's kind of not at the same time. There are so many new or tweaked systems in this game that I'm actually going to be breaking down my gameplay discussion into three chapters just to keep my systems discussions focused and somewhat understandable, I hope. Let's start at the beginning, shall we? Almost every battle in this game will begin in a castle, which fundamentally change a whole lot of things about this game. First of all, in a way, this is your deployment screen. Any units that you don't want to send out can just remain right inside here. And while they're inside, they're able to go into the town, which in includes a lot of options, such as the blacksmith, the pawnbroker, the supply, arena, augury, and armory. Outside of this town, when they're just in the castle castle, there are a few other mechanics, such as this now being the place where you promote your units, who no longer need to use an item to do so, and can also only promote when they hit level 20, because this game now uses a raised level cap of 30, and that doesn't reset when you get promoted. You'll just be going from 20 to 30 while in your new class. A lot of things in this castle fundamentally changed the way the game is played. And in prior entries of this retrospective series, specifically the very first one, I lamented about the actual mechanics of doing things like on-map inventory management, about how trading and shopping just uses up turns upon turns upon turns, something which is especially aggravating at the end of battles when all enemies are gone and you just want to get things organized and move on. Well, imagine my surprise to find out that this system fixes absolutely all of that. Utilizing any any of the town services, including, most interestingly, the arena, does not use up your unit's action. Right at the start, or later on in the battles for all units who go back to their home castle, you can do all of this management without needing to cycle through endless, endless turns. While for some of these, such as accessing the supply or augury, doesn't really have an effect on gameplay, three of these in particular do have an enormous impact on how this game is played. And those three are the blacksmith, the pawnbroker, and the arena. Let's start with the blacksmith. Any and all weapons that you own can be repaired back to full use using your unit's gold, which is actually a big departure from running through disposable weapons in prior entries. Instead, here, your weapons are a lot more permanent. While this can mean that, yes, your crappy iron swords and spears are never going to fully break as long as you remember to take them back to the shop, this also means that your legendary weapons, which really tilt the battles in your favor, are only restricted in usage by your gold supply. By the way, that gold supply plays very heavily into the next game changer here, which is the pawnbroker. You see, units in this game can no longer trade directly with each other. The only way to transfer weapons or items from one unit to another is to have one go to the pawn shop, sell the desired item to the pawnbroker for half its worth, and then have your other unit go to the pawn shop and buy it back at its full price. This can seem like a bit of an arbitrary system, but it becomes a lot more complicated when you add in the fact that all units in this game have their own individual gold supply. That's right, there's no more sharing your army's gold into one collective pot. Every one of your soldiers 
has their own unique wallet. And other than the one thief that is available in each generation, who can actually give their gold to anyone, as well as between units which have become lovers, who can also trade their gold between each other, there's no other way of getting your gold around. It might sound a little bit bizarre, but really at the end of the day, this is all just a complicated way of saying that transferring items between your units in this game comes with a literal cost. And it also means that managing your unit's wallets can be just as important to strategize when you're out on the field. After all, there are only a few ways for units to make money in this game. You can use thieves to attack enemies and mug all the gold off of them, which is risky. You could also have your unit be the one who rescues villages on maps, which definitely requires planning. Or you can get a kind of salary at the start of each chapter, which requires you to finish entire missions in order to get. But actually, the most reliable way of making money is the last thing on our list, and that is participating in and winning at the arena. To be quite honest, I'm very torn on the mechanics of using the arena in this game. Let's start off with the basics. In each mission, when you go to the arena, your units are able to go against seven challengers, with each win getting them successively more gold and experience. Once they have beaten all seven challengers during the mission, that unit can no longer access the arena until you start the next mission. This all seems reasonable so far, but here's the thing. For the first time ever, losing in the arena does not end in death for your character. They'll simply have their health reduced to one, but other than that, no penalty. For some units, who actually fight better at low health, getting them through their arena challenges can be a matter of simply retrying over and over again, even with just one health, so that you can stumble into the RNG that nets them a better fight until they just win. Keep in mind that you don't have to wager any money to use the arena in this entry. And also, your unit isn't losing any turns by making their attempts. In fact, the only negative expenditure at the arena is losing the durability of your weapons, which in almost all cases can be easily repaired at the blacksmith back to full quality just from a minor pittance of your arena profits. Oh, and I should also add in that if your character does win, then your unit will instantly be healed back to full health for free, which is convenient because it does make them ready to take on the next challenger, but it can also allow for some really absurd strategies, such as retreating a heavily injured unit into a castle, which does use up their action, yes, but on the following turn you can have them fight an easy arena battle for the free healing, and then send them back out into the field without using up a turn to get that win, so that they can fight anew once more. It's all a bit strange how this functions, but where it gets a bit insidious is when you can start to feel that putting everyone through this arena grind is a bit of a necessity for not just taking on the later missions bigger challenges, but also in getting each unit the kind of gold that they'll need to make more than just the most basic item transfers. For me, the start of each mission always began with a bit of a grind fest, one that paid off in gold and experience a bit too well to be ignored. Honestly, I'm of multiple minds when it comes to these home castle mechanics. I definitely, definitely love the ability to access the supply, armor, and blacksmith with multiple units without having to burn through turns like candy. I actually find the pawnbroker system completely inoffensive. It's actually an interesting enough way to force you to plan out not just managing your strategies, but also managing your expenses. But to me, the arena is a bit too, well, I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but overly reliable? Ignoring the arena is basically just ignoring free money and free experience every single mission. Even if your character can't beat all of the seven fighters, not giving the first couple a try is the same as just leaving money and experience on the floor. Like I say, it's just a bit strange how it all functions. It's certainly an interesting direction to take, but I'm not really sure that it's a very sustainable one for future games. Anyways, I think that's enough of the home castle already, because we're going to be analyzing something just a little bit more exciting next. Going outside and dating. The support system of Genealogy of the Holy War might be the most influential addition to the series from this game. Something which is kind of amusing when you understand that it was a bit of a last minute inclusion by Kaga, as romance systems happen to be in in gaming around that time. Note that the first Harvest Moon game, which was also well known for allowing you to romance and marry various town girls on top of your already busy life, came out in the same year as Genealogy of the Holy War. When it comes to blooming love on a battlefield, the actual ways that the romance works 
force is vastly underwhelming when compared to the complexity of the actual results. There is a lot to go into here, so we're going to start off with the most confusing topics. What is Holy Blood, and how does it function? Thankfully, because this game does menus very, very well, there is actually an option on every character stat sheet which can show you if they are the inheritors of any of the Crusader's Holy Blood. Its biggest effect comes into play by allowing characters with major Holy Blood to wield some of the most powerful weapons in the game, on top of receiving a lot more stat growth when leveling up. Characters with minor Holy Blood don't get the special weapons, and also only get half of the special stat growths. Still quite an upgrade compared to your non-Holy units. As for how that works with the support system, I'm going to use the character Lewin as an example. Lewin is met in Chapter 2 of this game, and he carries the Holy Blood of Sed the Crusader, whose famous weapon was the extremely powerful Forseti Wind Tome. It is possible to have Lewin romance and marry any of the single female characters in your army, but in this game the children born are predetermined by the mother. For some of Lewin's pairings, his wife will give birth to a son or daughter mage who will inherit the ability to use Forseti, but for other pairings his children will have no magical aptitude, and the Crusader weapon will essentially be unusable by his second generation. The way that Holy Blood can transfer down and how it can allow or block your usage of the available Crusader weapons is remarkably complicated. But this isn't the only inheritance, which finally brings me to another big addition in this game, skills. The skills system of genealogy, like the support system, would go on to be another extremely important addition that would go far, far into the series. Essentially, there are 18 possible skills that each unit can have. 16 if you want to take out the steel and dance skills, which are basically additional actions for certain classes. So, these 16 other passive skills basically turn what used to be complete RNG, such as the likelihood of landing critical attacks, into something more of a controllable aspect for your characters. Some of these skills are gained by promoting your units, such as the Pavis damage blocking skill gained when an armor knight upgrades to a general. However, most of these are just part of your character's starting stat sheet. Let's compare the game's obligatory starting cavaliers, Noish and Alec. Noish has high strength and the critical skill, which can allow him to hit big but infrequent criticals, whereas Alec has low strength but the pursuit skill, which allows him to very reliably hit double attacks, albeit with less damage for each one. Personally, I really love how the skill system is able to differentiate your fighters, even when they're the same classes like this. But where this moves into utter brilliance is exactly what this chapter is about, inheritance. Just like how you can plan out your holy blood combinations with a bit of foresight or experience, both the mother and fathers that you choose will pass down all of their skills to their children, which can naturally lead to some combinations which are simply way better than others. Like I said, the possibilities here are enormous, and I haven't even gotten into how inventory items are handed down based on both parent and gender. I'm just going to say that personally, I almost never go for the optimal routes in games. I usually just ship my characters based on my personal headcanons, or who I thought would make a cute pair, and somehow I still wound up with great units in the second half of the game. So powerful are these skills that it's almost impossible to end up with a complete bunch of losers. So with a vague idea of all these inheritance rules, and with all of these possibilities, let's talk about how your units even fall in love. Essentially, all of your single units have a secret love stat for each potential partner in the game, and when that love stat goes over a certain number, they're in love. The first sign of this that you may notice is that they are now able to transfer money out on the field, or that when you go into the same home castle as each other, they will have an adorable little exchange at the door upon seeing each other after their status change. There are many different ways to affect this love stat, with some dialogue options between certain units leading to massive unseen boosts to their affection ratings with certain characters. And fortunately, the game also smartly raises the love rating for units which join later in the story so that you won't accidentally get a pairing you're unhappy with due to certain units simply having a longer exposure to each other. That being said, it is very easy to suddenly find that two units you didn't even know were interested in each other are suddenly married. It just happens sometimes. Though there are some of these special cases, the most reliable way to raise two units' affections with each other is to simply have them wait next to each other. Similar to the arena system, this unfortunately also is a little bit too easily gained. Though each mission smartly stops all love growth after the first 50 turns, which prevents you from pairing two units up who may have literally just met the same day, even though that's exactly the story of what a certain main character does in this game, simply not using your first 50 turns to grind out your desired pairing's love points is the same as just leaving the love points on the floor. In some of the calmer battles here, using your time wisely to game this system becomes a bit of a routine. You're likely just going to use the first couple turns to get everyone through the arena, and then use all of your turns up until the 50th one to get your supports closer and closer to marrying. After that's all done, 
just play the map like a normal Fire Emblem game. So once again, this is another very bold and influential change that is just not perfectly done the first time around. I'll be excited to see how they manage love and relationships in the games going forward from here. Combat and genealogy of the Holy War is in many ways the most complex yet seen in the series. Something that might be expected for the next sequel, but I want to really stress how much more complicated it became with this entry. Especially because this was the game that debuted the series' very well-known weapon triangle system. This of course is referring to the classic sword beats axe, axe beats spear, and spear beats sword system, which is just a series mainstay by now. But also included in this entry was a magic triangle system, with wind beating thunder, thunder beating fire, and fire beating wind, meanwhile light and dark magic beat all three. At this point in the series, using the right weapon for the job didn't add any extra damage, but it did add a considerable boost to your accuracy and to your avoid. But even though this was yet another series staple introduced in this game, that's actually not what this chapter is about. This chapter is about the elephant in the room. The big, big elephant in the room. Yes, that's right, we're getting right down to it. We're gonna be talking about two things that this game is most infamous for. It's map size and it's horses. Let's set things up a little bit. Fire Emblem 1 set the stage for what a baseline Fire Emblem experience was, and actually the later entries stuck remarkably close to that. Not this one. In a typical Fire Emblem game setup, you take your army from battle to battle, and although each battle map could vary in shape, when measured out, they would probably range between 30 by 30 squares. And that was if it was particularly large. The number of turns that it takes to complete a map of about this size would heavily depend on a player's skill and the speed at which they enjoy playing strategy games like this. I would personally estimate that a very fast player could beat a map like this in 7 to 10 turns, whereas a slower player might take around 25 to 35. But of course, this can bloat even more so if they're really taking their time. For a fast player, that's probably about 10 to 15 minutes on a map, but for a slower player, that's probably 40 minutes to an hour. For me, I guess I'm kind of in between, but that's not what this is about. Let's compare this map to a Fire Emblem 4 map. BAM! We're looking at about 64 by 64 squares here, and although not all parts of this map are actually relevant to play in, still, this is pretty typical of the amount of area that you're going to see in each battle. If we take these two maps and figure out the area by multiple multiplying them, we're looking at about 700 squares here and 4,000 here. I hope that establishes a little bit of an idea for just how big the difference actually is. And strap yourselves in everyone, because I'm about to tell you why it doesn't really matter that much. Comparing these two maps like they're apples to apples completely fails to take into account some really important factors, such as this map and all others in this game being split into very distinct parts. You see, you're going to be starting out at this castle, and your first real objective is to get down south and take this one. This map is actually kind of rare in that it is possible to go to the western castle if you want to, but the intended design is that you take this castle first, which nets you a very powerful unit which you can then train up against the enemies to the west. And that's the second part of this fight. After you take the western castle, the way to the last castle, which had been blocked off, finally opens up, and the battle becomes about navigating the forest and then besieging a castle which runs right up next to it, all while you're bombarded with spells and arrows. In reality, as far as I'm concerned, this map is actually the same as three. One, two, and three. This is just an early map, so let's look at another one real fast. This map has one of the most unconventional designs in the game. However, it still follows the mission to mission formula. Mission one, mission two, mission three, mission four. Something that makes this map drag a little bit longer is that you will be defending with your characters over here in the east, but still, this map's progression is clearly delineated into these distinct sections. So, if a typical Fire Emblem game, according to the first and third ones, has about 25 to 40 missions, we can take Genealogy's 12 maps and divide them by castle section to see about how many missions it really has. According to my math, and it might slightly differ for you, we have about two missions and then three, four, three, 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 four, three, three, four, and four. Doing the math for you, that's 39 missions. Both the layout of the maps and from my own playtime reflect that this game is actually right on par for a Fire Emblem experience. But, 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 but. 
that's not the end of the story. Even though this game's length and map structure does fall in line with the other ones, I can't understate what a big deal it is that all of your units are going to be deployed in the same place for the entire time you're in one of these massive fields. In a different Fire Emblem game, beating the map means that you will go directly to the next mission, where all of your units are redeployed together again, meaning that everyone will be involved in the next early skirmishes for sure. That's not the case in Fire Emblem 4, where the next mission opens up on the exact same map without altering the location of any of your units for it. What this means is that your characters with lower movement capabilities are at a massive disadvantage when compared to their mounted counterparts. Not when it comes to stats, in fact most of the ground only units have the better skills and stats by far, but that means little to nothing when they are constantly behind the mounted units and not actually getting to take part in most of the action. On a smaller Fire Emblem map, this isn't really that big of a problem. A typical ground unit only has about one to two less movement than a mounted one, which means that over the course of five turns, if you're marching strictly in one direction, they're only going to be about five to ten squares behind, something which means that if a fight breaks out, they could probably still participate. However, it's not until this effect gets dragged over the course of 50 to 100 plus turns that it can start to get really, really noticeable. While you can avoid this problem by just having your mounted units go forward and then wait for your ground infantry to catch up, it's undeniable that this is going to feel like an anchor for some, and can make it easy to understand why this becomes a source of frustration for so many players. Even bringing up all of this, I haven't even begun mentioning the canter mechanic, which is another huge, huge introduction. Added to this game is the ability for all mounted units to continue to use their movement after taking their action. What this means is if a mounted unit who has a movement of 8 moves 4 squares to attack an enemy, after attacking they can then move again with the remaining 4. In the past I've gone over the importance of positioning, and about how proper positioning allows you to force the enemy into a bad formation, or to ensure that one of your units can only be attacked a set number of times that you predict they'll be able to handle. This system of positioning was something that I really loved, and Cantor absolutely changes all of this, both in positive and negative ways. On the negative side, this method of body blocking no longer means anything when you're facing up against an army of mounted units. They can attack a single unit in your army as many times as they want until it's dead, and it doesn't matter if you made any kind of formation. The only way to avoid this kind of situation is to lure in mounted units at the very last square of their movement capabilities, and then converge on them all at once, and just hope to win before the next turn comes, and they probably kill one of your units. No one in this game is going to be able to survive 12 attacks in a row on the following turn, unless their name is Sigurd. In the previous Fire Emblem game, forced dismounting of your mounted units was an added mechanic, something which is completely missing here. In that video, I was surprised to see a few people saying that they thought that this dismounting mechanic was a very important nerf to the cavalry units who they felt always had an unfair advantage in the series. Up until this game, they didn't. Cavalry units could not canter. And although they had good movement, they had pretty mediocre stats that made them crumple pretty quickly if they weren't being backed up by your tougher infantry units who could better hold the ground. At the time, I didn't understand how anyone could say that the cavalry units, who were already pretty weak, needed some kind of nerf. But having played this entry now, I think I get it. I fully believe that the perception of mounted units being overpowered stems right here. Without a doubt, even though your mounted units still have generally lower stats and weaker skills than their grounded counterparts, the ability to canter does change everything and always makes them the superior choice. There are some very fun but completely outrageous strategies that are possible now that can be used in every single battle that infantry units just can't do. Here's some examples. For flying units like Pegasus or Dragon Knights, you can now attack from unreachable terrain and then canter them back to safety, meaning that you risk absolutely nothing by deep positioning them. If an archer is walking anywhere close to a mountain, he's pretty much a dead man. In other situations, you can use your infantry or tough units as a strong front line, and then have a unit from the back attack out, and then canter back behind your strong defensive line, also risking absolutely nothing. Perhaps the most devastating thing that's added to this game, which definitely benefits from canter, are the new mechanics that the dancer class has, where now, instead of only being able to rejuvenate and give a turn back to one unit at a time, she is now able to give it to all four units that surround her, which means you can set up perfect runs of four units who attack, canter back into a formation, and then give them all four turns again. This system changes so much about combat in this game. To be honest, I was pretty giddy and a bit in shock when I discovered its inclusion early into one of those blind streams. And it shows the experience numbers. Oh, okay. Huh? What's this? <laughs> 
<laughs> what? <laughs> you can use your extra movement after you move? Wow, I like that. Um, well, I kind of wanted him right here. Okay. I'm not gonna say that it isn't fun to play with a broken mechanic like this. In single player games, perfect balance isn't always the goal, but I do think that its inclusion does make it harder for players to resist from using and abusing it. I do like the Cantor system, and I think it's a brilliant way to power up the cavalry units. However, I don't think it's gonna be very shocking to say that this is buffing gone way, way too far, and it's definitely easy to see why the dismounting system works better post-genealogy than before it. I suppose I'm just gonna have to find out how it's going to be handled and later entries. Because having said just about everything that I want to say, it's about time that we finish this game off. It is extremely difficult to put everything that Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War accomplished into one tidy little conclusion. Because, much like this video, even if you attempt to shorten everything that it accomplished, describing the sheer volume of it all eventually just makes things run on and on and on. But still, I'm going to give my best shot at it. Without this entry, Fire Emblem as a series would look completely unrecognizable to anybody who knows it today. Introducing such massive inclusions, such as a fully fleshed out support system and weapon triangle, this game stepped even further out of formula and took even bigger risks than Fire Emblem Gaiden, and despite its rushed, chaotic development and last-minute system implementations, it would be almost impossible to call this one the Black Sheep today, just because later Fire Emblem is so deeply built off of this entry. For sure, some of the very maligned aspects like the massive maps and overpowered cavalry units certainly needed to be tweaked, but still, much like other famous diversions, my favorite being Majora's Mask, it gives this game a lot of its personality, and is something that I'm still glad that they went with, at least for this one entry. It is easy to get lost just talking about all of the gameplay inclusions here, but I really can't give enough credit to the extremely powerful and effective storyline which actually managed to achieve Kaga's dream of both introducing a new setting and somehow making it into one of the most emotional and complex tales in anything in gaming. As far as I'm concerned, for fans of RPGs, strategy games, and later Fire Emblem games, or just great games in general, genial of the Holy War is a must play. The many commenters on my videos were not wrong. This game is something special, and I am so glad to have made it to this point in the series to finally have the chance to experience for myself. This game deserves to be recognized for its many achievements, and very importantly, it deserves to have not sat hidden by its limited release options for so long. Like many others, I am now extremely hopeful that Intelligent Systems does decide to give this one a remake, because not only would I like to see some of its minor mistakes rebalanced, I would really like just to see it make its way into the hands of millions of more players. Still, we can't say for certain right now if a remake is coming or not, and so I just have to plead for anyone whose interest has been piqued, don't wait to experience this game. Genealogy of the Holy War is a truly incredible game, and is one of the most memorable experiences I've ever had in my entire lifetime of gaming. Don't wait, just do what you have to do, and play this game game. Having experienced the epic war for Jugdrill's freedom, spanning an entire continent's worth of battles, I think it's about time that we slow things down a bit and get intimate. Focusing entirely on the story of Prince Leif and the fate of the Thracian Peninsula, our next stop in this Fire Emblem retrospective takes us to the most infamous game in this series' history, the brutal and beloved Thracia 776. watching this video, then odds are that you know this game by reputation alone. Unforgiving, 
uncompromising, and unsympathetic to its players. These are the words in which this game was repeatedly described to me by a majority of my audience. Yet, this wasn't all there was. As I have been getting nearer to this entry, especially after the last video, among the warnings, many viewers also made it clear to me how dear this game is to them. More than a few have called it their very favorite in the franchise, finding it superior even to the very beloved genealogy of the Holy War. By the time I started this game, about the only thing I could say that I knew was that Thracia 776 is a lot of things to a lot of people. To some, it's a symbol of how great games used to be. Before accessibility was the number one concern, a game didn't have to spend the first quarter slowly doling out information, and instead it could be very complex from the moment it launched. It could be challenging every step of the way, making each small piece of progress a certain cause for celebration. To other players, however, this game is very much the opposite. Instead, it's proof that modern game designers have improved their skills dramatically, and by implementing a more welcoming design theory throughout their games, more players can be brought to the table without scaring them away for good. So then, what is the truth in all of this? Is Thracia 776 a masterpiece, or is it simply an exercise in frustration? In this video, I am going to be exploring this game from top to bottom in an effort to find out which side is right. We will be examining its turbulent development history, giving a story synopsis for new or returning players, and then following that with an in-depth analysis of both its story and the many, many gameplay complexities which were introduced here. Welcome to Fire Emblem 5. If you have been watching this series up until now, you will know that the development of these games has been relatively stable. Shozo Kaga, a young designer at Intelligent Systems, was critical in helping to launch his company's first flagship series, and he had been the director and lead designer of it ever since. Alongside him, two other titans emerged and have remained consistent throughout, with Gunpei Yokoi as the producer and Yuka Tsujiyoko handling the classic music. Thracia 776 marks the first first time that these three would no longer be working together on the series, and also by the end of the game's development, each one of them will have gone their separate ways. The previous Fire Emblem game, Genealogy of the Holy War, was the final game that Gunpei Yokoi worked on for Nintendo. Three months following its release in August 1996, he retired from Nintendo at age 54, after having worked there for 30 years. He left both his position and role as the producer of the Fire Emblem series to his successor, Takehiro Izu. Tragically, Gunpei Yokoi would die in a fatal traffic accident only 14 months later, bringing an early end to the man who made a critical impact on the establishment of this franchise, as well as many, many others. Replacing Katsuyoshi Koya as the character designer was Mayumi Hirota, whom Shozo Kaga chose himself, feeling that her artwork evoked the energy and style he had always been imagining for his characters. The sequel to Genealogy started development around the beginning of 1998 and this new game was actually meant to be very small in scope and also to be completed quickly. The setting was once again Yggdral, the very same continent as the previous game, with the events seen within taking place in the middle of the previous game's story, placing it inside an intentionally brief period of time, specifically the one year of Prince Leaf's life where he led his own rebellion in the Thracian Peninsula. For a short side game, this brief snippet of time with a return to the old gameplay was fine. However, soon, both the story Kaga was writing as well as the gameplay changes envisioned started to strain against the constraints which the team had placed on themselves. Soon enough, the game's release date started to get pushed further and further away. From all that I've researched about him, Shozo Kaga seems to be a man who loves telling game stories as much as crafting the mechanics for them. And so, I really get the sense that after realizing that he had trapped himself into too small a framework for what he usually liked to do, he instead buckled down more on what he could work with, crafting a tale which would be more personal, more intense, and hopefully more evocative than before. This is something that also happened to the gameplay on hand, and frankly, it's a little bit staggering to see how much was added into the already well-traveled formula of Fire Emblems 1 through 3. The fifth Fire Emblem game would eventually see release on September 1st, 1999 for the Super Famicom, which was followed shortly by Shozo Kaga himself leaving Intelligent Systems and Nintendo. This was after he had served as lead on the Fire Emblem franchise for nearly 10 years. Joining him in this exit was Mayumi Hirota, who joined him in creating their own game studio, Tiernanog. 
Kaga went on to make two games under Tiernog, Nog, which resembled the Fire Emblem series so close as to bring legal action by Nintendo constantly throughout the years. As a brief aside, I just wanted to say that I am not going to be covering the Tier Ring Saga games in this retrospective series, but they are definitely something that I want to get into the future once this series is completed. Jumping back to Thracia, it received a very different kind of release compared to all the prior games in the franchise. First released for Nintendo Power's Flash Cartridge System, players who wanted the game would take a cartridge to a special kind of kiosk where they would install it onto a cartridge to then take home. The benefit to this was, at the cost of the inconvenience and needing to rewrite games on your cartridge, games could be bought at a cheaper price using this method. As incredibly niche as this sounds, it was actually decently popular at the time. And Thracia 776 quickly became the best-selling Super Famicom game that September. There's kind of a side note to this here, but eventually, in December 1999, a standard cartridge was announced announced and released on January 21st, 2000 and together, the two versions became top sellers for the Super Famicom those years. However, there is a small bit of context that I've been leaving out so far, and if you were gaming back then before the turn of the century, you might already be wondering when I'm going to mention it. 1999 and 2000 was well into the Nintendo 64's lifespan. It's true that Thracia was a bestseller for those years, but the Super Famicom was well beyond dead at that time. Only a few years after its release, Thracia's sales totaled between 100 to 100. 50,000 copies, making it the worst selling Fire Emblem game. To this day, its physical cartridge version is incredibly rare to find, and if you ever do see it at a store in Japan, you can expect it to be extremely expensive. Not only is this game hard for Japanese players to even get a hold of, for Western players who primarily play these early entries through translated ROMs, even that wasn't truly available until only a few months ago at the time of this video's release. This fantastic translation I used, named Project Exile, makes this game not only playable without bugs, but also as understandable and well-written as the Project Naga translation I praised in my genealogy retrospective. For those who haven't played this game and are curious, or for those who have and need a refresher, I'm next going to be giving a full story synopsis, which will then be followed by my own full analysis of it. If you'd like to go ahead and skip to the analysis section, please follow the top time code, or if you're just looking to avoid all spoilers, both from the synopsis and my analysis, you can click to the second time code to enjoy the rest of this video spoiler-free. I'll give you all a moment to decide if you want to skip forward, because after I count down, we're getting into all of it in 3, 2, 1. In the land of Yggdral, on the border of the Kingdom of Izak and the Yid Desert, a conflict which had thrown the continent into chaos was about to come to a head. The year was 763. To the north, Sigurd and his army had just defeated one of the perpetrators of the continent's current crisis, Duke Langbolt. To the south, a group of Leonster knights led by Prince Quan and his wife Ethlin were traversing the desert, going as fast as they could in order to reinforce Sigurd's wearied troops. It was at this time, from out of what were once peaceful skies that a squadron of dragon knights appeared, with Leonster's rival, King Trevant of Thracia, at its head. Within minutes, every last one of Leonster's soldiers had been eliminated by the vastly more maneuverable flyers, and soon even Quan and Ethlin joined their troops in the grave, leaving behind their two children, Altena and Leif. The deaths of Quan and Ethlin in the desert, along with the disappearance of their daughter Altena, caused utter chaos back in Leonster. In response to his son and daughter-in-law's death, the king of Leonster rode out against Thracia, but was quickly betrayed and killed by General Raedric, who had actually been working in secret to provoke Thracia into attacking their neighbor, a plan which had worked perfectly. With Leonster defenseless, Trevant did as was expected and attacked the castle. As his rioters raged and the fires burned, the last remaining child of Quan and Ethlin was spirited out of the castle by a young knight named Finn, carrying the two-year-old Prince Leif in his arms and accompanied by the daughter of a noblewoman named Nana, they stopped only to look back at their burning home before continuing along their way. Although the Kingdom of Thracia successfully managed to burn and capture Castle Leonster, they were soon ousted by the Granvalian Empire who had secretly set all of this conflict up. 
After forcing Trevant's kingdom to become a servant state, the Empire replaced the royal family of Leonster with a loyal pawn, establishing Duke Bloom as the new king of what was to be renamed the Northern Kingdom of Thracia. The only threat to the new king was the last remaining Leonster royal, who had just evaded him. And so, for much of Leif's young days, he was hunted and pursued across the entire Thracian peninsula. Every time that trouble caught them, it was Finn who either ensured their escape or overpowered their pursuers. As the young prince was smuggled from shelter to shelter, eventually the trio found their way to the small town of Fianna in the east. There, not only was he welcomed by the townspeople, but he was also promised protection by their local militia, an organization called the Fianna Freeblades, who were led by a woman named Ivel. It was under her care that Leif was able to grow up in relative peace and anonymity, and soon the young prince reached the age of 15. Thirteen years had passed since the burning of Castle Leonster. The year was 776. After a long period of harmony, the Empire had finally discovered Leif's location, and with Raedric himself leading his knights, the small town Fianna suddenly came under Imperial attack. Although Leif was out at the time, both Nana and Marita, who was Ivel's daughter, were captured and taken away. Upon returning, Leif and the Freeblades liberated their home, but soon after they set off to try and recover the two missing friends. Following Following their trail to the nearby coastal town of East, they found the local townsfolk at the mercy of a gang of pirates. After stopping the attack and defending the town, a former bishop named Augustus met up with Leif and offered his services to him. Augustus had actually been working with the pirates in order to purposely put himself in the prince's path, which he did in order to offer Leif his considerable wisdom at the behest of his secret benefactor. Despite this sounding suspicious, Augustus was in truth acting as an agent of Prince Lewin, who was one of Sigurd's allies in the crisis before the Empire's rise. Continuing towards Castle Manster where his friends had been taken, Leif next fought his way through the Kerberos Gate, but it was here at the very last moment where he fell right into a trap set by Raedric, who was using Nana's life as leverage in order to get Leif to surrender. Fearing for her safety, Leif agreed to let himself be taken captive, but he was soon joined in this by Ivel, who did so in order to keep an eye on him even within captivity. The prince and Ivel were escorted to Castle Manster, with them both being thrown in the prison beneath the castle. While locked away, Ivel was visited and taken away by Raedric for some nefarious purpose, although he claimed that it was in order to let her see Nana and her daughter once again. While it seemed like this would be the end for the prince, suddenly a small group of fighters broke into the prison, fighters who were led by the powerful mage Sed. As Sed went above to free the child sacrifices who were being held in the castle, Leif and several of his friends happened to also find their freedom due to being wrapped up in this sudden prison break. Although Leif could have gotten away cleanly, he refused to leave his friends behind, and after hearing that Ivel and Nana had been taken to a nearby arena, him and his small group pursued. The scene that they witnessed truly shocked them, as Raedric and a mysterious cloaked figure were pitting Ivel and Nana against a series of fighters. Fighters who included Marita herself, who had been corrupted by a cursed blade that she had been presented with. Although Leif's group was able to break up this twisted show, the Dark Priest, who was named Veld, suddenly teleported Ivel against her will in front of them, and then quickly used more magic of his in order to turn her into an unmoving stone statue. With Leif and his group horrified, Veld then left, taking Raedric and Marita with him. As the Imperial forces around Manster turned their full attention to capturing Leif, the prince was forced to leave Ivel behind, rushing as fast as he could south in order to cross the border into the southern Thracian kingdom. Along the way to this, his loyal knight Finn was able to reunite with their group, along with a few more of their friends in tow, and together Leif arrived at Castle Meath where he was able to meet with the great Thracian general Hannibal. Using the pseudonym of Liu Ferris, Leif then asked for the general's approval to allow him to pass through the border. In actuality, Hannibal was not fooled by this, and he recognized Leif right on the spot. But even though his country had become a servant state for the empire, him and many of the nobles of his land had a very heavy anti-imperial sentiment. And so, he played along with Leif's ruse and allowed him through the border. Finally out of reach of the empire yet again, Leif then decided to search for for more allies wherever he could find them. 
With this in mind, he next made for the western castle of Tara, which was an open revolt against the Empire. As he passed through the rough, mountainous land, he stopped briefly at the manor home of Hannibal, where the general had been secretly sheltering the former Knights of Leonster, of which these included Duke Dorius, a man whom Leif had thought died defending him many years ago. Soon, Dorius, along with the many knights who still accompanied him, quickly joined back up with their prince. Now, with more allies than he'd ever had before, Leif's group could rightly be called a kind of liberation army, and bolstered by their new strength, they crossed back over the border and landed outside of Tara, along the way reuniting with the since-cured Marita in the forest just outside the city. Secretly entering the besieged castle, Leif met up with the local Princess Linoan, who immediately accepted their aid as they prepared for the Empire's biggest assault yet. As waves of Imperial troops poured into the area, and the walls of the city literally crumbled around them, Leif and his army fended off their forces time and time again. Although the prince and his troops had become much stronger, it soon became clear that they could not hold out for much longer, and the end for them was soon coming. Amazingly, it was Prince Arian, King Trevant's son, who suddenly came to their aid. Flying his wyvern directly into the castle keep, he persuaded the princess to hand over her castle to him without a fight, something that would end the siege and save all of her people with a single gesture. And while Arian settled things peacefully, the princess, along with Leif's liberation army, quietly slipped out with without being noticed. Free once again to choose his path, Leif and his advisors decided that it was now time to seize Leonster Castle itself, an act which would have Leif returning home for the first time since it was burned 13 years prior. But this was not a homecoming which would be easy on them. Although they did meet very heavy resistance, Leif's army proved its might against them, breaking through the wave's defenders and forcing their way into the castle itself. Finding his way into the throne room, Leif both removed the local Imperial General Gustav and also freed the families of the Leonster Knights, who had been forced to switch loyalty after the prince's departure. It was this act which regained him the loyalty of the greatest of all of Leonster's knights, Xavier. Thirteen years after the slaughter of his parents and his grandfather the king, Leif and and his protector Finn reclaimed the home which had been stolen away from them so long ago. Though the capture of their home castle was a miraculous victory, it wasn't long before an imperial counterattack was organized, one which left Leif's group staring down the biggest invading force they had ever seen. As the full might of the Empire and King Bloom's forces bore down against them, Castle Leonster seemed like it was about to be taken from them yet again. And it was right when hope seemed lost that a second force suddenly appeared, one which, with stunning speed and organization, obliterated the forces outside of the castle and rescued those remaining in Leif's care. At the head of this army was Selif, the son of Sigurd and the so-called Scion of Light who had arrived to support his cousin Leif. And soon their savior assured Leif that he was no longer alone in his fight, and that his troops, which had already liberated the northern land of Isak from the Empire's control, would have his back while he finished his business in northern Thracia. With newfound confidence like never before, Leif and his group charged straight for Castle Manster, where Raedric and Veld were awaiting them. It was outside of Manster where Leif once again encountered Sed, who on top of seizing the castle early for him, also ensured the delivery of Bragi's blade directly to the prince, a weapon which was capable of taking on Raedric's own Loptus sword, which had been granted to him by Veld. Entering the castle from three angles, Leif's army worked in harmony to disable the defenders of the castle, free the imprisoned children within, and to corner Raedric in the throne room. As Bragi's blade and the Loptus sword clashed together, the traitor who had seen personally to the end of his family, was finally slain by the prince. With Raedric out of the way, Leif's group was free to search the castle, surprisingly finding the only staff which could free Ivel from the petrification spell that Veld had cast on her. Fortunately, Ivel's frozen remains had been brought to Manster Castle as a trophy, and this twist of fate allowed them to finally return her back to normal, regaining a very powerful ally. The last year they had been away from each other had certainly changed Prince Leif, and before her was no longer the boy that she thought she'd known, but instead a man worthy of not only her motherly love, but also of due respect. After descending to the lowest level of Manster Castle, Leif and his group found Veld, bolstered in power by five dead lords, which had been gifted to him by the leader of his order. Although each of the inhumanly powerful foes put up a tremendous threat, eventually each and every one of them fell to Leif's allies. With all of his dark defenses defeated, Veld was an easy target for the prince, and soon the Dark Priest met the same fate as Raedric, marking an end to the Empire's influence in Leif's homeland. With his victory finally achieved, 
observed, the prince took a brief moment to rest, considering the long road that he had taken to get this far. His homeland had been freed, but many others throughout the continent still suffered under the oppression of the Empire and the dark cult that influenced it. Thinking upon this fact, Leaf then made a decision. This was not going to be the end. It was going to be the beginning. Together with his cousin Selif, he would fight on. He would pledge his army to the Scion of Light, giving what power he could to not only free the Thracian Peninsula, but the entire land of Yggdral. The tumultuous year of 776 had finally ended, and in due time, the world would never be the same. As Shozo Kaga himself admitted, the story constraints that the team locked themselves into from Thracia's original, smaller scale plan heavily limited what could be done in the story, as well as the places the heroes went and who they could interact with. Being stuck as a mid quill, there was no way that Leaf was going to be able to take on or even interact with the big bads of his era. Instead, whole new villains, who were basically replacements, had to be substituted in so that things could still feel significant. And I think it is pretty amazing that Thracia manages to make this work as well as it does. Both Raedric and Veld, who I'd call the stand-ins for Bloom and Manfroy, actually accomplish being much more than just placeholders through a very solid setup, both in the story and the gameplay. Raedric, who right away is established as the one who set up the deaths of Quan, Ethelin, and the King, also makes a big impact through his frequent interactions with Leaf. From the first mission where he raids his home and kidnaps his friends, to slightly later when he traps and and captures the prince, and then all the way down the line when he's finally put on the defensive for when Leaf raids his castle, I would say that the rivalry between him and Leaf is very well set up. Veld, on the other hand, comes out of practically nowhere, and while he definitely has a much poorer setup than Raedric, him being the person who takes Ivel away from you for most of the game does mean that all players are going to feel the sting of having one of their best units snatched away moments after freeing her. Even if players attempt to avoid using her early on in order to make sure they're other units get XP. Story-wise, her being like a mother to the orphan Leaf, as well as her true identity being revealed later on as someone that many players will likely have nostalgia for, does do more than enough to help establish Veld as thoroughly despicable. Compared to the previous game, which interspersed its gameplay and storytelling constantly, which included a lot of optional chances for dialogue, which really helped flesh out characters or give secret bonuses, many of Thracia's original characters seem paper-thin by comparison. While there there are some optional moments for dialogue scenes to be found, it is limited by this game's more standard Fire Emblem setup. In Genealogy, for example, you never had to choose which units to bring along, and so the game could always count on you having everyone. Because of this, it could make many, many situations where dialogue could happen. But in this game, where you need to select which units you're even going to bring into the missions, it becomes much more rare, along with the lack of the menu option included in Genealogy, which told you when two units wanted to talk. These dialogue sections were some something that I really enjoyed about the last game, and honestly I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think that losing this makes the characters of Thracia lose a lot of personality. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't make up for it in other ways. There's a saying that greatness comes out of limitations, and I believe it was the limited scale of this game's story that led to Kaga actually creating his tightest work yet. For what it lacks in scale, Thracia instead makes up for it with consistent theming, and what amplifies this is how the gameplay sets up a very thick atmosphere that is always framing Leaf's journey in ways that are bound to resonate with almost every player. As an example, in the first couple of chapters, the game is very, very stringent on your money, items, and equipment. Each swing of your sword really matters, to the point where it honestly started to feel like a survival horror game. I'm not joking about this, if you waste your resources, you're really gonna have a tough time getting through this part. If we look at how the characters are feeling at this point in the story, the impression this leaves you with really makes sense. Leaf is extremely under-equipped and inexperienced at this time and as a result, he quickly gets in over his head and gets captured. It's only through random chance that he gets freed, and almost immediately starts fleeing for the border. By the time the player leads Leaf and what remains of his troops to safety, your supplies should be looking pretty rough. And with all likelihood, the player is also feeling as hopeless as the protagonist. From the point where Leaf begins to find some slight protection in the kingdom's borders, this hopelessness begins to reverse, as both the prince and the player begin to accumulate a stable base of allies and items. This is also the point 
where the game begins dropping in arenas for leveling up, as well as plenty of shops. Just like Leaf, the player is actually able to gain in power for the first time, rebuilding some of that confidence which had been shattered throughout this game's brutal first couple of hours. By the time that Leaf bursts back out of this protection in order to relieve the siege on Tara, all the way up until when he retakes Leonster Castle, both the player and Leaf will be feeling the same kind of exhilaration and rejuvenation. Just when it seems like Leaf is going to be crushed and returned back to the hopelessness of Act 1, the game uses Cell's arrival as a chance to move him into the last phase, and I would call the theme of this one Conquest. From Chapter 21 onward, the player has by then had the chance to accrue some truly powerful weapons, as well as utilize special items which by this time are likely having huge dividends. On top of this, they'll also be gaining some extremely powerful late-game allies, like Sed and Ival once more. Just like Leaf, I was feeling truly triumphant as I barged my way into Manster Castle and laid the smackdown on Raedric and Veld. Not just because they had been so distasteful in the story, but also how their brutal actions made me have to fight through the brutal gameplay early on in order to turn this all around on them. This is truly the kind of experience that one can only get from a game, and having now experienced it so strongly with Raetia, it has become clearer to me how much the previous games were missing this. There might be no better way to demonstrate this than to directly compare Leaf's journey to that of Selif in the previous game. Starting out in a small village in Isak with only a handful of rookies and one or two veterans, Selif actually starts out in a weaker position than Leaf when he begins his revolution. And yet, I really have to ask people who played through Fire Emblem 4, at any point, did you actually feel weak? I'm sure that some proper tactics were needed to get through Selif's opening chapters, but just for comparison's sake, really think about how, by the end of the very first mission, you have eliminated the entirety of the Empire's presence in Izak, which might have felt just as epic as Leaf's journey if it didn't break the tension so quickly. Even though Thracia 776 was meant to be a smaller side game, being trapped as a midquel did have a lot of positive results, and I think the way that this game used its story and its gameplay in tandem represented the next logical evolution and storytelling after the previous game's incredible scope. In Genealogy of the Holy War, I most fondly remember the moments of great characterization, as well as how hard-hitting and tragic certain moments were. Even though I was crushed when certain characters I liked met their end, I didn't personally feel trapped or tricked when Daddy Arvis played his hand at Belhalla. In comparison, there were moments early in Thracia when, like Leaf, I would look over my current supplies and wonder, how can I even go on? It was moments of hopelessness like this, supplanted by the feeling of somehow attaining victory through incredible odds, that best encapsulates the experience of Thracia's story. So, yes, in order to best experience this adventure, you have to play it. There's only so much that you can get out of a story synopsis. However, I know that when I mention that, some viewers are likely feeling a bit apprehensive. After all, there really is no hiding the fact that this game can be utterly brutal but it is its willingness to be so uncompromising that can make its story resonate so strongly. In order to better understand this game as a whole outside of this, we're going to have to get into detail on all of the new systems which it offered. And so without further ado, let's do just that. In practice, Thracia 776 plays out less as a sequel to Genealogy of the Holy War and more as a sequel to Mystery of the Emblem. Taking pretty much only the skills and weapon triangle system of Fire Emblem 4, almost everything else has been cut. Large, continuous maps are out, pawn shops are out, unit marriage, individual wallets, deathless arenas, the My Castle system, and much, much more. For all intents and purposes, the gameplay has been returned back to the style of Fire Emblem 3. But somehow the team at Intelligent Systems found a way to fit even more in. One of the biggest changes right off the bat is the addition of a brand new stat, which is sometimes translated as build, but I much prefer the term Project Exile uses, Constitution. This new stat represents the physical bulk of each unit. This basically means that a big and bulky axe fighter is going to have a higher constitution than a lean and agile Myrmidon, even though they're both units that focus on dealing damage. The benefits of a high constitution allows for units who are usually far slower than their counterparts to still keep up, as constitution subtracts from the weight of weapons when determining attack speed. In a nutshell, this really helps units that are locked to heavier weapon types, like axes, now remain viable throughout the entire adventure. I absolutely love the balancing potential this adds, but already this early into talking about the gameplay here, do we have a great example of why so many players look at this game and immediately determine that Thracia is just going to be too complex for them. After all, on top of keeping track of your unit's speed and weapon weight versus your enemies when initiating combat, you'll also need to factor in how your 
its constitution affects their speed based on their weapon's weight. When broken down like this, it does seem excessive. But in what is about to become a strong theme of this video, a lot of what gets brought up about Thracia is actually only about half the picture. The truth is, you don't need to stop and figure any of this out, because the game includes your calculated attack speed in the stat readout when you're going to attack. This is all you really need to look at. Other than its combat functionality, Constitution is also the main stat associated with the brand new capture and rescue system. In any situation where this stat is higher than your enemies, on top of being able to attack, you can also attempt a capture. What this means is that your unit will attack the enemy like before, but will do so with half the attack strength. In some cases, this can mean that your attack is now too low to do any damage to an enemy's defense, but if it isn't, and you manage to reduce your foe's HP to zero during your capture attempt, the enemy will then be attached to your unit and is basically now your prisoner. On subsequent turns, your unit can still move around, albeit with a movement penalty, and can quote unquote trade with their captured unit, freely moving any of their items into their own inventory. This is actually the main way to get a consistent supply of decent, if not extremely powerful weapons and items in this game. Even late into the game, most shops only carry basic gear, whereas each unsuspecting enemy with a low enough constitution is a literal bounty of slightly worn, but quote unquote free equipment. Times were desperate, Leaf might say. Although successfully pulling off a capture can be hard to do, bringing along units capable of pulling them off is always something that you're going to want to think about when entering a new mission. It's always painful when you have to kill off a unit that you'd rather capture, and watching their precious items disappear while your own storage becomes increasingly more grim is quite the unique feeling of dread. About the only thing that comes close to this is when an enemy is able to do all of this back to you. And if you're not able to capture the enemy who captured them, all of their items will be forfeit. Protecting your own units from capture in order to safeguard their items as well as their lives is yet another complication that this system introduces. But the reverse version of this brings in what I'd call one of the best inclusions in the series thus far, rescuing. As long as your unit has a higher constitution than their target, you can pick up your own units without a fight, something which makes mounted units who gain a large bonus to the constitution through their mount sometimes even more important to bring along for transportation instead of their actual fighting capabilities. There are many ways to use the rescuing system, with some of my favorites being to make a bold move with a unit before having a mounted unit rush out, rescue them, and bring them right back to safety. Flying mounts can do this as well, which allows you to move your footlocked units over walls or or impassable terrain, opening up a wide swath of possibilities, including luring enemies into dead ends only to evade them with a quick rescue, as well as clearing the skies from danger in order to make precision strikes, which can help you get to objectives incredibly quickly. All in all, Constitution adds a lot into this game, both in balancing classes as well as giving you a lot more chances for strategy. Of the two new actions, rescuing seems like an obvious addition, especially with the map-wide movement problems of the previous game. While the addition of Constitution represents a huge shift in the Fire Emblem formula, there are a whole host of other additions that I haven't even so much as mentioned yet. And to be honest, with this batch, some are definitely better than others. In addition to standard castle capture objectives, a new mission type, which has Leaf trying to escape from battle instead of seizing an objective, has been added here. In these missions, you will need to move all of your units to certain extraction points, which are usually on the other end of the map, and must then have all of your units select escape one by one. Leaf has to be the last one to escape, or else your units are captured by the enemy in these missions, which in theory should mean that these would be used to make it feel like you're holding an escape point until the last possible moment, but unfortunately in many of these cases, an escape escape point is just used in lieu of a castle or a throne seizing objective. When escape is unnecessary, it really makes these missions drag. Instead of just finishing the battle when you're ready, you instead must make sure that every unit, regardless of mobility, gets to the same single location. This can really add up to a lot of wasted time, while you try to get everyone onto the other side of a likely very completely cleared map. The slow process of moving everyone to the same point and watching their repeated escape lines play out each and every time really does not help this. I do I appreciate the attempt to mix things up, and in any of these where the priority is holding the point for others before you make your daring escape, this mission type works really well. It's just a shame that its introduction is mostly clumsy. On the more successful side, a second new mission type, Defense Missions, have also been added. These are pretty simple to explain because they only have one objective, survive for a certain number of turns, usually around 10 to 15. These maps will require you to plan out the best places for your defense, and usually seem to want you to execute elaborate formations 
missions to either run out the enemy's time or to break their waves into smaller parts. Which brings me back to some of my favorite missions from Fire Emblem Gaiden of all things. Also new to Thracia is the addition of multiple paths through the story. There are many special Gaiden chapters, which are accessed through completing certain conditions in a few of the missions. If you manage to do it, you will generally proceed to an extra battle, which holds some of the best units and items to be found in the game. As an example, the only dancer in this entire game can be obtained by promoting one of your units in a special way on one of these Gaiden maps. And although dancers no longer refresh all four units surrounding them, something which removes the excessively powerful buff from genealogy, even a dancer that can only refresh one target is still incredibly useful, and it's not something that I think any player would want to pass up. Also constrained to a Gaiden map is the Detention Center, a special map near the end of the game that allows you to free any units that may have been captured and taken away by the enemy at any point in your adventure, something which was a godsend for me due to one mission that I simply could not get through without suffering a capture. And so I overcame this by simply unequipping those units, escaping with Leaf in the first couple of turns, letting the enemy capture them, and then rescuing them much, much later. I'm sure they were fine. In many of these Gaiden missions, as well as a small number of the required missions, players will contend with the Fog of War mechanic, something which has the entire map covered in darkness or fog, with your units only having a small range of vision around them. Visibility can be boosted through the usage of consumable torches or certain spells, but all of these are temporary and still require the player to be constantly on guard while proceeding through them. Even with plenty of light on hand, these missions can be some of the most harrowing, if not downright stressful, battles in the whole game. They are also quite the mixed bag, to be honest. Fighting through a forest in the dead of night, fending off raiders as you attempt to understand the geography around you, is what I'd call fantastic implementation. On the other hand, any section of these Fog of War maps which require you to deal with long-range spellcasters who can hit you from entirely outside of a torch user's range are really not so great. In fact, they're the only thing in this game that I would truly call unfair. There is absolutely no way to be ready for an enemy that you can't see sleeping one of your units from across the map. No way other than having learned about it first from a guide or through frustrating trial and error of a previous attempt. So yeah, considering all the new steps that this game took in order to differentiate itself, I definitely wouldn't call this a perfect start. But regardless, I do think it is refreshing to see this series going outside of its comfort zone. There's maybe no better example of this than the somewhat bizarre fatigue system. Similar to Constitution, fatigue is a new stat that can be seen in every unit's stat sheet. Whenever one of your units takes an action on a map, such as attacking or using a staff, their fatigue will go up slightly. As fatigue continues to build up, nothing about the character will actually change. However, if a unit's fatigue is higher than their maximum health after after finishing a mission, then they will not be able to join you in the next mission as they need to rest. Fatigue can only be reset by having a unit sit out of a mission, or by having them use the very, very limited stamina drink item in your preparation screen, which I have to say is something that you should only save for emergencies. Sometimes, even going very late in the game, you're going to need a very specific unit to do something important in an upcoming mission, and so you absolutely need to be stingy with your stamina drinks. If you don't 100% need it, do not use it. To be honest, when I first heard about the fatigue system, it was something that made me feel really nervous about starting up this game. However, I soon learned in practice, it never really becomes too big of a deal. I would say that I even started to forget about it by the end. With so many Gaiden chapters on hand, it really wasn't that big a deal for me to have a couple units sit out from time to time. Most of them are staggered, you're not going to lose all of your best units at once, unless you're doing something like recklessly grinding an arena without bothering to check your fatigue. Even with some of this frustrating or overly complex design, I have to say right now that I don't think anything mentioned in this chapter should be deal breakers for anyone. I'm gonna say this as clearly as I can. All of these challenges are meant to be overcome. And through learning about how the systems of this game work through videos like this, you're actually already ready for them. Keep in mind, I had never played a Fire Emblem game until only a few months ago. And yet, here I am now giving my take on what is considered to be the hardest game in the franchise. It's not because I am some tactical genius, and it's not because I have the patience of a god. All I did was bother to learn this game's systems. Also, and this is a very big one, Thracia776 puts more power in your fingertips than any game I've touched thus far in the series.
For as infamously difficult as this game is often presented as being, after completing it and looking back on the whole experience, I was surprised by how far it went out of its way to tip the balance of power in your favor. Whether it was for the introduction of multiple unique weapons for far more than just the celebrities of your cast, as well as random features like frequent bonus turns given at random, or this game's unique system of movement stat level ups, there is a lot of power creep here that goes unmentioned, likely because this game was actually played by so few people. Let me be clear here, I'm not saying that the game isn't tough, and I'm not saying that just any player should jump right into it. This definitely should not be the first Fire Emblem game for anyone. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be the last. Don't forget that this was only the fifth game released in this near 30 year old series. And if we take Gaiden and Genealogy out for the differences, you can also view this game more as the third in its style. From my experience reading all your comments, as soon as Thracia's difficulty comes up in discussion, you can bet that very soon, the one or two facts that people seem to know about this game are going to come up. Mainly for the purpose of dismissing it out of hand as too cruel or unfair. The big one I always see is is usually phrased like this. Did you know that healing staves can dot 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 miss? And it's true, they can, and it is something that can happen to both you and the enemy. I would ask these people, did you know that weapon and staff skills dot 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 level up with use? That's something that almost always gets left out. Units are no longer locked to whatever weapon skill levels that they start out with. Even units that are usually locked to weak weapons, like thieves, can over time build that C sword level into an A, giving them access to a larger range of very powerful weapons, which in their case can become ridiculous due to their speed. A level 1 cleric might miss a few times, sure. However, keep in mind, each time that they try to heal, their weapon skill is improving. And as weapon skill goes up, misses become rarer and rarer and rarer. By the time they actually hit level B, I imagine staffs missing will be something that you rarely think about. And if they manage to hit A, you will probably have already forgotten about this system. So, do I think that a bunch of people who never played this game are all parroting the same outrageous stance? Yes, that's what's happening. Here's another one. In past games, if an enemy had two weapons with different ranges, it didn't matter which one they had equipped. They could attack you back even if you hit them from outside the range of the weapon that they should have had equipped. Your units couldn't do that. They were locked to whatever they had equipped on your opponent's turn. And the ability of many bosses, who usually pack multiple weapons, made certain units just worse for attacking bosses, especially for archers or magic users who tend to rely on attacking outside of a melee unit's counterattack zone. Five games too late, this system was finally taken out. And here, if a boss has a weapon equipped, then they're going to defend themselves with that weapon. It seems simple, and yet only in this game is it implemented. Why don't people talk about that? In the Mystery of the Emblem video, I spoke a bit about the concept of a Jagan, which is a common name for the many pre-promoted units that start out in your army that are characterized by having great early game stats, but terrible stat growth later on. By my count, Thracia776 starts Leaf out with three Jagans, Ival, Dagdar, and Finn, and although each one of them is separated from Leaf in different parts of the story for various amounts of time, if the player is able to re-recruit them, I'm trying to avoid spoilers here by the way, these three do not suffer in the late game at all like the other Jagans of this series do. And the reason for this is actually twofold. First of all, these three units don't really have that poor of a stack growth. Although you definitely want to get your other units available experience and weapon skill growth early on, these three can still more than hold their own by the time your other units units are promoted and exceeding them in ability. Secondly, Thracia776 has an entire system which lets you control stat growth through the use of a new type of held item, the Crusader Scrolls. These items, by being held, encourage certain amounts of bonus stat growth when your unit finally levels up. Each of these are themed after the skills of one Crusader, and some of them may have slightly negative influence on certain stats, but the benefits of multiple scrolls being held at once do stack, which often makes up for any negative influence. After accumulating a good number of these scrolls, they can then be used to ensure near-perfect stat growth every time, something which opens up the possibility of throwing all of your scrolls onto just one unit, sending them to Arena until they are powered up ridiculously, and then having them pass your collection of scrolls to the next unit, and then just repeating the process. Outside of creating your own hyperbolic time chamber of benefits, simply just holding one of these scrolls gives the unit the benefit of being immune to critical hits, something which I never see anyone mention. For as rare as they might seem, 
game, I'm sure that every Fire Emblem player at some point knows the sting of sudden, devastating critical hits, usually followed by a lot of swearing. That's what happens to me, at least. Genealogy of the Holy War did a lot to mitigate this problem by adding a skill which blocked criticals, but given that it was a birthright skill and not on every unit that you had, it left a lot of your units out in the cold and very, very vulnerable to crits. By giving you the power to choose who gets this benefit and allowing it to be traded amongst units just by using up inventory slots, we find yet another way that this game is really working hard to give you that edge. This isn't even the only way that this game opens up these previously gene lock skills. As well as scrolls, you can also find skill manuals out in the world, which are single-use items which can be used to teach any unit a certain skill. Some of these skills are far, far stronger than before, and have been made to be a lot more applicable in many different situations. As a quick example, in genealogy, the skill Wrath had an interesting effect that meant your character would always be able to get a critical hit if their HP was below 50%. This skill is what made things like sending critically damaged units back to the arena purposefully a thing in that game. The reason being that a Wrath unit actually had a better chance of winning at a single HP. However, this was a skill that only really made sense in that game's broken arena. Out in the field, fighting actual enemies, it's very reckless to try to get any real use out of the skill. I mean, you could, but one wrong move and your unit's just gone. I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just unjustifiably risky. In Thracia, Wrath returns, but has been changed significantly. Now, instead, Wrath will turn all of your unit's counterattacks during the enemy's turn into critical attacks. In other words, this is a defensive tool that can be used very aggressively, and your unit doesn't have to be on death's door in order to get the benefit from it. Also, if you give this to any unit that can dodge pretty well, you have just created an entire army killer. As you can see from the clip, I ended up giving this skill to Leaf, and boy oh boy did it pay off. Watching this, I really tend to wonder why Thracia is discussed the way that it is. People often talk about the stabs that dot 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 miss, but they never seem to mention how absurd casters can become later on in this game. Healing units, putting on permanent status effects, teleporting to absolutely anywhere with ease. People will often talk about the amount of reinforcements that this game throws at you, a function which I personally don't really like, but one that works exactly the same as it did in previous games. Unless, of course, they're actually talking about the defensive survival missions, which would be an asinine observation because that's the point. I'm not hiding my assumptions here. Most people don't know much about this game because they haven't played past the first seven chapters. A lot of people are hesitant to start this game due to its reputation and use parroted reasonings to dismiss it as unfair. I don't think that people like this are approaching this game in bad faith or even that they're really doing these things intentionally. I myself used to be an easy mode only kind of gamer. I took the painless paths and I was too timid to try and go outside of my comfort zone. This all changed when a good friend of mine convinced me to start to challenge myself a bit more. And very quickly, I was happy that he did. Many of my favorite games in recent years have had this unfair reputation from the outside. It's definitely true that Thracia is a struggle to get into. But in almost every case, I believe its reputation as the hardest game in the franchise more comes from a lack of understanding of its systems rather than how much it stacks the deck in the enemy's favor. Because it just doesn't. Now we've covered a lot so far in this video, and it might be hard to get a clear picture for how Thracia stacks up. And so, let's at last take a step back and do that right now. When I first finished Thracia 776, I was struck by the thought, that was great. Now, I never want to touch this game again. For sure, seeing the credits roll was definitely a challenge. Some of the stages were a real struggle. Recruiting Xavier, for example, something I mentioned only briefly in the story synopsis. That was one of the most absurd unit recruitment rituals that I have ever experienced. I'm just gonna kill the guy next time I play this game. But here you can see, I did it. And I remember almost every last second of it too. It took me an hour and a half just to recruit him. Looking back on it all now, I really don't remember the feeling of frustration that I had. All I remember is the feeling of accomplishment. That's the thing about hard games. They can definitely be a source of frustration. And after all, nobody likes to struggle. We all want to win. However, when we eventually do, it's actually the games that force us to fight the hardest that give us the most payoff. Looking back now, I really think my reaction of relief of being able to put this game behind me was natural. I was sure with every other mission that the worst was behind me. And I was always wrong. There was always something waiting even harder just beyond. But the thing is, I got through it. And I remember it. 
I remember every last moment of this game. When difficulty is done right, it results in exactly the kind of experience that Thracia specializes in. Not only do I remember each mission in very clear terms, I also even remember which units I used to clear them, or which ones I used to take certain important actions. I remember where I succeeded, and I remember where I failed. If the stakes were lower, winning would mean less. Losing would also mean less. This is a game that can and will kick your ass. But, if you learn to utilize everything that it offers you, then I imagine that you, like myself, will just want more and more. My immediate reaction after finishing it was just that, an off-the-cuff reaction, the momentary feeling of relief after having climbed the mountain. After climbing back down again, I felt like that was enough for me, time to hang up my boots. But then, looking out the window and thinking back on my time climbing it, I feel like I want to do it again, and I'm going to do it better next time. Shozo Kaga's last Fire Emblem game is a masterpiece. It's a testament to why I wanted to approach this series chronologically. I have only played the first five games. From this perspective, the step up in gameplay depth and story cohesion in this entry is staggering. And yet, this is the worst selling game in the franchise. Even without its strange, staggered release strategy, and even if it were released in the West at the time, I really have the feeling that that would still be true. This isn't a game for everyone. I would sooner sit an inexperienced gamer down in front of Bloodborne than I would do so for Thracia. Some Fire Emblem experience really is important. You don't want to be wrapping your head around army formation when the game is already expecting you to be pulling off captures and managing your fatigue. For those watching this video who feel that they already have that kind of knowledge about the series, but have repeatedly put off playing Thracia, I really have to ask, what are you waiting for? I knew absolutely nothing about this series mere months ago, and I've done it. Play it blind, play it with a guide, or play it with a mixture of the two. Personally, I always look up which units are recruitable and how, but I avoid looking at maps or reading strategies unless I have tried, failed, and decided that I need the help. However you decide to approach it, I think that if you have at least one other game in this series under your belt, you should just get in there and go for it already. It's going to be a struggle at times, to be sure, but when you do achieve victory, and I remain confident that you can, you will never forget it. A word of warning though, if you do go out of your comfort zone and do something that you never thought you could do, you will spend the rest of your life looking for that next mountain to climb. I hope that you remember to thank me. At some point or another, all long-running franchises lose their original creators. Sometimes, a series founder chooses to take the backseat, helping to guide the next generation of developers in the transition, while in other cases, internal drama forces people's hands and everything just goes wrong. Whatever the case, how the franchise is handled in moments like these is tremendously important, and that's exactly where we find the Fire Emblem franchise today. Over the past 10 years since the release of the first game, Shozo Kaga had taken a major role in the Fire Emblem series development, serving as a major designer for each and every game thus far, and the director for 4 out of 5. Having left after the previous game was complete, the next game in this series would have to go on to become the first Fire Emblem created without any of his input, and the result would be one of the most controversial entries to date. Fire Emblem Fuin no Ken, commonly translated as The Binding Blade, is a lot more than just the one with Roy. It's actually one of the most significant games in the series' history, and although not every change it made would go on to be appreciated by previous fans, it's possible that the new wave of fans generated by its creative direction may be responsible for the series still going on today. So, what is it that makes Fire Emblem 6 such a contentious entry? When starting this game, I really didn't know what to think about it, but as I got got deeper into it, I soon found out that I was left with far more to say than I ever would have imagined. In order to best understand what this game is, and the myriad of ways that it succeeded and failed, this video will go in depth examining its development history, storytelling, and gameplay, all in an attempt to better define its place in the franchise. It's time that we get started. 
With the departure of Shouzo Kaga, Intelligent Systems had lost a major creative force behind much of the series. Although many team members had distinguished themselves over the past titles, it was Kaga who defined the series' direction, and without his guidance, a bold decision needed to be taken. One which, at the same time, kept things familiar enough to the past entries to allow both the audience and the developers to adjust to this new atmosphere of change. In 1997, in an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto concerning upcoming games for the Nintendo 64 DD, a game simply called Fire Emblem 64 was mentioned as being in development. In September 1998, this game was officially announced under the title Fire Emblem Ankoku no Miko, or Maiden of Darkness. Only one screenshot of this game still exists today, as shortly after a showing at Nintendo Space World 2000, it was quietly cancelled. Although very little is known about Maiden of Darkness, what is known is that when Intelligent Systems started planning out its next entry into their iconic franchise, what existed of this previous game was used as a base to work from. Keeping only the characters of Roy and Carol, the sixth Fire Emblem game carried the Maiden of Darkness subtitle for half of its development time, officially ditching it for its final name, The Binding Blade, in 2001. For this next game, rather than going with a home console like the Nintendo 64, the Game Boy Advance was chosen instead. Moving the series to a portable device had been discussed and then dismissed before in the past. But since this new portable console was actually more powerful than the Super Famicom, the team felt it was finally time to go that route. Despite Intelligent Systems' enthusiasm towards working on this new platform, many struggles had to be overcome, including figuring out how to best optimize their game for the tiny size of the screen, including the low resolution. Solutions to this can be seen in many places, such as the very large sprites used in battle battle and on the world map exposition scenes, which include many zoom-ins to make the map more legible. With the series' first entry on a portable, the team had to think about how it would now be reaching a new audience, including many children. Given the reception of the last game, which still remains as one of the most infamously difficult games to this day, the new director, Toru Narihiro, and his team decided to give a heavy focus on reducing both the difficulty and the storytelling complexity. This was accompanied by a very different direction in the art, with the artwork done by Eiji Kaneda giving the characters a very young, hopeful feeling which was an emotional landscape that was perfectly matched by the return yet again of Yuka Tsujioko as composer. Finally released on March 29th, 2002, The Binding Blade was very positively received, achieving high review scores on the same level of the series' then most popular entry, Mystery of the Emblem, reaching number 4 in sales the week it was released, as well as landing on the top 30 games in sales that year. The Binding Blade was especially praised for managing to successfully transfer its classic SRPG game play to a portable system, with the addition of a new higher difficulty option for those who wanted a tougher experience like the old games. Other than the remake for Mystery of the Emblem, which will come later on, The Binding Blade was the last game that would be released in Japan only. Like the other games before this one, it has received a fantastic fan translation, and I will be using the most recent versions of the translated names for the rest of this video. Although its reception around the time of its release was overwhelmingly positive, more recent talk of this specific entry has only gotten more critical as time has gone on. Perhaps the most repeated criticism has had to do with the game's protagonist Roy, who is often noted for being underpowered compared to prior lords, and also not getting an actual promotion until very, very late in the game. On top of this, players have also expressed frustrations with the low hit rates, with the hit chances of this entry having somewhat of a meme status in the community. These and other topics are something that I will touch on in detail a little bit later. For now though, it's time to actually dive in and explore what this game holds for ourselves. Like all previous retrospective videos, I'm going to do that by giving a clear synopsis of the events of the story, followed by a full story analysis section afterwards. These parts will of course contain full spoilers, but all the gameplay analysis sections which will follow it will be completely spoiler free. If you would like to skip the story synopsis and jump right to my analysis, you can jump to the timecode at the top of the screen now. On the other hand, if you want to skip over all story spoilers and get right to the gameplay discussion, you can use the code on the bottom of the screen. Alright everybody, it's your last chance to move on. 3, 2, 1. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a land known as Alib, man and dragonkind lived together, peacefully coexisting in the bountiful land that they shared. For reasons lost now to time, this peace was shattered in an act of aggression, resulting in the greatest war the continent had ever seen, known today as the Scouring. 
Though little is known about the war today, the results are very clear. Humanity reigns dominant over the land, while the dragons have all but disappeared. A millennium after the end of the war, the land of Alib had been divided into five nations. Etruria, Ilia, Sake, Bern, and the Lycian League. While each region's culture had grown apart, grand-scale war had been generally avoided. This was all until the new king of Bern, Zephiel, suddenly invaded his neighbors Ilya and Sake, conquering them both with brutal efficiency before turning his gaze westward. Within the land of Lycia, a young boy named Roy hurriedly rushed back to his home of Frey, where his father, Eliwood, had requested him to come and lead the defense of their city in anticipation of Bern's attack. Upon Lord Roy's return, he found his father at the mercy of a gang of bandits that had taken advantage of the situation. After first coming to his father's rescue, Roy's group began heading to the town of Arafin to meet up with the rest of the Lycian army. Everything was going along pretty smoothly until they were suddenly approached by a woman named Ellen. A simple lady-in-waiting, Ellen begged Roy to rescue her mistress from a local castle on Burns' side of the border, to which our hero agreed. Upon successfully saving Ellen's mistress, Roy and his company were shocked to find out that it was none other than the Princess of Bern and King Zephiel's sister, Guinevere. Although Roy's company was at first suspicious, Guinevere explained that she was going against her brother's wishes to attempt to meet with the Lycian lords and find a way to end the war without bloodshed. With her entering Roy's care, the two continued their way to Arafin, only to find out that they had been too late. Before their arrival, two of Bern's three mighty wyvern generals had already attacked and decimated the entire Lycian army. Although Roy's group was able to clear out the remaining burned soldiers, they only arrived in time to witness the last moments of the great knight Hector's life. Hector was a personal friend to Eliwood, and the father of Roy's closest friend, Lelina. Before his death, Hector was able to inform Roy of the reason for Burns' recent successes. Somehow, despite their disappearance over the last thousand years, King Zephiel had somehow managed to recruit dragons to his side. Extremely disturbed and shocked by this news, Roy's next destination was Hector's home of Ostia, rushing there in an attempt to fulfill Hector's last request and save his daughter and the rest of the Lycian army. This would not be an easy journey, as along the way, at almost every stop, Roy was continuously hounded by the various lords of Lycia, who were now quickly shifting their loyalty to Burn in an attempt to gain favor with them. Although it was hard going, as Roy pressed on, he was also able to gain many new allies. One of these, a priest named Saul, approached Princess Guinevere to reveal that he had been sent by the church to find out why she had stolen the Fire Emblem out from Burn. In this world, the Fire Emblem is a gem or emblem which works as a key to a shrine that houses the Binding Blade, a mighty sword that is linked with eight other weapons that were used by humanity to defeat the dragons during the Scouring. These weapons were so powerful that when used, they had nearly destroyed the world in the process, and thus all were sealed away at the end of the Scouring by the heroes who had wielded them, all across the land of Alib. Although Guinevere would not reveal her plan at this time, she did cryptically mention that her taking the emblem was in some way part of her plan to end the war. After finally arriving at Ostia, Roy found out that Burn's influence had preceded them, and Lena was being held hostage within. Although the castle was famous for its impregnability, it was Roy who had to prove this wrong, fighting through and defeating both the traitors and their commander, while also freeing his lady friend along the way. With the castle safe for now, Lelina was able to lead Roy to a nearby cave, where within they uncovered the legendary sword Durandal. Although they were not skilled enough to wield this yet, they did note that over time the legendary weapons had weakened, and what were once reality-shattering tools were now just very effective dragon slayers, something which would no doubt come in handy. Although saving both the castle and recovering the Durandal were remarkable achievements, it soon looked like their luck had run out. Glancing outside, Roy and his group discovered that the soldiers of Burn had completely surrounded the castle and were preparing to overwhelm them. Although Roy and his group expected to make their very last stand against these overwhelming odds, help suddenly came from an unexpected place. The generals Percival and Cecilia of Lycia's western neighbor Etruria suddenly arrived with many knights in tow, announcing their intent to support the Lycian lords against Burns' invasion. Knowing that Etruria entering the fight at this stage would counter their king's plan, Burns' wyvern general Narcian was forced to cease his hostilities, and quite suddenly, a ceasefire had 
had been called. With the unexpected end of this continental conflict, Guinevere left Roy's company to go and stay at the Etrurian capital, while our hero Roy and his friends marched back to Foray. Six months of an unsteady truce had passed before Roy was called out to combat again, but this time it was at the behest of Etruria. Roy and the Lycian army were asked to eliminate a growing bandit threat in the Western Isles, while Etruria held burn to its ceasefire to the east. Knowing that Lycia had a tremendous debt to its neighbor, Roy acquiesced to this slightly odd request and immediately headed out to the Isles. Once arriving, Roy soon found that though the bandit threat was indeed very real, Many of the bandits seemed aware that he was coming, and had already prepared for him. On top of this, Roy and his companions quickly noticed that the Etrurian forces seemed to be ignoring the bandits altogether, instead focusing entirely on a small resistance group that was stationed on the islands. Unsure of what this all meant, but unable to witness injustice in any form, Roy intervened in the fighting between Etruria and the resistance group, meeting with both Lalum, a high-ranking member of the resistance, and their leader, the bard Elfin. After speaking with them, at last Last, the truth of this whole endeavor was revealed. Two powerful nobles of Etruria had conspired with Byrne to send Roy and the Lycian army to the Isles in order to leave Lycia defenseless. Upon finding out that he had been led into a trap, Roy had to suddenly choose between abandoning the people of the Isles to rush back and defend his home, or to stay on the islands and finish eliminating the bandits. As much as he was worried about his father and friends, Roy knew that if he left, the people living on the Isles and Etruria would be doomed to a terrible fate, and so he chose to stay. It was this action that proved Roy's righteousness to the Resistance, and soon the two groups teamed up and liberated the islands from the bandit threat, retrieving the legendary axe Armads along the way. Soon afterwards, the group moved on to the Etrurian mainland to try and stop the traitor's threat. Unfortunately, it was soon revealed that the coup had already happened, and the king of Etruria Mordred had been ousted while those loyal to him were scattered. Byrne was able to march freely into Etruria, with King Zephiel himself arriving at the capital, cutting through its defenders with remarkable skill, and finally finding his traitorous sister. After warning her that treason would not go unpunished again, Guinevere was seized by the Knights of Byrne. But upon seeing her former protector Milady, the Wyvern Knight offered to help her escape again if she so desired. Without looking back, Guinevere and Milady left Byrne behind, returning back to the protection of Roy and his Lycian army, who were already nearing the capital in their march through Etruria. After liberating the nearby castle, Roy was surprised to find the critically injured General Cecilia completely healed up since her battle with Zephiel. It turns out that a mysterious girl who was also in the dungeons named Sophia had saved her life, and this young girl explained that her home, a mysterious desert town named Arcadia, was currently under attack by Byrne. On top of this, she then dropped another bombshell. Arcadia was not just a normal town. In fact, it was the secret home to a clan of dragons who lived peacefully with the humans there, just as had been done before the time of the scouring. Hoping that the dragons of Arcadia might know something about how Byrne obtained its own war dragons, Roy's group passed through a famously frustrating desert before arriving in the town. Although they unfortunately were not able to learn anything new, in a shrine beneath the town they were able to obtain the legendary elemental tome for Blaze. When taking their leave of the desert town, Roy Roy and his group did not get very far before learning that a young dragon named Faye had actually followed them out, but had unfortunately been captured by burned soldiers and was being kept in a nearby castle. After rescuing her and obtaining the services of yet another one of Retoria's generals, the mighty Percival who had come to their rescue before, Narcian was finally struck down, avenging the death of Lelina's father Hector and proving that Roy and his army were fully ready to take on even some of the mightiest soldiers of Burn. With their victory here, Etruria was reborn, with King Mordred returned to his former seat. However, the king understood that in the wake of this civil conflict, his country was only a shell of its former self. He no longer had the strength to match Byrne as he once did, but by joining his army with Roy, there was a chance that this new young hero could lead the continent back to peace. As the two nations joined forces officially, Roy's group was now renamed the Etrurian Army, and it was finally time to strike back at Byrne from within their own territory. Obtaining the legendary Light Tome Aureola before leaving, Roy decided it would be best to strike Byrne from the north and to do so, they would have to first liberate either the countries of Ilya or Sake. Whichever route was taken, Roy and his allies were successful, and also managed to obtain the legendary spear Maltet from Ilya, and the legendary bow Mulligir from Sake. 
crossing the border into Bern, at long last, Guinevere was finally able to activate her plan. And so she soon guided the group to the Shrine of Seals, the resting place of the Binding Blade. To counter this, Burn threw absolutely everything it had at the heroes, but nothing at all was able to stop them. Cutting down two of the three current Wyvern generals in a single battle, Burn's forces were finally exhausted, and Roy was able to freely enter the Shrine of Seals. Within the shrine, Roy's group located the Dark Tome Apocalypse, and then entered further to the resting place of the Binding Blade. Utilizing the Fire Emblem which Guinevere had smuggled out of her homeland all the way back when this had started, the seal on the Binding Blade was lifted, and Roy obtained the sword which, a thousand years prior, had ended the scouring in a single strike. Now, only King Zephiel, as well as the mysterious source of his dragons, remained. Cutting through the last of his forces, Roy at last came face to face with the king, until at last he was finally slain. Despite this feeling like the end of the war, Roy knew that he still needed to discover the source of Burn's dragons, but was unsure of how to proceed. The unexpected answer came when Zephiel's sword, Exox, was brought in close proximity with the other seven legendary weapons, causing a resonating event that showed Roy's group the way to a secret dragon shrine hidden within Burn. After cutting through the final pocket of Burn's remaining army, Roy and his group entered the shrine and were shocked to find not only hundreds of war dragons, but one still living original dragon. This dragon was named John, and he had been residing at the shrine ever since the end of the scouring 1,000 years prior. Desiring to test Roy's will, all of the war dragons suddenly began to pursue the group, and as Roy and his team continued to fight through the temple, finally the motive for this bloody conflict was revealed. After the king's father had tried to assassinate him, Zephiel convinced himself that humans were not worthy of ruling the world, and instead desired to create a new world without humanity so that the dragons could rule instead. In order to do this, Zephiel awakened the demon dragon which had been sealed within Burn a creature that was capable of making endless numbers of mindless war dragons. This creature, known as a Dun, had already been sent away before Roy's arrival to continue Zephiel's plan to eliminate humanity with or without the king. Idun was, in fact, not some new kind of demon dragon as she was called. Instead, she was originally a member of the Divine Dragon tribe, the same kind of dragon as Fae. Although the Divine Dragons remained neutral during the human dragon conflict, Idun had been captured by a pro war sect of dragons who had her soul removed in order to turn her into a being that could only follow commands. In reality, Edun was a victim herself, and the scouring had only ended when the previous wielder of the Binding Blade took pity on her, and in his final strike chose to only seal her away rather than kill her. In one final test, Jean engaged with Roy himself, but after being defeated, the Master Lord Roy finally entered Edun's chamber. Here, the corrupted divine dragon engaged in direct combat with him. But though this war could have ended the same way as before, Roy instead decided to use the Binding Blade to create a different ending. Rather than just sealing away or killing her, Roy chose to give her a new life, with the Binding Blade reacting to his powerful will to do so. Striking down the dragon, she returned back to her simple human form, with the conditioning from her commands by Zephiel finally broken. Upon fleeing the dragon shrine which crumbled around them, peace at last had returned to the continent. In Burn, Guinevere was made the new queen, while Roy returned home to help his father lead Lycia. Although still mostly mindless, Idun, who had been a victim for over the last 1,000 years, was finally given a life again within Arcadia, overseen by the residents there and the ever-cheerful Fae. Roy always believed that there was a way for everybody to find satisfaction, no matter how unlikely it looked or how damaged they had previously been. It turns out, he had been correct. Before going over how I felt about this story, I just want to state where I'm coming from first. I, like many other fans of this series I imagine, had my first introduction to the Fire Emblem franchise through the many characters which were included in the Super Smash Bros. series. I was in middle school when I first played as Roy in Melee, and for many years after I always wondered what the story behind him was. When I first began to try and compartmentalize my feelings about the story for the script, I wanted to be very aware of my biases. Roy seems so flashy and cool in Smash, but every character is built to come across as very exuberant and flashy in that. Jumping over to Fire Emblem 6, he's just a skinny teenager and is a particularly weak lord by comparison. This is something that can be a bit deflating. 
On top of this, Roy is just a very simple character, with as basic a personality as Marth in the very first game of the series. It's really not hard to just sit here and say he's kind of milquetoast and boring, and neither is that a very compelling take. Instead, I would like to examine why. Despite the sheer amount of things that happen in this game, this is a story that is about as straightforward a tale as they come. But that's because it was specifically designed to be like that, literally. Roy is an unstoppable, morally righteous crusader who never loses. If you're trying to write a simple protagonist to your new portable RPG franchise, it's actually a good idea to make him so bland and perfect. Even if I prefer more nuanced and flawed characters, I understand the decision making here and I can put up with it. If only the rest of the major characters and scenarios were this consistent. Zephiel in many ways is meant to be a mirror to Roy. Where Roy was trusted by his father implicitly, Zephiel was hated and even nearly killed by him. Both our hero and villain are willing to take drastic steps to make their visions of the world a reality, and both also believe that they are the ones liberating the world. The backstory surrounding Zephiel is revealed slowly by his sister, and for some strange reason, he's actually presented as kind of sympathetic. It's totally ridiculous that he wants to kill every human in the world just because his daddy was an asshole, but Guinevere is a bit defensive of him when he's brought up by Roy, so much so that it makes me think that this was meant to be going somewhere. It wasn't. Zephiel is the bad guy of the story. All of his development ends up being pretty pointless. He wasn't going to change, or see reason, or even give an alternate way of thinking a chance. He's the bad guy because Roy is the good guy, and any hint of depth that is given through learning his backstory is never reflected in any of the actual interactions with him. I'm not even sure why they wrote all of these scenes. The problem with Zephiel here is indicative of Fire Emblem Six's tendency to start building up plot points but never actually pay them off. When we first meet Guinevere, she seems like a critical ally. After all, she's surrounded by ridiculously loyal followers. She stole the Fire Emblem itself from her homeland, and she seems to be alluding to some master plan that she's working towards, which will end the war without further bloodshed. In reality, she doesn't actually have a plan. She finds Roy, and from that moment on, it's non-stop bloodshed. The only person that he basically doesn't kill is Adun. Guinevere's recapture in the middle of the story might be the worst anticlimax of the game. At the start of the mission where this happens, Cecilia is defeated and Guinevere is met by Zephiel. Here we get an incredibly rare face-to-face -face conversation between the two, which I believe was going to lead to further discussions, perhaps revealing more about their relationship before the war, or even better, proving early on that Zephiel was a hopeless case in order to set him up as the clear, hateable villain for the last part of the game. This could have led to a lot of interesting scenarios, but instead, only a few turns of the same mission later, Guinevere is delivered right back to Roy's hands. It turns out Guinevere's recapture wasn't the important part of this scenario. The actual point of this is so Cecilia would be injured and then healed by a random stranger. That leads to Roy getting to meet Sophia, which leads him to going to the Dragon City. There's nothing learned of the Dragon City, which leads him to the real point, obtaining the legendary weapon here. The structure of this story is built so much like a MacGuffin hunt that it makes me wonder why it wasn't themed as such. As much as the game tries to make it seem like Roy is heading to different places to stop Burn from doing this or that, the real reason for his trek across Alib is to get his hands on all these magical weapons. This is so important, in fact, that the entire true ending of this game is built around meticulously collecting all of them. If you weren't aware, all of the content from mission 23 to 25 is only seen if the player has managed to retrieve all of the legendary weapons in their playthrough. If you miss even a single one of them, then you're not going through the epilogue. This means that everything that's revealed near the end, including the truth behind the scouring and a Dunn's backstory, as well as the actual ending of the game, is completely missable in this 30 to 40 hour long RPG. In most games, getting the bad ending usually just means you need to go back and play a section near the end again. But considering that these side quest missions which get you the legendary weapons are scattered pretty evenly throughout the game, starting from mission 8 even, there's no such luck here. The final disappointment of all of this is that the epilogue actually contains some of the best story content of the game. It also leads to some really great missions. In in particular, the Dragon Shrine mission, where we learn the truth about the Scouring while having to fight off more dragons than we ever had before. The best way to do this is to use all of those legendary weapons you've been accumulating, and this is a proper payoff to all that buildup. Even though the game ends with a panderingly easy final boss, it's not really a big deal, simply by how successfully Idun's true nature was revealed. It was actually refreshing to see a Fire Emblem game end on a very gentle note for once. Here, it's not just about killing the bad dragon or evil priest, it's about giving 
bring autonomy back to a misunderstood and objectified tool of war. Idun isn't just a sympathetic character, she's an actual proper example of using the symbol character outline as a starting point before going somewhere surprising and interesting with them. Even with its silver linings, the Binding Blade is a clumsy attempt at creating an easily digestible narrative. Even though this definitely is a huge step backwards for the series storytelling, I hope that I've made it clear by now that it isn't because this plot isn't complex or serious enough. There are glaring flaws in its plotting, to the point where I would call it one of the weakest stories in the series thus far, with every other game besides the original presenting itself much better. I am holding out hope that this is merely a fumbling first attempt by a newly adjusting team, rather than a sign of things to come. But I suppose I'll have to find that out for myself in the later videos. For now though, it's time that we finally start analyzing the gameplay changes which were introduced here, and to see if the new overall direction was handled more adeptly than the story. From the moment I started up The Binding Blade and first experienced its changes to the series gameplay, I immediately knew what the theme of this chapter was going to be. For the first time ever in the franchise, Intelligent Systems has placed more of an emphasis on removing systems over adding them. The sheer number of features that have been sliced off is truly staggering. With the majority of the new introductions in the previous game, the infamous Thracia 776, suffering the most of their attention. Some of the features which have been cut include capturing other units, escape and survival mission types, stabs having a chance to miss, dismounting, unit fatigue, leadership bonuses, character skills, stat growth scrolls, and much more. The gameplay is now about as simple as it once was in the Famicom days, and there really is not much new to take its place. This is the most minimalist sequel I have ever seen, and so when it comes to finding something new to say, all I can really comment on are the refinements to the systems that they actually did keep, as well as the small number of completely new additions. Trust me, there is still a lot to say here. Let's start out with what was cut or modified. Building on the introduction of the Holy Blood weapons from Genealogy and the many character-specific weapons of Thracia, the legendary weapons of the Binding Blade democratized this special weapon system in a wonderful way. While Fire Emblem 4 gave these only to characters who had the Holy Blood, which was an extra boon to those units which already gain dramatically increased stat growth, Fire Emblem 6 makes the only requirement for using its legendary weapons an S rank in the correct weapon skill. Not only is this fairer, limiting these late game weapons specifically to the late game, but it also gives you a lot more flexibility in deciding who you want to include in your party, since any unit of your army could eventually build up enough skill to the point of using one of them. And if you have multiple master class units, you can even have them trade these weapons around, giving you even more tactical potential. There is a bad side to the implementation of these weapons, which absolutely must be said, and not to echo too much of some of my points from the previous story analysis section, the fact that the meticulous collection and protection of these weapons is necessary for all players to access the true end of this game also has a knock-on effect on the gameplay. Even with units who have the skills to wield them, you still need to hold yourself back from using them until basically the last three missions of the game. Due to their tremendous power, it's entirely possible to accidentally break them, especially while defending. If you accidentally break one or lose one to a character death, you are going to miss out on both the end of the story and some of the best missions in the game. Although the implementation of the legendary weapons is decidedly mixed, many of its other changes veer more towards being unquestionably positive. For example, Fire Emblem 6 has finally perfected the Kanto system, powering it down into a version that I'd call the best possible outcome. Starting with this game, if a mounted unit moves and takes a non-combat action, such as trading with an ally or visiting a town, they can continue to use their remaining movement to reposition themselves. However, if they attack in any form instead, their extra movement spaces cannot be used. This effectively allows mounted units to continue to be used as couriers, transporters, or task managers, while removing the unbalanced logistics of their offense or defensive capabilities. As far as I'm concerned, this could not have been handled any better. In another update, Fog of War missions have returned, but have been made a bit fairer by fully revealing the map to you, rather than shrouding it all in darkness. These missions continue to keep their tension, but they also remove the frustration of having no idea of where you're actually going, or constantly getting locked into unfavorable terrain. Although capturing as a mechanic was taken out, the 
constitution stat has stayed, which mainly comes into play here with the rescuing system, which has been further improved since Thracia. Although it works much like it did before, there is a notable difference in that a unit who is carrying someone no longer takes a penalty to their movement. Instead, they just have a heavy hit to their speed and skill stats. This means that many others beside mounted units can effectively pick up and move your units around, as well as making it more feasible of a task to reduce the total surface area of your army so that you can more quickly pass through narrow sections of a map like choke points. Last but definitely not least, one tiny change which makes a big difference is the introduction of a proper deployment mechanic. What this means is that now once you've deployed your units, before the battle begins you can actually swap their starting locations, something that is a godsend for maps that start out your army in multiple small groups. This feature seems almost too obvious to really warrant mention, but after the lack of this feature gave me some truly massive headaches in the previous five games, I have to say it's very, very long overdue. Thankfully, although Fire Emblem 6 does cut out a whole lot, this is not another Gaiden situation, where the developers remove previously half-baked mechanics in order to put new half-baked mechanics in its place. Instead, these are very purposeful cuts that allow the extreme polish on the core mechanics to really shine, going right down to the new buttery smooth animations which are just glorious to behold. In many ways, Fire Emblem has never felt so great to play. And after the extreme complexity of the prior entries, there really is something refreshing about this direction. These updates are definitely some of the best developments thus far, but underneath this glistening surface, there are definitely some systems which are a lot more rotten to the core. And that is what we must get into next. <laughs> Up until The Binding Blade, the Fire Emblem series is what I would call a bastion of good old-fashioned, honest game mechanics. Without even going through testing, if you understood the information that the game was giving you, you could mathematically figure out the probable results of any combat encounter before making anything actually play out. As much as players tend to complain about numbers after some strings of bad luck, thanks to the game being actually very direct with its combat calculations, as much as people complain, it really was just bad luck. This means that if the game said you had an 80% chance to hit and you missed, you really did just get that 1 in 5 chance of a miss. The system used to enact the hit probability in the first 5 Fire Emblem games goes by a couple of names, but here I'm going to go with the term Single Roll Random Number Generation, or simply Single Roll RNG. Here's a simple explanation of what that means. Imagine that I have a 10-sided dice. If you have a 90% chance to hit, then I will roll my dice exactly one time to see if your number was anything from a 1 to a 9, which if it was, would result in a hit. If the dice came up as a 10, then you got a miss. Straight up, that is a 1 in 10 chance of a miss, or a 9 in 10 chance of a hit. Exactly 90%. The Binding Blade, however, does not use single roll RNG. Instead, it uses double roll RNG. RNG. In a nutshell, a double roll RNG is done by generating two numbers and then averaging them out. The way that this affects our roll results can get very complicated very quickly. But the point is that despite this system creating very different results, in the Binding Blade they use the old system of measuring hit chance and show that to you, but then use the new mechanics under the hood in a way that completely invalidates what they showed you. There are a lot of great charts out there that can display the disparities between these two systems a lot better than than I can here, but in general, displayed hit chances above 50 actually have a better chance than what is being shown, while hit chances below 50 have a worse chance. For the first time ever, you are being given incorrect information. The reasoning seems to be this. Player units usually have higher hit chances, while enemy units have lower hit chances. So by showing you one number but using double roll behind the scenes, this is a secretive technique that actually lowers the difficulty of the game, and also is likely to make players feel luckier than they actually are. Putting aside the fact that this tactic is kind of distasteful, there are huge knock-on effects of this which really have negative consequences when it comes to the combat balance. There's sort of a meme about the weapon triangle system that many people in the community often repeat. We have swords, spears, and the bad one. Although Axe users were actually pretty glorious in Fire Emblem 5, in most other entries of the series they are very underwhelming, and in some cases are actually left out entirely. 
they were not a unit type that needed any kind of debuff. But due to the new system in Fire Emblem 6, they are hit the hardest by new, even lower hit rates. Unless you're going up against very low speed enemies, it's really not uncommon for Axe units to get a hit chance of 40 or 30, whose true hit number translates to 32% and 18% respectively. The inverse of this means that high speed, non-Axe using units will comparatively almost never miss and also be able to dodge almost every single hit. Things have never been more unbalanced than Fire Emblem 6. In particular, Lilina, Shauna, and Rutger are extremely well known for being god tier dodge tanks, something that you're bound to notice just by raising these characters even without any arena grinding. Despite the Binding Blade bringing on some really spot on fixes for previously overpowered systems, the seemingly thoughtless implementation of this double roll RNG has ended up turning this game's combat into something of a freak show. The fun of it has stopped being the thrill of taking on a respectable challenge through utilizing your own tactics, but more about how thoroughly you can break the system and watch it fall apart. The knock-on effect of this change is so huge that it affects every single player and alters every single combat interaction. If you think I'm coming off as a bit extreme here, let me clarify my perspective. Single roll RNG is just a system for managing chance, the same as a double roll RNG. Both of them are completely valid options to base a hit chance system on. It would be very easy to make double roll work really well simply by altering the numbers behind all of this. The thing that I actually take the biggest issue with is this game pretending that nothing has actually changed. Even without looking under the hood, it's easy to get the sense that these numbers are actually lying to you. And I truly believe that once the player gets a sense that they're actually being lied to, it's going to create a kind of distrust that negatively impacts the overall experience. Looking back now, I actually have a lot more respect for the first five games. Even then, there were some times that I doubted the numbers, but I realize now that it was my own failure then to accept the truth behind good or bad chance. Those moments that I really did get incredible luck are kind of in improved in a way. By comparison, every moment in Fire Emblem 6 feels a little bit tainted. I really don't want to keep piling on here because clearly this is a change that I'm going to have to live with, given that the next six games also use misleading numbers on a double roll RNG system. Maybe it will make more sense in the future and maybe not, but until then, it's time to move on to our one last major topic. <laughs> At long last, The Binding Blade reintroduces the support system first given prominence in Genealogy of the Holy War, but now in a form which should be very familiar to fans of the more recent games. By spending time with other units, typically in the form of ending their turn next to them, your own units will build up hidden affection points for each other. Each unit other than Roy has at least five units with which they can form support relationships. These have three tiers, indicated by letters starting with C, then B, and A. This should be sounding very familiar, because this system, complete with short conversations at each tier, has gone on to become one of the most recognizable aspects of the Fire Emblem franchise. These moments of dialogue add a lot of personality to the cast, even if the conversations themselves are completely unrelated to what is happening in the plot right now. Although not many of these conversations are particularly deep, I do think that these little chats are very charming and do a lot of heavy lifting for turning some of your units from characterless blobs of stats to more fleshed out almost real seeming people. It was fun to learn that some of my units didn't really trust that Roy guy yet, or to find out who in my cast was an overachiever or a secret worrywart. I really did adore these support conversations, and eagerly anticipated finding out what little details each next tier would teach me about my group. The appeal of this system is really obvious, and the sheer amount of conversations available means that very few players will ever experience them all, which partially explains why it's so common to see Fire Emblem players recommending certain pairings to each other. Honestly, this is a great first step, but despite all the praise it deserves as an evolution of the support mechanic, there is plenty to criticize here. To start off, for some reason, the characters with which your units do have support conversations are not told to you whatsoever. Keep in mind that with a total roster of 53, any given unit will have about 45 other characters with which they have nothing to gain. The amount of hidden information and in how this support system even works is a big, big problem. Although you can just look up support guides to see who pairs with who, I personally do not enjoy playing games with a massive spreadsheet that I have to check constantly. 
Even if that doesn't bother you, the glacier-like pace at which these support relationships develop will likely still get on your nerves. So, the way that support growth works in this game is for each turn that two units will end next to each other, a certain amount of hidden support points will be gained by both parties. When this shared number reaches 60, they will be able to have a conversation to start the C tier, with B and A tiers coming at 120 and 200 points respectively. Every unit can have five support conversations total, and this can be from five Cs or one A and one B, or any other combination that comes to five. Different support pairings may start out at different amounts of base points, as well as having differing amounts of support points gained each turn. This is what support growth means. It is in the slow rate of support growth where Binding Blade really drops the ball on this whole system. Let's break down Roy's supports as an example. Keep in mind that the following would only be possible through multiple playthroughs, due to the 5 support conversation cap, but it's still a good way of putting in perspective how ridiculous all of this is. Our boy Roy has 10 different characters with which he can bond with, those being Lilina, Marcus, Walt, Cecilia, Sophia, Sue, Shanna, Lalam, Alan, and Lance. Keeping in mind the requirements for each support level, let's next take a look at his base support points for each of these characters. So, for Lilina, he starts out at 56, which is very high, but for the others, it looks like this. 30, 30, 20, 1, 1, 1, 1, 20, and 20. Note that you can only get a maximum of 120 support points per mission, and there is no notification of how many of these points you have gained since the mission has started, or when you have stopped receiving any support growth. Also, I just have to say that I really take issue with how some of the characters here, who join about halfway through the game, still start out at only one. This is something that genealogy accounted for, but was left ignored here for some reason. Anyways, here are the support point growth rates. Lilina and Roy gain four support points per turn, which is the fastest growth rate in the game. The others, however, break down as plus two, plus two, plus two, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus two, and plus two. I hope that you're still awake because with this information, we can calculate the number of turns it would take in order to go from their starting points to an A level support. For Lilina, it's 36 turns. For Marcus, it's 80 freaking five. Waltz also takes 85 turns, while Cecilia needs 90. Next, we have the ones who all naturally take 199 turns each, while Alan and Lance will each need 90 turns. Totaling all this, it would take 1,272 turns to reach A ranks with all of his supports. Even if we have this number, due to Roy having twice as many support pairings as most others, 636 turns is still an entire Fire Emblem game's worth of turns. Honestly, I can't believe it, but there's actually something even worse hiding behind this issue. Even if you spend spend the nonsensically long amount of time needed to get these support conversations at all, the game literally does not tell you what benefit you get from having these bonds. Even the game's manual, which I bothered to read through in Japanese, does not tell you what supports do, or how this extra detail on each character's stat sheet affects your supported unit's combat performance. Because the game doesn't tell you, I'm going to do that right now. Each unit can get a total of 5 support bonuses, which are activated invisibly on units who share support bonds within three spaces of each other. Each C-level support counts as one bonus, B's for two, and A's for three. So, even a character surrounded by five of their C-support bonded characters would get a pretty good bonus. The benefit that they get depends on their affinity, and although these are themed after seven elements, they could be named A through G for all it actually matters. So, you take the bonus given for both bonded characters and add them together, and that is the benefit that they gain for their combat effectiveness. Even broke down into less than 150 words, this system is ridiculously complicated, which might explain why this entire mechanic is never taught to the player. It's infuriating that this confusion is your reward for going through the ridiculously sluggish support gain system. And although the bonuses that add up can be pretty useful, let me just give you a little pro tip. Do not bother to raise any supports at all, and just play through the game like they don't exist. Use whatever characters you like, and if they gain support levels coincidentally, good for you. But seriously, do not waste your turns or brain space trying to organize this or calculate out what your numerical reward will be. If you're curious about two units' interactions, look it up and read them online. And for your own sake, just leave it at that. It's sad that this kind of support system is something that I could really get into were it handled better. 
There is a tantalizingly wide amount of character detail waiting to be seen, but I can't imagine how all of the effort that must have gone into writing these could have been squandered even worse. The successes and failures of the support system are a good example of what I meant when I said at the start that I came away from this game with more to say than I ever would have imagined. Given its stated design goals, I thought The Binding Blade would be the simple RPG that it was meant to be viewed as, and that this retrospective video would be a short reprieve following the two very discussion-heavy Yggdral videos. Clearly, given this video's length, that was not the case. Discussing the intricate balance of Fire Emblem Six's positives and negatives is no small feat, and I clearly underestimated how much this little portable entry would really be able to shake the series down to its core, as well as how much time it would take me to really break it all down. I'm glad that I took the time to truly look into this, but it's finally time that we put it all in perspective. Fire Emblem The Binding Blade is not a bad game. Unfortunately, it's not a great game either. Even though to me it was more enjoyable than the first three games in the series, ironically, I feel like it's the last game that I would ever want to return to in the future. The world of Alib is a fine new setting, but its well-designed denizens are squandered on very poor scenario writing. There are many updates to the overall experience which are fantastic, but other systems like the support and hit rate changes seem like the worst versions of their later selves. Even though this was the easiest game in the franchise thus far, I find it the most frustrating. I want these characters to flesh themselves out without having to spend thousands of turns smacking them together at the end of maps. I want the great ideas of this story and the world to actually turn into something satisfying. It's frustrating to see a game with so many great ideas keep missing the mark over and over again. Ultimately, what I really want is for The Binding Blade to just be a better Fire Emblem game than it actually is, and that is something that I know I'll never get. To be fair, almost nobody is able to stick the landing on their first try. Many studios have tried and failed, and to Intelligent Systems' credit, The Binding Blade is at least far from a disaster. It took the first couple of attempts for Kaga himself to get everything to mesh just right, and despite my many gripes throughout this video, the brief flashes of brilliance, although far from capitalized on effectively, do at least give me hope and have me eager to find out where things will go from here. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective brings us at last to the first game in the series to finally make the leap into the West. Although just named Fire Emblem Overseas, this prequel set 20 years prior to Roy's adventures would bring us along on the adventures of Roy's father Eliwood, his friend Hector, and a mysterious swordswoman named Lynn. Be sure to join me next time when we take on Fire Emblem 7 The Blazing Blade. What happened to Dorka? The time has come. We're finally here. Seven videos into the Fire Emblem retrospective and 13 years into the actual series lifespan, at long last we have finally reached the first game to actually be released to the West. Following the success of the Intelligent Systems developed Advance Wars games in the Western market, combined with the interest garnered from Marth and Roy's appearance in Super Smash Bros., in 2003 and 4, strategy RPG fans around the world finally got the chance to experience this series for themselves. And the game which they received was Fire Emblem 7 The Blazing Blade. For more than a few reasons, this game will always be a landmark in this series. Even though it was released overseas under the title Fire Emblem, this is an entry which is more inextricably linked to the games that came before it than any other Fire Emblem yet. With a story that serves as a direct prequel to the last game, as well as gameplay systems and visuals which were nearly identical as well, the details that make the Blazing Blade significant can be hard to grasp for the uninitiated. For many viewers of this video, I'm sure that this game was very likely their first Fire Emblem, or at the very least, the first one that they were actually aware of. Even though I was actively gaming on the Game Boy 
Advance when this game came out, I actually have no nostalgia to speak of about it, only my vague memories of seeing it mentioned in gaming magazines at the time. Before the start of this Fire Emblem retrospective, I had never played a game in the series. I arrived here after being six games deep into this video series, having played all of the last games in their release order while remaining blind to what developments would be lying ahead. So it was from this perspective that I first approached this game, and I was very curious to see how it would progress the series after the rather big shakeup of the previous game. All in all, I guess you could say that I was more interested in how this game holds up as a Fire Emblem game first, and not as someone's first Fire Emblem game. In this video, I'm going to be attempting to find the answer to this. To do so, I'm going to be examining this game from top to bottom, looking at its development history, giving a full rundown of the story with my own analysis afterwards, and finish by covering how the seventh Fire Emblem game interpreted or enhanced the underlying gameplay systems here. Let's go ahead and get started. In many ways, the development history going from the Binding Blade to the Blazing Blade is similar to the situation surrounding the transition from Genealogy of the Holy War to Thracia 776. After completing Genealogy, Thracia was planned as a small companion game that would require significantly less development time to create. Unfortunately, under Shozo Kaga, perhaps unsurprisingly, the project soon began to grow out of control, and the game, which was originally meant to only take a year to complete, ended up taking three, actually spending longer in development than Genealogy of the Holy War. The Blazing Blade, like Thracia, was also planned to be a small companion game to follow the previous release, with an original development time actually set at only seven months. Although this ambitious seven-month goal did eventually need to get pushed back, all in all, it only took one year to finish this game, making this an actually successful second attempt at this companion game strategy. Under the producers Toru Narihiro and Takahiro Izushi, who also directed The Binding Blade, the development of Fire Emblem 7 came together very smoothly. Series veteran Yuka Tsujioko returned once more to handle the score, with the character design handled by Eiji Kaneda, Sachiko Wada, and Daisuke Izuka. The youthful, extremely cheery designs of The Binding Blade were toned back a bit here into a direction that matched the new, balanced tone of this project. Rather than trying to change everything up or pare more things down, a large focus this time was placed on cleaning up and improving the systems which had come before. To do so, much of the graphics and animations were reused from The Binding Blade. To the layman not familiar with specific maps in each entry, these two games do look exactly the same. Through the time saved by reusing this content, Intelligent Systems spent a whole lot more time polishing things to an even higher degree than ever before. For the story, multiple profile sprites and computer-generated artworks were able to be created, giving certain scenes extra emphasis, emotion, and personality. Though the gameplay remained mostly the same, a huge number of updates were made to already existing systems, even going down to some of the minutest details of the game. Eventually released on April 25th, 2000 in Japan, November 3rd, 2003 in North America, with Australian and European releases in early 2004, The Blazing Blade received tremendous accolades immediately upon its release in all regions. While sales data in the West is still unavailable, it was called a successful launch abroad by Nintendo of America, securing the future of the Fire Emblem franchise in the wider gaming world. Even though Roy seems to be more well known due to his inclusion in Smash Brothers, it's actually the adventure of his father Elliewood, along with the other lords Hector and Lynn, who are actually most responsible for sticking the landing of the series. Perhaps no other moment in this franchise's lifespan was as significant as this one. Not only did Nintendo taking this chance and having it pay off bring a great game to the Western world, it also opened the gates for many more great games in this series to follow. Before diving into the story of this game, I'd like to give a full spoiler warning. Over the following two chapters of this video, I will be covering the plot in detail and then analyzing it in full. If you already know the story or don't feel like a refresher, go ahead and jump to the timestamp seen at the top of the screen. If you are looking to avoid all story spoilers whatsoever, go ahead and jump to the bottom timecode to get right to the gameplay breakdown. Here's your last chance. We're starting in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
In the land of grass and sky known as Sake, a young tactician awakens in the home of a beautiful tribeswoman named Lin. This young woman, the last of her tribe, had found and cared for the wounded tactician. Yet, as these two became fast friends, they soon found themselves the victim of a sudden bandit attack. Escaping with their lives, these two friends headed for a nearby village for supplies, bumping into two knights of the country of Lycia who claimed to actually be searching for Lin. Soon, our duo were told Told of Lin's last remaining family member, her maternal grandfather who was the Marquis, essentially the ruler, of the city of Kaelin in Lycia. These two knights had been charged with finding and escorting Lin back to her grandfather, and also to protect her from the bandits' continued assaults, who were actually sent by the Marquis's scheming brother, Lundgren. As Lin and the tactician's group set out for Kaelin, they met a young boy named Nils along the way. This young, blue-haired boy pleaded for help, claiming that his sister, the dancer Nina, had been kidnapped and was being held not far from their location. Agreeing to his request, Lin's group were surprised to be met at the end by a young red-haired man carrying the beautiful girl to safety from out of her prison. This man was Elliewood, the son of the current Marquis of Foray, Elbert. Happening to be in the area at the time, he had taken it upon himself to fight through these villains and happily returned the girl to safety. As Lundgren's attempts on Lin's life were getting more and more desperate, she had finally gained an ally of some influence from within Lycia through Elliewood, and soon he pledged to keep both Foray and its allies neutral should Lundgren try to delegitimize Lin's return. With her way to her grandfather clear, Lin at last arrived in Kaelin, finding her new home already taken over by her villainous uncle. Her grandfather had been secluded to his bedroom where he lay on death's door, fading away due to the effects of a poison that he had been repeatedly given by his brother. As the group fought through Lundgren's final defenders, Lin and the tactician were finally able to defeat Lundgren for good and clear the way for the young girl to meet her grandfather face to face. As the rightful Marquis of Kaelin prepared to meet his end, happy that he at least got to set eyes on his last living relative before death, his newly found granddaughter Lin urged him to try and hold on to life for a little bit longer, now that they were finally together. In somewhat of a miracle, he actually did. For Kaelin, its Marquis, and Lin, a new peaceful year began. But in other parts of Lycia, trouble began to brew. Many months after the return of Lin, the Marquis Albert of Foray had disappeared, along with many of his knights. After waiting for as long as he could bear, the heroic Elliewood decided to go out in search of his father, accompanied by his most loyal vassals. Soon after leaving, he was surprised to bump into the same tactician who had served Lin, and together this new group started out by heading towards the neighboring city of Santa Ruz. Not long after Elliewood had begun his journey, his group quickly became outnumbered by numerous bandits, with the nearby soldiers of Santa Ruz doing nothing but watching. It was then that another hero, who happened to be the brother of the current Marquis of Ostia, suddenly rushed out to support his best friend Elliewood. This man, Hector, was a massive axe-wielding lord who was accompanied by his own group of Ostian fighters. After arriving just in time to assist Elliewood, the two friends combined their forces and fought all the way to the gates of Santa Ruz. The Marquis there, Helmen, had been an ally of Foray in the past, but when finally meeting him now, they found that he had been recently mortally wounded shortly before their arrival. With his last breath, Helmen revealed that it was Darren, the Marquis of the city of Laos, who had pushed him to aggressively resist Elliewood and was in some way connected with Lord Elbert's disappearance. Armed with this new information, Elliewood and Hector next fought their way towards Laos. After having his military bested on the field, Lord Darren chooses to abandon everyone, including his own son, fleeing his home before he could be confronted. Shocked and saddened by his own father, father's betrayal, Darren's son Eric revealed more about Elbert's disappearance to Elliewood and Hector, stating that it was members of a mysterious band of assassins named the Black Fang who had approached Lord Darren and Lord Hellman and had plotted with them to try to take over all of Lycia. Having also been approached, Elliewood's father had been making a trip to Laos to try and dissuade Darren from trusting the assassins group all shortly before disappearing himself. Although Darren had escaped, news suddenly came to our heroes revealing where he had gone. Lin's home of Kaelin had suddenly been assaulted by the man, and it was to this destination which Elliewood's group immediately departed for. After successfully defeating Darren's troops again, and then liberating the castle alongside Lin's defenders, unsurprisingly, the Marquis of Laos fled again. With Lin now in Elliewood's debt, she, along with her own loyal followers, joined up 
up with the group, forming a powerful alliance of these three young lords, which then immediately set out for the Black Fang's base on the island of Valor. After enlisting the aid of friendly pirates in order to set sail, while defending themselves on the waters, the group discovered a person floating in the water towards them. After pulling the newly amnesiac Ninian out of the water, Elliewood and the group endeavored to protect and reunite her with her brother, just before finally landing on the island and beginning to fight their way through the Black Fang's defenders. Although they did do their best to protect her, a powerful member of the Black Fang was able to warp himself and Ninian out of the group's protection, saying that the girl was needed for their master's ritual. With even more reason to hurry, Elliewood and his friends finally caught up with the villainous Lord Darren and defeated him for good. With no defenders left, they freely entered the Black Fang's inner sanctum. In this mysterious room, Elliewood and his group were able to find both his father and Ninian, although both had been weakened severely. After recognizing his son, Lord Elbert pleaded for Elliewood to take Ninian away and leave him behind, just before the mysterious leader of the Black Fang appeared. This man was the extremely powerful dark sorcerer named Nurgle. Starting his ritual, Nurgle seemed to use an unseen magic on Elbert, draining him of his life before forcing Ninian to activate the artifact at the end of the room. A mysterious border between worlds which was called the Dragon's Gate. Long ago in the world of Alib, a war between dragons and humanity, known as the Scouring, had raged on, but had ended in the defeat and banishment of the dragons. Ninian was the key to reopening this gateway and allowing the dragons to return to the now undefendable world. Under Nurgle's control, she unwillingly began to open it, an act that the group knew would soon spell the end of all humans on Alib. It was only due to the the reappearance of Nils that a catastrophe was avoided, as his words and love for his sister were able to break the mind control of Nurgle, causing his magical ritual to fail in a massive magical explosion. After awakening from this blast, the group found Nurgle still alive and well. But just before he could attempt the ritual again, Lord Elbert, who was still clinging to life, suddenly charged at the sorcerer and stabbed him critically through the back. Needing to retreat after this near-fatal wound, Nurgle disappeared, just as Elbert finally succumbed to his own wounds, warning his son that this was far from enough to defeat the Dark Sorcerer. With the death of Lord Elbert and the retreat of Nurgle, our heroes finally started on their way back home, with Elliewood silently holding his father's lifeless hand the entire way. After landing back on the mainland, the siblings Nils and Ninian, who had recovered her memory, explained to the group what was actually going on. Apart from being a very skilled magic user, Nurgle had the magical ability to steal something which was called Quintessence. This was best described as an energy which was essentially one's own life force. Channeling this power with his magical gifts, it had allowed him to both prolong his life and use magic far beyond any mortal being. And through reopening the Dragon's Gate and allowing dragons back into Alib, he planned to drain the quintessence of them, giving him access to untold levels of power than ever before. Lord Elbert and his knights had attempted to stop Nurgle, but had instead become fodder for more quintessence. In order to prepare for the Dark Sorcerer's inevitable reappearance, Elliwood, Hector, and Lynn next went to meet with Hector's brother, the Lord of Ostia, Uther. Realizing that no normal power would be capable of facing Nurgle, Uther and advised the group to travel to the Nabata Desert to the west, saying only that they may be able to meet a living legend there. This living legend was in actuality none other than Athos, one of the eight heroes who had helped to end the dragon-human conflict nearly 1,000 years ago. This ancient mage had seen their arrival coming, and through his envoys, he was able to guide the Lycians right to his location. Upon meeting the group, Athos told them that in order to defeat Nurgle now, they would have to find the Shrine of Seals, a hidden temple that rested somewhere within the borders of the eastern nation of Bern. After the mage used his magic to warp the group back to Foray, Elliwood and his group took a moment to rest, knowing that traveling into Bern and getting to the shrine would be their biggest ordeal yet. On top of being unwelcomed by the country's aggressive king and its military, Bern was also the birthplace of the Black Fang and contained many of its most powerful original fighters. Disguising themselves as simple travelers, Elliwood and his team headed over the border and into Bern, making their way towards the capital with the plan to meet with the queen. 
whom they hoped, due to her Etrurian ancestry, would be willing to meet with and assist them. After successfully battling through more of the Black Fang, the group was actually able to meet with the Queen, but found her already embroiled in a deep family struggle, as King Desmond of Bern was doing everything to subvert her attempt to have her son Zephiel become the next in line for the throne. To do this, it seemed that the King had arranged for the Fire Emblem, the symbol of royal authority in Bern, and an object which was needed in the ceremony that would name Zephiel as the official heir, to be taken and hidden away by agents of the Black Fang. In order for the Queen to give her help, she insisted that Elliwood and his fellow lords recover the Fire Emblem for her. After successfully tracking the emblem and retrieving it, on the way back to the castle, the group returned just in time to witness an assassination attempt on the prince by the Black Fang. After successfully stopping this and saving the prince's life, the queen finally, eventually, revealed the location of the shrine to the heroes, as well as promising the group safe passage through the country, at least by the soldiers which were loyal to her. With this guarantee, only the remaining members of the Black Fang still stood between them and their destination, and before long, they entered the fabled Shrine of Seals. Within, they were joined by Athos yet again, who praised them on their ability to successfully reach this place, and together they met another Another one of the still living legendary weapon holders, Bramimond. After convincing him to assist them, the ancient mage released a seal on the legendary weapons across the land that he had been managing over the ages, enabling their usage against Nurgle should the group be able to retrieve them. Immediately after leaving the Shrine of Seals, Nurgle finally made his reappearance, having fully revitalized himself after absorbing the quintessence of the many powerful Black Fang leaders that the group had to cut through in order to get to the the shrine. Knowing that Elliwood and the others were not yet prepared to take him on, Ninian offered to go with Nurgle peacefully in exchange for her friend's safety, an offer to which the sorcerer happily agreed to. As Ninian stalled for time, Hector was able to retrieve the Thunder Axe Armads, while Elliwood retrieved the Blazing Blade Durandal. When it soon became clear that Ninian would do everything to resist helping Nurgle, he again attempted to manually control her, and while struggling as fiercely as she could against this, Ninian accidentally transformed into her true form, that of a full ice dragon. Both Ninian and her brother Nils were actually dragons that had originally been born in the Lieb before the time of the Scouring. After being taken to the Dragon's Gate during the war, their human father had asked them to cross through it should he not return. And once they finally did, they had unfortunately lost their memories while traveling to the New World. As these two controlled the power to open and close the gate, they decided to head back to Alib after hearing the voice of Nurgle a millennium later. And upon arriving back in their homeland, they unexpectedly were forced into weak human forms and did not contain the quintessence of a full dragon that Nurgle needed. With Ninian back in her dragon form, Form, the sorcerer knew that she was now more valuable as a source of quintessence. Needing her to be weak first, he used his magic to teleport her in front of Elliwood's group. The new Lord of Foray, wielding the Durandal, acted upon instinct when seeing this massive beast suddenly appear before him, and with great speed, struck out with a powerful slash, which unfortunately struck true on the terrified Ninian. As the dragon transformed back into her beautiful form, Elliwood was distraught to discover what he had done. As Nurgle recovered the girl's quintessence and disappeared, he taunted the group to come back to the Dragon's Gate to confront him once and for all, knowing that this was his chance to retrieve their power and finally accomplish his goal. After mourning the beautiful dragon's death, the group set out for the Black Fang's stronghold, knowing that they had to put a stop to Nurgle no matter what. Even though Nurgle unleashed his full power against them, sending unbelievably vast waves of summoned soldiers, Elliwood, Hector, Lynn, the tactician, and the many friends and fighters they had recruited along the way cut down every bit of resistance, including the revived versions of many of the Black Fang leaders that they had defeated along their way. When at last face to face with Nurgle, the legendary warrior Athos himself joined in, using two of the legendary tomes to weaken Nurgle, while the Lords of Lycia cut into him with their own legendary blades. At long last, they had exhausted the quintessence and power of the seemingly unkillable sorcerer. Shocked 
Shocked at the reality of his own death finally coming for him, Nurgle used his last bit of life to finally accomplish his goal and force open the Dragon's Gate. In no time at all, three powerful fire dragons freely rushed through, showing off the kind of power that no human on Alib had witnessed for nearly the last thousand years. As everything seemed to be spiraling out of control, the legendary warrior Bremimon suddenly reappeared, using his own significant magical power to resurrect Ninian, who then immediately defeated two of the three fire dragons while weakening the third. With this sudden assistance, it was up to the heroes at hand to defeat the final weakened dragon, and after fighting through its blazing resistance, at last the group was successful. With the world safe for now, Ninian and Nils knew that they had to close the gate before more dragons could slip through. It's here where our story splits a bit, and although Nils always decides to return back to the world of dragons, Ninian instead decides to stay or go depending on her closeness to Elliewood. In either case, the Dragon's Gate is closed by the power of the Ice Dragon siblings, and Athos, having successfully averted another tragedy, finally passes away in the company of his new friends. Before his death, the Great Sage took a glimpse into the future, looking forward at events that were yet to come. In the mists of time, he saw that an evil would soon be rising in the Kingdom of Burn, and that a new hero would rise within Lycia yet again to lead the world back to peace. After returning the legendary weapons back to their protective shrines, our many heroes returned back to their home. True to Athos's vision, the power of the legendary weapons would need to be called upon yet again. But for now, our many heroes settled down into the peace that they had fought so hard for, choosing to enjoy what time they had with those that they had come to treasure. Fire Emblem 7 was basically Intelligent Systems' second shot at making a smaller scale companion game narrative and the plot that they came up with is really something to behold. Whether you interpreted that last sentence as positive or negative likely depends on which side of the Fire Emblem 7 story debate that you already fall into, because this story just happens to be one of the most polarizing plots in the entire franchise. Let's just be honest here, the plot of the Blazing Blade is sloppy. When looked at in detail, a lot of the elements of the story just fall apart. And on top of this, the generally poor official translation did not do anything to help matters. I don't really think that any of this can really be argued against. It's just kind of how this game is. What surprised me as I started to actually play through this entry was the degree to which some people seem to think that this actually ruins everything else that this game is able to offer. To me, playing through this series in the chronologically blind way that I am, what I most took away from this entry were the ways that the team behind it had become a lot more proficient in actually presenting the story and incorporating its many characters, all while keeping the story appropriately simple to approach, yet at the same time still making its major events seem impactful and its villains feel intimidating. Part of this has to do with the extra amount of time which is actually spent on characterizing the available cast of this game. For once, it isn't just your main heroes and their advisors that have all of the dialogue. Instead, multiple members of your army repeatedly contribute to the pre- and post-battle discussions, and even some smaller narratives are also being presented to you at the same time as the main story. Increased interaction between the cast at large was something that I'd been waiting for in a Fire Emblem game since the very first one, but I also found myself pleasantly surprised at the frequent incorporation of various computer-generated art stills into the story itself, something which does a great job at communicating the impact of the story's events to the player. While I'm sure these are not to everyone's taste, to me they were just a whole lot more engaging than watching the game try to deliver the same events through simple map sprites. As a result of many of these storytelling techniques, playing through the Blazing Blades plot was just an extremely enjoyable experience from start to finish. I realize that it's not the most well-written story in the franchise, far from it, but to me this is sort of the Fire Emblem equivalent of a summer popcorn flick. It's breezy and enjoyable the first time through, but upon close closer inspection, everything turns out to just be unbelievably dumb. While the complex twists and turns of a game like Genealogy of the Holy War is definitely my cup of tea, I have to admit that the appeal of playing through a game like this, with simple heroes, simple villains, and extremely appealing characters sprinkled throughout, is also something that I can totally be in the mood for from time to time. 
I can really understand how some people do find themselves also enjoying the story, while other people might think it's the worst thing since their son. This plot might just be so polarizing because, in a way, both camps are kind of right. For me, even though this was far from a masterfully crafted tale, I have to admit that I just really loved my time with this story and especially with these characters. Honestly, it's a bit of a toss-up for me exactly which game's cast is now my favorite between this and Genealogy of the Holy War. Without so many improvements to presentation or such an appealing cast, it's likely that I would have found this game a disaster. But as it is, I guess I'll just have to call it my guilty pleasure. It's okay to crave junk food from time to time. Anyone who insists they never have is a liar. Beginning this retrospective series, I had a concern when it came to writing these gameplay sections. I asked myself, what do I do if I get to a game that is almost identical to the previous one? Well, it's finally time to find that out, because in terms of gameplay, the Blazing Blade isn't just like the Binding Blade, it is the Binding Blade. Again, no other Fire Emblem game thus far has played as similar to any previous game before it, nor has any game added so little in terms of gameplay or systems. When sitting down to write this script and looking through my notes over the course of my 60 or so hours with this game, my list of new additions that this game actually introduced was comically short. In fact, why don't we go ahead and knock those out real fast? First of all, of course you now control three lords as opposed to one, with a special item that has been added that will allow you to promote your non-mains whenever you wish. This seems like one of those obvious in retrospect changes, and although you now have two more characters who absolutely cannot fall in battle without a game over, the amount of improved dialogue in the game that this led to I feel was more than worth it. Due to Hector, Elliewood, and Lynn being canonically deathproof, no matter what happens, your hero is going to have their two dynamic friends by their side to chat with. Next up, a new promotion for Thieves has been added, leading to the Assassin, a class that is much more capable at fighting in exchange for losing the ability to steal. On top of this, certain new map conditions have been added, such as rain and snow, as well as a certain enemy character who is able to create magic nullification zones, all of which are interesting ways to shake up your normal formations and lead to refreshing mix-ups in the normal gameplay. Although the Merchant and Supply Holder Merlinus returns here, or should I say originates here, in this game, he starts out with a stationary tent, and thankfully, he also no longer takes up a deployment slot. Even though deploying him leads to you needing to defend him when reinforcements from behind appear, there's a clever incentive built in the game where he gains a level for each map that he survives, and when reaching level 20, he promotes, allowing you to have a constant mobile supply train for the late game. I also like how this encourages you to seek out and do the extra side missions so that he can get more levels. To finish things off, you can now not knock down trees. This will make log bridges. And I think that's it. Had Western gamers been able to experience the Binding Blade at its time of release, and then played through the Blazing Blade later, I have no doubt that in the media we would have seen plenty of complaints calling out this entry for being a cheap repeat of what came before. There seems to be a certain segment of gamers who believe that all sequels must push the envelope in a very dramatic way in order to justify their existence. Personally, I remember more than a few of these, with the outcry over the similar between Splatoon 1 and 2 as a recent example of this frustrating trend. To be very clear about my stance on this, I don't think that I could be in further disagreement with these people. While there's definitely a limit to how long this practice can be pushed, sometimes, especially with games that were as frustratingly close to greatness as The Binding Blade was, all you really need is more of the same but better. And the benefit of developers not rocking the boat every single time is how the level of mastery by the creators is able to increase if the ones making the game actually do try to learn from previous mistakes. I really hate to keep calling out The Binding Blade because I did enjoy and still respect it, but without a doubt it was a game that intelligent systems had to learn from. And thankfully, they did. As I said before in this series, it isn't the frame, but the engine that changes with each new Fire Emblem game. When it comes to the Blazing Blade, that saying is truer than ever before. 
It's the things here which don't stand out at a first glance that are the legacy of this game. And honestly, some of these fixes or improvements were more enjoyable for me to experience than many of the brand new systems that Fire Emblem games had tinkered with before. Let's go ahead and start out with one of the biggest ones. Although the double RNG system of the Binding Blade has returned, unfortunately along with the confusing practice of still displaying incorrect hit and miss numbers, the balance between different weapon types here has been significantly improved improved done so mostly by simply altering some numbers on the weapons. With these changes, slower unit types have come back into usability, while bringing the completely overpowered speedy dodge tanks of before back in line with the rest of your options. Next up, the frustrating slow growth of support points between units has also been massively improved, including completely reworking how support points are limited for each individual map. On top of plus one and plus two relationships being far less common, you now now have no cap on how many support points you can get in a single battle. The control in this now limits you to one support conversation per pair per map. And although this seems like a small change, it actually ends up taking a lot of the frustration out of planning and executing your desired support pairings. Thankfully, you no longer need to be so clinical in planning out your support growths, due to any accidental points gained never actually limiting you in any way. Even though in both of my playthroughs I had multiple characters reach their 5 support cap, it really felt like I spent no more than 10 to 15 minutes on each run even thinking about it. To top this off, a little over halfway through the Blazing Blade, you are finally able to see who each character is able to bond with. All in all, even though this still isn't my idea of a perfect support system yet, especially due to the reality of the best way to raise these support relationships is just wasting turns in front of an empty throne, at the very least, this is definitely a huge step in the right direction, and gave me more than enough incentive to actually seek out these relationships. Many of the fixes that I've mentioned thus far can massively affect every player's enjoyment of the game, but at the same time, it's easy for these to overshadow the myriad of other small ways that Fire Emblem 7 continued to perfect its design. Even though these don't loom as large as the last two, small fixes like being able to use stat boosting and promotion items right from the deployment menu, the health points of walls being lowered significantly, the ability to have a fortune teller predict things about upcoming maps that often give you hints for who you should bring to recruit new characters, the return of the survival and destroy all enemies mission types, and the ability to skip unlocked side missions if you want to, all more than merit a mention. About the only questionable change hidden amongst this bunch was the decision to adjust the damage multiplier on what are called effective weapons. This doesn't mean the weapon triangle, but rather things like using a bow against a flying enemy. Rather than the classic times 3 damage, which is actually retained in the Japanese versions of this game, all Western versions have lowered this to times 2 damage. This seems to be a change for the sake of accessibility for new players. And although I can get past most of these things, like the overbearing tutorial due to it being able to be skipped on hard mode, this is one change that I think was way overly precautious and a rather short-sighted decision by the developers. Without having taken the time to play through all the prior Fire Emblem games before this one, it's likely that the improvements that the Blazing Blade brought to the table would have been completely lost on me. It was a pretty special experience to play it in the context of all the previous games before it. And for me, I think the intent of this entry, to bring the Fire Emblem games to a whole new level of polish just in time for its debut worldwide, was a very wise decision. With all of this in mind, I think it's finally time that we take a step back and see how it holds up overall. For me, it's really remarkable that this game, the one which most set out to be a perfect version of itself after learning from its failures, was the one which got to be the first Fire Emblem game for thousands worldwide. Even though I believe that now all of the prior games are fully worthy of being released in the Western market, at the time of its release, I can't imagine a more perfect entry to introduce new players to this gameplay. This is a game that features extremely memorable heroes and villains, all set in a very well-realized world. This is on top of a fantastic soundtrack, wonderful character animations and combat balance, and despite its flaws, a thoroughly engaging story. 
Needless to say, I had an amazing time playing my way through the Blazing Blade. Along with Genealogy of the Holy War, this was one of the few games that had me hungry to begin my second playthrough immediately after finishing the first. Had this been the first game released to the West or not, I really believe that Fire Emblem 7 would still have served the same purpose that it often does today, being the standard for which subsequent games are judged. All in all, the Blazing Blade is a brilliantly balanced, extremely enjoyable, absolutely solid Fire Emblem experience. And without a doubt, it has quickly become one of my favorites in the franchise thus far. A highly, highly recommended game. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us into the new land of Magville and the final game for the Game Boy Advance. Starring the siblings Erika and Ephraim on their quest to restore their lost homeland, be sure to join me next time as we jump into Fire Emblem 8, The Sacred Stones. Way back when the Fire Emblem series was brand new and many of its established traditions were not yet set in stone, Fire Emblem Gaiden, the game that would go on to become the black sheep of the franchise, was created. For the many years following its release, as the series pivoted back into the style of the first game, many of Gaiden's most unique ideas had become entirely buried and forgotten. That was, at least, until now. Fire Emblem 8 The Sacred Stones is a lot of things. Often called the spiritual sequel to Gaiden, at the same time it's also the final Game Boy Advance entry and a continuation of the Binding and Blazing Blades style. On top of this, it was also the second game in the entire franchise to be released in the West, and it also had to balance both progressing the series for veterans as well as appeasing the many new fans they had gained. Needless to say, The Sacred Stones had some very big shoes to fill, and the ways in which it did so have gone on to not only make it one of the most divisive games in the franchise, but also, through its release, establish a new format for Fire Emblem games to take on. A major change that in some ways would be the genesis of the divide between new and old players that we still see today. For myself, being one of the few who A. actually played Gaiden multiple times, and B. really enjoyed it, the concept of bringing back some of its mechanics into the more fine-tuned gameplay of the GBA era was incredible news for me. For, as half-baked as many of its ideas were, Gaiden was a game that had a lot of potential, so much so that I have remained charmed by it even after covering the next five games that came afterwards. Having now played through the Sacred Stones twice, experiencing each route of the story and getting familiar with its significant post-game content, I ended up finding both more and less than what I expected. In this video, we're going to attempt to find out exactly what that is, by of course examining Fire Emblem 8 in detail. I'll be taking a look at its development history, giving a synopsis of the story, and then analyzing the plot along with the many gameplay developments that started here, all in order to best present what I've found. It's been a long time getting to this, the halfway point in the entire series. So let's not waste any more time and get this thing started. The story of the development of the Sacred Stones is actually one that begins with the next game, Path of Radiance. That sounds very strange to say, but it's actually true. Following the international success of 2003's Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, for the next game in this franchise, Intelligent Systems made the decision to transition from a handheld system back to a console, aiming for the Nintendo GameCube for what would become the first 3D Fire Emblem. With this new goal in sight, the staff believed that they would not be returning to the Game Boy Advance. But perhaps after realizing the amount of work that would be required to transition from 2D to 3D for the first time, Intelligent Systems decided on creating a second Fire Emblem game at the same time that Path of Radiance was being developed. This is the game that would go on to become the Sacred Stones. For this second team, Sachiko Wada was selected as the game's director, working alongside Taiki Ubukata and Kentaro Nishimura. Wada herself had worked on the character designs of the previous game, and here alongside Ryo Hirota, she continued that role in addition to directing. 
For the first time ever in the series, the musical compositions were not handled directly by Yuka Tsujiyoko. She instead served as the sound supervisor for the newer composers Yoshihiko Kitamura, Saki Haruyama, and Yoshito Hirano. Even though the game's development started after Path of Radiance, and was even announced afterwards as well, creating yet another Fire Emblem in the by now pretty well-worn style of the Game Boy Advance titles, allowed for a very breezy development. It was not long until October 7th, 2004, when it was released in Japan, only about a year and a half after the previous game. After the many translation problems of the Blazing Blade, much more care was put into localization this time, a process that was also easier due to this game's simpler and shorter script. On May 23rd, 2005, the second Western Fire Emblem game came to North America, with its European release following in November of the same year. Like with the seventh game, the Sacred Stones was met with praise from all regions, with reviewers enjoying the story, characters, and setting, while having more mixed opinions regarding its similarities to the last game. Western reviewers' lack of familiarity with the history of the franchise had led to exactly what I would have expected to be said about Fire Emblem 7 in comparison with the 6th, but thankfully this did not seem to take away from most players' enjoyment. Next up here, I'm going to be giving a full story synopsis, followed by my own general analysis in the subsequent chapter. If you'd like to go ahead and jump right to the analysis section, you can use the timecode scene at the top of the screen. On the other hand, if you're looking to avoid all story spoilers, you can jump to the timecode code at the bottom of the screen to get to the gameplay sections which will be spoiler free. Now is your last chance because we're starting in 3, 2, 1. Long ago in the distant land of Magvil, humanity found itself under assault by a massive monster army, led by the mighty demon king Formotus. With no help against the enemy horde, humanity appealed to the gods themselves and was gifted five holy objects which came to be known as the Sacred Stones. With these stones in hand, humanity finally stood a chance against the forces of darkness, and after much blood and sacrifice, the demon king was sealed away. With this, a well-earned peace, one that would last for over 800 years settled across the land. Five nations developed on the continent, Fralia, Rostin, Jehana, Grotto, and Rene each one of these housing one of the Sacred Stones, with a sixth mercantile nation named Carcino coming a bit later. In recent years, the nations of Rene and Grotto had shared particularly good relations, but all of this was shattered one day when the southern nation suddenly attacked and invaded its loyal neighbor. As Grotto's armies crashed through Rene, claiming territory after territory with ease, within the capital, the king ordered his daughter, Princess Erica, to flee while accompanied by the loyal knight Seth in order to seek assistance from their northern ally Fralia. As the princess was spirited away just as Grotto troops moved in, the duo evaded capture until reaching safety in Fralia. Here they met with its king, Hayden, who revealed, sadly, that the Grotto forces, upon reaching the Rene throne room, had brutally murdered the king. With her father gone, Erica's only remaining family was her brother Ephraim, a brave and powerful youth who was currently mounting a guerrilla resistance to the Grotto Empire, trying to stop their advance. While the Fralians offered Erica their protection, the princess instead insisted on marching back out in an attempt to reunite with her brother. Taking along some of Fralia's finest warriors, she did exactly that. Along the way, she was shocked to find that monstrous beasts had begun to roam the land freely again, and on the way to her brother, she was required to fight through some of these reawakened monstrosities. As Erica was continuing her journey, Ephraim's resistance back in the south had finally moved in on its target, arriving at the strategically important fort Rinval in Grotto. With most of the Grotto troops out looking for himself and his sister, the prince believed that the fort would be underdefended. but after he and his loyal soldiers launched their assault, it turned out to all be a trap. The knight Orson, who had been accompanying the prince, betrayed his liege and made a deal with Grotto, and now Ephraim and his remaining knights were forced to flee under heavy pursuit. By the time that Erika's group had fought their way to the fort, there was no sign of Ephraim or his soldiers, only a disturbed-looking Orson inviting them in. It was the highly 
trained Seth, who realized that something was amiss. And with Orson outed as a traitor, Grotto sprung its second trap, now with the princess in its sights. As Erica struggled against the new waves of forces, her brother surprisingly reappeared, having somehow evaded capture this entire time. Reunited at last, the twins combined their might and ousted the commander of the Grotto forces. Although they were safe for now, they agreed that they needed to retreat from their homeland before their foes could return. And soon, the two fled again to the kingdom of Fralia. While on the road, Erica and Ephraim questioned why this terrible war had suddenly been thrust upon them. Before Grotto's sudden aggression, both of them had been best friends with Grotto's Prince Leon, a frail but intelligent young man who had always detested violence. When they were finally back in Fralia, Ephraim revealed Murr, a young girl he had been protecting, who was in actuality a dragon in human form called a Manakeet, and was also the adoptive daughter to the Great Dragon, one of the figures who had played a major part in defeating the Demon King long ago. Murr could only cryptically say that she felt a miasmic wave of evil emanating from the Grotto Empire, and that clearly something otherworldly was happening there. This wave of evil was likely what had awakened the monsters that were already running rampant across the continent yet again. Elsewhere in Fralia, a sudden attack by Grotto was taking place, as two of their finest generals had found Fralia's sacred stone and destroyed it just as quickly. This despicable act symbolized that Grotto did indeed have an evil intent behind its actions, and so the royal siblings decided that they needed to take decisive action. Erica chose to go east to Rostin and Jahana, traveling by ship to warn them of the attacks to come. Ephraim was to go south to strike into Grotto itself, attempting to defeat the Emperor and stop their invasions from the source. It is here where the plot splits, both for our protagonist's journeys as well as the story's actual canon. For Erica, she found that no ships were willing to sail, and so traveled via mountain pass to arrive directly in the nation of Jahana, where she found Grotto forces already there assaulting the capital. Although the Queen Ismer of Jahana was slain and the sacred stone she protected destroyed, Erica at least was able to seize the castle back, during which she ran into the forces which were sent to destroy the stone. Among these was Prince Leon himself, who spoke sadly to Erica, saying that he regretted that he was unable to prevent the invasion of Rene, implying that his father had gone mad and that Leon was helpless to stop him. Jumping back to Ephraim, he successfully fought his way south and set up his own resistance base in the western region of Grotto. As many of Grotto's generals questioned their loyalty during this time, given their emperor's sudden aggression, Ephraim's group slowly but surely was bolstered enough to fight their way right up to Emperor Vigard's location, where he seemed totally unresponsive. After defeating him right on his throne, strangely, the emperor seemed to disintegrate rather than bleed out and die, and none other than Prince Leon soon appeared before Ephraim. With a very different attitude, Grotto's prince claimed that he had always been pretending to be their friend all along, and that he had secretly resented Ephraim for years. After Leon retreated, Ephraim found a mage within the dungeons named Nal, who was better able to explain what was going on. In truth, Emperor Vigard of Grotto had died of illness over a year ago, and Leon had nearly gone mad with grief. In an attempt to resurrect his father, he had been attempting to utilize the power of Grotto's Sacred Stone. And during his experimentation, he had discovered a way to split it in two, forming what was called the Dark Stone. With this, he was able to bring his deceased father back to life, but at the same time, little by little, the prince seemed to change. Long ago, in the battle against the Demon King, this had been the stone which had been used to seal Formotus's soul, and without knowing it, the evil will of the Demon King had seeped into Leon, which had likely set him on his mad quest to destroy all the other stones as well. With Grotto, Fralia, and Jahana's stones destroyed, Ephraim realized that only the stones of Rene and Rostin remained. And so he quickly rushed back to his sister's side, finding her under siege at the capital of Jahana by two of Grotto's generals. Through working together, the twins were able to win the day and after stopping briefly in their homeland to retrieve their own sacred stone, which had been kept safe due to a lock that only their dual bracelets could open, they then started towards Rostin to make their final stand against their cursed former friend. Along the way, Leon suddenly reappeared before them, at last revealing the truth. If the player chose to take Erica's route, then Leon's entire soul had been devoured by the Demon King 
Formotus had been acting like Leon in order to trick Erica into trusting him. If the player chose Ephraim's route, Leon reveals quite the opposite. Despite seeming like he's fully possessed, actually it was all an act. Leon had remained in control. The Demon King did have an influence on him, but for the most part he remained in control of his faculties. In either case, the siblings here are tricked, through either force or foolishness, into having their sacred stone taken away and destroyed right before their eyes. With Leon's departure again, our hero finally arrived in Roston, and met with the Emperor there to confer what had been going on. After defending Roston's stone from an assault by Leon's final general, the group was able to retrieve it for themselves and travel to Darkling Woods, the site of the final battle with Formotus 800 years ago, and the place where he was about to be reborn. After facing the most powerful of their foe's monster horde, along with the defiled corpse of the great dragon Morva that Leon had recently murdered, Erica, Ephraim, and their allies discovered Leon mid ritual, and swiftly defeated him on the spot. As he was dying, whether Leon was fully possessed, or, I suppose, half-possessed, the chain of events that he had started proceeded, and quite suddenly the Demon King in his original body was reborn into the world once more. In the face of their true enemy, the twins held up their sacred stone, which immediately sealed the Demon King's soul yet again, leaving behind only his mindless raging behemoth of a body. Stealing themselves for their greatest challenge yet, the collected heroes rushed headlong into the fray, taking on each devastating blow of the Demon King while trading with their own until at last, miraculously, the evil had been defeated. With the soul of the Demon King sealed yet again, and his body nothing but dust, this enemy of humanity would never again be able to return. While our heroes mourned the loss of their friend Leon, yet at the same time treasuring each other and the friends they had made along the way, the two royals, along with the many others who had helped them restore order, settled into a new time of peace and love. The best words to describe Fire Emblem 8's story in a very, very, very small nutshell is to say that it's just kind of painfully average. It really hurts me to sum things up so bluntly like this, because there was a lot that I enjoyed about the journeys of Erica and Ephraim. Yet at the same time, there are a lot of weird, somewhat amateurish choices here, which tended to strain the credit I was willing to give it. Let's start with a positive. Even though the Blazing Blade expanded the roster of lords you controlled from 1 to 3, when playing through the Sacred Stone, I began to realize that there was actually a lot of missed potential there. The way that the stories of Erica and Ephraim were handled was quite clearly a tribute to Fire Emblem Gaiden, in the way that Alm and Silica's tales intermingled. And now that I think about it, we didn't really get multiple narratives in the previous game when we actually could have. Once Elliewood, Hector, and Lynn came together after only a few short chapters, they pretty much stayed together until the end of the game. Although Gaiden kept the soldiers of each hero in separate camps until the end, the Game Boy Advance Age of Fire Emblem had a much bigger emphasis on using your chosen units in whatever combination you liked, for both gameplay and story purposes. Following from this, even when our heroes split up, I also really appreciate that they did leave a way for you to still take along your early favorites. Unfortunately, this didn't mean that much to me, because up until meeting La Rachelle, it was pretty hard for me to actually care much about the rest of the cast. Of course, every player will have a different take on this, but for me, in this cast, there were just not that many strong personalities or interesting characters that left me wanting to know more. I definitely liked some of the villains, especially Valter, Kalok, and Selina, but at the same time this is balanced out by the Demon King, probably one of the most boring and generic kind of final bosses that I've ever seen. I think the reason the playable cast doesn't stick out that much to me is because, in general, this game just imbues much less personality into them. Again, as was done in previous Fire Emblem games before the Blazing Blade, the supporting cast development is relegated to mostly mid-battle dialogue sections, and appear much less frequently in the dialogue scenes between chapters. This is paired with the absence of the pretty fun CG art that the Blazing Blade used to punch up its most emotional moments in the story. The fact that the canon changes depending on which lord's path you chose to see, despite being totally nonsensical, at least does add a very interesting wrinkle to this game's overall plot, and it also gives a good incentive to try out both paths. For my first playthrough, I went with Erica's route, which ended up being a somewhat inconsequential trek through a mountain pass to end up at Jahan 
Anna. There were definitely a couple of fun scenes here. For example, I enjoyed meeting up with Saleh and the rest, but all in all, not that much actually happens. I kind of imagined that Ephraim's path would be much the same, but when you meet up with him, he just kind of casually drops that while I was having fun camping, he went and killed the evil emperor himself and stopped the entire war. When I heard this, I really couldn't believe that the split was as significant as it actually was. But at the same time, if you're not one to go back and do a second playthrough, which let's be real, are most people, are just going to have an incomplete story on their hands. The fact that the land of Magvil has never been returned to in any subsequent game, a trait exclusive to the Sacred Stones, somewhat gives me the sense that this game's characters, world, and plot have largely just been left behind, both by many players and to be honest, maybe even the developers themselves. Even though the characters of this game do see some representation in current series-wide projects, such as Fire Emblem Heroes or Fire Emblem Cypher, if we use the latter as an example, the characters of the Sacred Stones have only really been featured in two out of the 19 current released booster sets, which is actually the least of any main Fire Emblem game. All in all, I just get the sense that the land of Magvel and the story of the Sacred Stones simply failed to connect with players. This may not be the biggest deal, because though the Sacred Stones is rarely remembered for its plot, it does still have many features that make it stand out. As is frequently repeated, Fire Emblem 8 The Sacred Stones is known as the spiritual successor to Fire Emblem Gaiden, and although this can be seen in its story structure, it's actually in the gameplay that this is much better reflected, and that is exactly what we're going to be getting into next. <laughs> If Fire Emblem 7 was Fire Emblem 6 with improvements, then Fire Emblem 8 is Fire Emblem 7 with improvements. Due to the previous game already addressing many of the growing pains witnessed in 6, by working off that template, the Sacred Stones was able to reintroduce some of the older systems of the franchise that were left behind with the Binding Blade's focus on minimalism, with many of those systems reintroduced coming from the black sheep of the franchise, Fire Emblem Gaiden. One of the first of these reintroductions is the inclusion of trainee units, who were equivalent to Fire Emblem 2's villagers, Cliff, Grey, Tobin, and Atlas. In FE2, these units had little proficiency with combat at first, but if you raised them, they could eventually become extremely powerful over two promotions. On top of this, you were also able to choose what class you wanted them to promote into, something that added a great little bit of extra freedom in how you wanted to plan out your main squad. The Sacred Stones has taken this concept and ran with it, giving you not only three trainee units who work in a very similar way, but also introducing the concept concept of branching promotion for almost every single class in the game. For units that start with a basic class, you are able to choose from two different classes when promoting them. The charts on Serenus Forest do a great job of laying this out, and though at a glance this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, after experiencing two very different runs through this game, I found that this is actually a really big change. Just for a laugh, I tried making a 12-man squad of mounted units to crash through the game during my Ephraim run, and I found it to be not only fun, but also also extremely rewarding to plan towards and execute. On top of your additional freedom and promotion, many of these new classes have brought back one of my favorite features which was last seen in FE4 and 5, with that being the addition of skills. Although no unit here starts with any skills on their own, through promotion to specific classes they are eventually able to gain one. These are more like class characteristics than the skills of old, but honestly I'll take what I can get. As an example, let's take a look at the path of a standard wyvern rider. When promoting, you can now choose between becoming a traditional wyvern lord or the new class, wyvern knight. Wyvern lords are able to use swords, giving you better weapon triangle manipulation, but wyvern knights, despite being locked to lances forever, gives your unit the skill pierce, which can randomly allow for your attacks to ignore defense stats. These kind of choices definitely make for very interesting trade-offs, as well as for allowing new types of gameplay into the series. In particular, I had a lot of fun playing with the new shaman promotion type, Summoner. These units are able to create a single phantom that can move around the map like a flyer, ignoring terrain. Even though they only have a single HP, they serve as extra expendable units that have a lot of utility. They can be used as scouts, damage blockers, or even decent free damage that can soften up or kill off enemies. Even though the Sacred Stones and the game Game Boy Advance Fire Emblems in general suffer from a lack of new ideas, the changes made here actually do signify some of the most creative and successful ideas ever entered into the franchise. Unfortunately, that isn't really what this game is known for nowadays in the Fire Emblem community, and I think it's about time that we finally get to the elephant in the room.
simply through its existence, the Sacred Stones sets into stone, a trend that was before just a one-off feature seen only once in the series, the use of an open world with endless optional battles. Working much the same way as it did in Gaiden, after you finish each battle, rather than being taken to the battle preparation screen for the next one, you are instead taken to a world map, where you can then visit different shops and eventually access optional skirmishes, which are repeatable battles with monsters. On top of this, at two points in the game, you are given access to what I'd call a dungeon, with the first one being very infamous nowadays as an overly easy grinding spot. Had I not approached the series in release order, the reason why being able to grind like this is so distasteful for some would not be as clear to me, so allow me to best try to express why a lot of people have a big issue with this kind of design. From the outside, Fire Emblem games look like any other JRPG. You have a host of different heroes and heroines to choose from, all super anime, and throughout the game you're able to train them, level them, and even evolve them. In the reality of these games, this is not a comparison that can go much further, because there is one feature that Fire Emblem uses that no other RPG series seems to. Limitations. In Fire Emblem, experience is a resource, and when it's out, it's out. To express this point, let's make a quick example game to clearly paint how total experience distribution in a linear style Fire Emblem game works. In our theoretical FE game, we have 25 total chapters, and in each chapter you can fight 25 enemies. For simplicity's sake, every enemy defeated will grant our heroes 25 points of experience. So that's 25 units over 25 chapters, giving 25 experience each. That means that our game's maximum amount of distributed experience eventually adds up to 15,625. Now, we need to compare that with our selection of units' potential growth. Young Lord Tingle starts with a ragtag team that eventually grows into a powerful army of 50 characters. For simplicity, each of his units start at level 10, which means that they can get 30 possible levels as his standard for Fire Emblem. If each of these remaining 30 levels costs 100 points of experience each, then we have 50 units units who can gain 30 levels each, which each cost 100 experience. That means in order to get everyone to maximum, we would need a total of 150,000 points of experience. The amount of experience given by our enemies in this game amounts to 10.4% of what my team would actually need for all units to hit max level. Even if we break this in half, these are still pitifully limited numbers. The distribution of experience in these games is absolutely critical, but this also goes alongside item distribution, money distribution, distribution, and so many other systems of limitation that make Fire Emblem so beloved and brilliant. When understanding this fact, it really isn't hard to see how open map systems completely destroy the experience of classic Fire Emblem. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. I suppose this is the point where I exclaim, boom, Fire Emblem 8 destroyed, and then put on my sunglasses indoors, but I'd like to stop for a minute and recognize something very, very important that a lot of veterans seem to forget about. I'm gonna get real close for this one. Some people like to play these games for different reasons. Games appeal to different people in all manner of ways. When it comes to Fire Emblem, some people just like to build the most ridiculous units they can and curb stomp the rest of the game. Some people just like to turn bad units into good units. Some people like the grinding, and some people are just not ready for the difficulty of a Fire Emblem game without grinding. There is nothing in the Sacred Stones that requires anyone to grind or utilize any of the extra open map battles. Whether you want to play the game without grinding, only grind up trainees to level 10, pick up a few support conversations before the finale, or just go deep into the endless creature campaign that follows the main story, the open worlds of Gaiden and the Sacred Stones are the best of both worlds, and I can't imagine ever having a problem with them as well as the future games I haven't played yet which also use them, as long as they continue to keep these grind features completely optional. I suppose with that out of the way, it's finally time to put everything here together and take a look at how the Sacred Stones holds up. When it came to mixing the bonkers ideas of Gaiden with the by now established standard Fire Emblem formula, the Sacred Stones is a tremendous success. At the same time, when it came to summing up my feelings on the game, the word I kept returning to time and time again was 
forgettable. I'm not entirely sure why I feel this way. Perhaps it's just a little bit of Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem fatigue. Looking at the Super Famicom era, the three games there all contained very different art styles and sprite work, while the three GBA games are pretty interchangeable looking. If it's not this, then maybe instead it has to do with the story and characters not really hitting the mark for me. Whatever the reason, Fire Emblem 8 was just a game that I could not find myself getting attached to. Had I not been playing it for this video series, I almost definitely wouldn't have gone back for a second playthrough. Of course, I'm glad that I did, as my A-frame run, where I really got creative with the branching promotion system, was by far the best time that I had with the game. Which is not even mentioning how the story beats of his path were very entertaining, even if it was for the wrong reasons. I guess what I'm trying to say is that The Sacred Stones is a good game that's just a little bit too soulless for me to love. It doesn't feel like anyone's best work, more like a game that was just made to get another Fire Emblem out the door. After hearing about its development history, I think that assessment kind of makes sense. Despite the good times that I did have with it, I really don't think that FE8 is a game that will stick with me. Perhaps when this retrospective series is finally finished, maybe I'll find myself missing its world and how it mixed Gaiden and the standard mechanics together, and at that time I'll think fondly back on the many characters and their various journeys depicted here. To be honest, I kind of doubt it, but I suppose that only time can really tell. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us at last into the land of Tellius, as we join the hero Ike and the struggle of the Grail mercenaries. Be sure to join me next time as this franchise takes its first steps into 3D with Fire Emblem 9 Path of Radiance. <laughs> When I think back on the gaming years of my life, there perhaps has never been a more exciting time than the days of early 3D game development. This was a transitory time, where classic series of the 2D era suddenly found the need to reinvent themselves, some for the better and some for the worse. When it came to nailing the transition between dimensions on their first try, none other than Nintendo can be said to have done it better. While games like Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, and Metroid Prime were making this transfer look easy, Fire Emblem a series uniquely suited to such a transition due to its overhead turn-based gameplay was gently biding its time, immersed completely in the specialty of portable gaming. Regardless, when it came time for intelligent systems to finally make the transition, they did so with great care. And the world they came up with, and the characters within, have gone on to be some of the most beloved in the series. Set in this new land of Tellius, the tale of Ike and his band of mercenaries flipped a number of series expectations on their head, while at the same time remaining quite close to what had come before. Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is a game that has gone on to become very beloved by series fans. Yet at the same time, there's no denying that we are about to be entering a very dark period for the franchise as a whole. One which would test both its viability as a product for the Western market, as well as the entire survival of the series. The story of this dark age of the Fire Emblem franchise will be something that will take a few more videos to fully cover. But for now, I'd much rather focus on the game at hand. While the worlds and characters of the more modern day Fire Emblems are quite saturated in exposure nowadays, the Tellius games are the last of these that I know almost nothing about, besides, of course, the name of the main character. Similar to my first exposure to Roy through Super Smash Bros., and always wanting to know more about his game, the origins of Ike have always had a similar fascination for me, and I could not wait to jump into this one as soon as I could. As I do for all of these retrospectives, I completed Path of Radiance twice, and this video is going to go very in-depth on everything contained within. In order to fully understand this game and its place in the series, I will be breaking down the history of its development, giving a full rundown of the story along with my own analysis, and then following up on the continuing evolution of the gameplay and systems that this ninth game developed. It's been about one year since I started this series, and I truly have been waiting to say this for a very long time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get started on the Path of Radiance.
Following the unexpected international success of Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, which was the first Fire Emblem game released outside of Japan, the decision was made within Intelligent Systems to create the next entry in the series on the Nintendo GameCube. The development of Path of Radiance started before the Sacred Stones, with the team all thinking that they were done with the Game Boy Advance. Yet, at some point, this was changed by the ones in charge, and a team dedicated to creating the last Game Boy Advance entry was split off by the developer. While the Sacred Stones would have a fast development time due to the developers' familiarity with the portable hardware that they had worked with for years, the creation of Path of Radiance would be much more of a challenge. This was the Fire Emblem series' first foray into 3D graphics, which, aside from adding depth to character models and environments, also meant that this would be the Fire Emblem team's first time handling camera management, motion capture battle animations, the framing and implementation of in-engine story scenes, and many more complications that an extra dimension brings. Apart from the new graphics, Graphics. For the first time, FMV cutscenes were utilized in-game, inserted throughout the story in a similar way as the Blazing Blade used its CG still art to better express certain scenes. On top of this, in another series first, these scenes were fully voiced, including an English cast for the Western release. Path of Radiance was meant to be a major step up in the presentation of this series, and this was for multiple reasons. Intelligent Systems felt that they had successfully cultivated a love for this series through the high-quality work and general warm reception of the GBA era games, and they felt that the time was right to return back to the console and wow its fans with several sudden advancements in technology all at once. To capitalize on this, Path of Radiance was created to be a satisfying tale on its own, but also one which left clear hooks open for the already planned sequel. This was yet another first for the franchise. Under the direction of Masayuki Horikawa, who took up directing duties for the first time with this entry, the ninth Fire Emblem game eventually saw release on April 20th, 2005 in Japan, with later releases in other territories dropping between October to December of the same year. While the Blazing Blade and Sacred Stone scripts were challenging in their own ways to translate into English, the localization effort of Path of Radiance was on a completely different scale. The new land of Tellius not only introduced multiple new nations, as had been standard with each shift to a new setting, but also many new races which all had their own unique goals, history, and culture. As a result, the localization team frequently worked with the intelligent system staff, giving their all to ensure that the subtle nuance of the script was kept while still making it enjoyable to play through. This kind of purity in adapting the script was not exactly kept for the gameplay. As was done in Fire Emblem 7, effective damage, such as arrows against flyers, was reduced from a 3 times damage boost to 2 times, and a new, easy difficulty option was added into the Western release to again appeal to new adopters of the series. Hard Mode, which was called Difficult, also received its own alteration along with an even harder mode, Maniac, remaining exclusive to the Japanese version. Thankfully, despite the many new risks that this game took, which could have definitely spelled disaster, reception at the time was very positive in all regions. Unfortunately, as time has gone on, the inelegance of this team's first attempt at 3D has become clearer and clearer. By this I mean things like the character models, which, especially out of battle, have aged very terribly. But this also goes doubly for the battle animation whose stiffness and lack of punch stand in stark contrast to the wonderful work which was done in this area throughout Fire Emblem's run on the Game Boy Advance. The overall slowness of the animations, including just using the on-map animations which are supposed to be faster, have led to this entry being known for playing particularly slowly, especially in combination with the frequently massive number of enemy units. While limitations of the in-engine play have become clearer with time, the character design and music have remained as bright as ever, with composing veterans such as as Saki Haruyama and others on board, the bombastic and energetic score was accompanied by the striking character work of Senri Kita, who was known for her work with SNK and the Samurai Showdown series. Compared to the other casts yet seen, the character work and music of Fire Emblem 9 really stand out, something which does help to frame this game as a new era in Fire Emblem. Despite all of the effort that was poured into this project, Path of Radiance unfortunately sold significantly worse than the prior two games. This was likely affected by both the GameCube being a largely unsuccessful console in sales, as well as the game's release coming towards the end of its lifespan. Although sales were not bad enough to call it a true failure, this was a troubling first step for Ike and his friends on the journey. Speaking of which, I guess it's about time we get to that actual journey. Before starting, I'm just going to come out and say that this story section is going to be extremely large. Although the events that take place in Path of Radiance are pretty straightforward, much like Genealogy of the Holy War, there is a 
lot going on that simply needs to be said, and I have done all I can to condense it as best as possible. For the first time since the Fire Emblem 4 video, the following story synopsis is going to be split into multiple parts. Another important detail to add in here is that I am not going to be including any reveals which come from the following game, Radiant Dawn. Since I am playing through this series chronologically and making these videos on each one before moving on, the following synopsis and analysis are going to be formed based on my experience with just this one game, which I actually think is a lot fairer. Players at the time would have no idea if the events in this game would be getting paid off in the sequel or not. So in order to properly analyze it, it's important to look at the experience of just playing this game as its own independent entry. As usual, the following story synopsis and story analysis sections are going to contain full spoilers. And as usual, I'm dropping time codes on screen now for both a jump to the story analysis section at the top of the screen or a jump to the gameplay analysis sections with the time code on the bottom. All right, everyone, it's your last chance to jump forward if you wish, because we're getting started on this adventure in three, two, one. Deep in a forest, somewhere in Crimea, the clatter of wooden swords can be heard. Here, the young mercenary in training, named Ike, was facing off against his father Grail, just as they had done many times before. Despite losing the first round, Ike's determination led him to scoring a win against his father for the first time ever. Despite having been fighting in a way that suppressed his true strength, the father acknowledged the son, and approved of him beginning work as a mercenary. Regrouping back at their camp, Ike was congratulated by his fellow mercenaries. Also living here was Mist, Ike's younger sister and the keeper of of their mother's last memento, a medallion which she always had on her, one that would mysteriously glow from time to time. After celebrating his achievement and finally being allowed to start, Ike set out on his first job the very next day, and over the coming days, the young swordsman would overcome challenge after challenge, dealing with bandit raids and putting down some pirates who were harassing a local coastal town. Ike's life was a dangerous but a comforting one, and the actions of the Grail mercenaries gained them a reputation as being an extremely upright and honorable band of heroes for hire. While life would surely have gone on as happily in the years to come, the return of another member of their group, the mage Soren, brought with it some disturbing news. The land of Crimea, where the mercenaries resided, was under assault by the kingdom of Dayan to the east. This presented a dilemma to the Grail mercenaries, who were based in Crimea, yet were technically neutral. Ike was placed at the head of a scouting party, sent in order to better understand what the actual situation was like in the Crimean capital of Melior. While out on the mission, the fighters were surprised to find the aftermath of a great battle between standard Dayan troops and the soldiers of the Crimean Royal Guard. Just off the path nearby this deadly scene, Ike's mercenaries discovered a frail young woman, weakened from an earlier encounter. Without knowing her identity, Ike and the crew rescued her, bringing her back to their camp in order to recover. Once the girl finally regained consciousness, she introduced herself surprisingly as the Princess Alencia of Crimea, a royal child who had been hidden from the general public's knowledge due to a conflict of her inheritance. The young girl was able to confirm that her father and mother, the king and queen, were now dead. And soon the mercenaries would learn that the next in line for the throne, her uncle, Lord Renning, had passed away as well. With no one else to turn to, the princess's fate was left at Grail's mercy, and though he wondered if he could truly believe the young girl's claim of being the princess, the sudden appearance by Dayan soldiers demanding her to be turned over convinced the mercenaries of the truth of her story. Realizing that Dayan was setting up an ambush regardless of their cooperation or not, the Grail mercenaries full power was set on display to the soldiers, causing an unexpected rout and victory for Ike and the princess's new defenders. With Dayan now in pursuit, the group had no choice but to leave, following the princess' advice to flee to the nation of Gallia, a mysterious land to the south where a race known as the Lagus, who were beings capable of transforming into tremendous beasts and gaining great strength, ruled the forests within. Part of the way through the group's flight to the south, Grail set off to distract their foe while Ike led the others further. After reaching the safety of a fort close to the border and sending Alencia on ahead to Gallia, Ike went back to ensure the safety of his father. During his journey back, Ike's small group became cornered by the forces of Petrine, a renowned Dayan general and part of the Four Riders, who were King Ashnard of Dayan's strongest forces. Ike's rescue attempt was ironically salvaged only by the man whom they had been seeking, as Grail arrived and personally challenged the arrogant rider, who both relished the chance to finally let loose with their full strength. 
As Ike witnessed his father outmatch his enemy, Petrine refused to give up, calling in her own reinforcements to surround the father and son. It was at this moment of peril that, thanks to the aid requested by Alencia ahead in Galia, several beast warriors suddenly arrived, evening the odds between the two forces. Just as a much larger battle was set to take place, from out of the shadows stepped a towering knight, clad all in black armor, who commanded Petrine to stand down and oddly allowed Grail and his son to depart. Following this strange encounter, Ike's group returned to the fort in order to rest. As night fell and the others drifted off to sleep, Ike noticed his father walking silently away from the fort. After joining him and talking with his father amidst the trees, Grail suddenly stopped, noticing that something was amiss, and then directly ordered his son to go back. With Grail proceeding forward into a clearing, a curious Ike secretly followed after him. Hearing the clanging of blade on blade, the young man discovered his father locked in combat with the mysterious Black Knight. During a break in the combat, the Black Knight threw a sword to Grail, encouraging him to use it in order to fight him. Refusing this gift, Grail continued to fight with his axe. Yet, despite the mercenary leader's great skill, a thrust from the Black Knight suddenly pierced through him. Just as Ike rushed over to support his father, the Black Knight coldly asked for the location of some object, which Grail refused to reveal. As the knight moved on to threatening Ike, the duo was only saved due to the sound of a great roar, which signaled to the Black Knight that the Beast King of Galia was watching him, ready to intervene. Seeming to find this concurrence of great power and amusement, the Black Knight chose to depart, leaving the young Ike to carry his mortally wounded father back to the fort. As the young man and father walked arm in arm, Grail spoke, using his last words to entrust command to his son and to wish him and his daughter to live on in safety. The next morning, Ike and Mist stood at the grave of their great father, as the others in their camp reeled in shock. Putting his mourning to the side, Ike became determined to keep going anyway, stepping outside the fort to find a group of Danes had caught up to their location. Despite doing their very best, the few members of Grail's mercenaries proved to not be enough this time. But thankfully, the group was, again, saved by the sudden arrival of Gallian fighters. Thanks to the intervention of these two, the group was able to proceed at a greater pace, and before long, Ike and his company at last arrived at the Gallian capital. Within, they were able to to meet King Cunegus, who warmly welcomed the group and the Crimean princess into his protection. Although the Great Lion King wished to take a permanent guardianship of Valencia, respecting the good relations he had maintained with her father during his lifetime, the political climate of his nation currently forbade it, as it would seem to the statesmen of Gallia as if the king were intentionally antagonizing Dan and giving them a reason to attack them. Complicating this further were the negative relations that still remained between the Lagoose and the Bayork. There were word for humans. Alencia's best hope instead was to seek help from the Binyan Empire to the Far East, in order to ally them with her cause before Ashnard could launch an assault on Gallia, an action that would likely cause the Binyans to side with Dayan out of their racial connection. In such a situation, the other Laguz tribes, including the bird tribes of Phoenicus and Kilvis, and the dragon tribe of the secluded Goldoa, would likely also be dragged into this conflict in order to help their Gallian cousins. In order to reach Binyan, Ike and his mercenaries had to return to Crimea once again in order to book passage on a ship, stopping along the way only to raid a local prison. Assisting them in this break-in was the thief Volk, a shady character who had been working for Grail before his death. Volk claimed to Ike that he had retrieved some kind of important information that Grail requested, but would only reveal it to him for an outrageous price. While releasing the Crimean prisoners of war, Ike happened to meet a man named Sephiran, a self-proclaimed pilgrim who had been captured for assisting some local Crimean soldiers. After Ike set this man free and bolstered his forces with the freed Crimeans, the group arrived at Port Toha. Here, they were to meet with a man named Nasir, who had a ship ready to take them to Binyan. Despite them trying to keep a low profile, an accident in town revealed their Laguz escort Ranolf to the townspeople, causing a disturbance that alerted the local Dayan forces to Ike's group. After fighting their way onto the ship, Ranolf stayed behind to guard their departure, fighting off even the Black Knight who had appeared in the town. Despite losing their duel, Ranolf was rescued by the pilgrim Sephiran, who recognized the Black Knight's true identity and assured Ranolf that the knight would never raise his blade against him. Now at sea, Ike, Mist, Alencia, and the others could only hope and pray that putting their last hopes in the Empire of Binyan was the right course of action. Hopefully, this would bring them the salvation they had been fighting for.
After the many hardships that Ike and his crew had gone through to get here, the gentle days at sea passed with safety but boredom. Nasir warned the group that these steady, safe days at sea would not last for long, because soon their ship would pass by the territory of the Hawk and Raven Lagoos clans, some of which had taken to piracy, as well as other questionable contract work. Just as the ship was sailing into these perilous waters, suddenly it stopped in place, having lodged itself into a reef below the water. This happened just as a group of Sky Corsairs intended, and Ike again found himself fighting defensively against a foe coming from all directions. After surviving the pirate attacks, he ventured on the land nearby to try to find a way to extricate his ship from the reef, an action which Nasir tried to stop but was unable to prevent, as he was actually trespassing on Goldoa, a closed land that did not take kindly to unwelcome guests. The noise of the recent battle with the Sky Pirates had aroused the attention of the natives, who were Lagoose of the Dragon Tribe. Though the punishment for trespassing into their land was death, the prince of Goldoa, Kurthnaga, just happened to be there, and he swiftly forgave the blunder of Ike, and instead took the moment to enjoy the chance to converse with an open-minded Bayork. After this friendly encounter, at Kurthnaga's command, three of his companions transformed and began to pull the ship from the reef, and before long, the princess and her guardians were on their way again. As the ship neared their destination of Binyan, they happened to chance upon a different ship in peril. After assisting the Binyan soldiers against the forces of Dane and their allies the Crow Lagoose of Kilvis, who had been hired by the captain, Ike returned back to his vessel only to find that Soren had discovered a little girl hiding aboard. Despite her small stature, the girl spoke with great authority, as she slowly became more and more frustrated with the mercenaries' ignorance of her. When she could no longer take any more, this girl suddenly revealed that she was Sanaki, apostle and leader of the entire Binyan Empire. Despite the offense first taken, Sanaki was familiar with Alencia and welcomed the group into her care, if only just to hear their claims and judge the validity of them. After docking at the castle, Sanaki welcomed them into her palace. Unfortunately, the simple and straightforward nature of Ike made him extremely unfit and uncomfortable in the theatricality of the royal court, and after becoming openly flustered and frustrated with Sanaki's probings into the truth of Alencia's identity, the apostle revealed that she was merely testing them and that the the man known as Sephiran had already spoken for them. In actuality, he was Duke Belsis, the Prime Minister of Binyan, and the Apostle's closest advisor. After Sanaki dismissed the Crimeans in order to deliberate what to do with them, Ike and the others accustomed themselves to their new lodgings. Though the following days were uneventful, eventually the Grail mercenaries were given a task, issued out by Sanaki herself. Believing that appeasing her would help to persuade Binyan to their cause, Ike and company quickly set themselves to the task the Apostle placed before them. Their first job had them confronting a trade caravan, an operation which was a smokescreen for their actual product, the transporting of Lagoose slaves. Just as Ike's group began battling with this despicable crew, elsewhere in the continent, the kings of the Lagoose tribes were assembling. Arranged by the dragon king Degencia of Goldoa, for the first time in a long time, King Cunagus of Gallia, King Tibarn of Phoenicus, Prince Racin of Serenus, and King Nesala of Kilvis were assembled, and together they spoke of the recent Bayork proceedings and of the flight of the Crimean princess. Of the topics covered, the most critical was Gallia and Goldoa's request for the other tribes not to engage in outright war with Dan, even if Gallia was attacked. Degencia especially knew that this would lead to Binyan being being lost as an ally and igniting a war between all Bayork and Lagoose, something which was a real danger outside of the violence itself due to an object named Leron's Medallion still being somewhere out there in the world. Jumping back to Ike, after completing his first task for the Apostle, he was then hired to eliminate a second bandit threat in some nearby ruins. As Ike proceeded through the harsh desert and battled this foe, elsewhere the King of Kilvis, Nesala, had convinced Prince Racin to join him to discuss what actions he may want to take against Binyan. Raisin, along with his father, was one of the last remaining Heron Lagoose after a terrible event which happened 20 years prior. That day, known as the Serenus Massacre, saw the people of Binyan invade the Heron's home forest and begin burning it while slaughtering nearly all of Raisin's tribe. Though Nesala presented himself as a friend, in truth he was willing to do almost anything to advance his position and the power of his nation, and his meeting Raisin here was actually a trap he had set up for the unfortunate prince, whose beautiful white wings and delicate features were sought after by one of the highest Binyan court members directly involved in the Lagoose slave trade, Duke Oliver Tennis, who, let's just say, appreciated beauty to an extreme degree. 
After Ike and his mercenaries finished defeating the bandits in the desert, they stopped their assault after learning that they were in fact not bandits, but instead a local group of Lagoose who were fighting for the liberation of their enslaved tribesmen. After sparing them and returning to the Apostle, Ike and the leader of the Liberators realized why Sanaki had sent them on these specific missions. Through her subtle actions, Ike and company had realized the corruption happening within Binyon, and that the Apostle herself could not eliminate it alone. Instead, by giving them these missions, they had already dealt the first blow against it themselves. With a new understanding between Ike and the Apostle, Sanaki next sent them to investigate the mansion of Duke Tanis, where they quickly discovered the captured Prince Rayson and struggled with his guards while the Duke fled. After freeing Rayson, instead of receiving gratitude, Ike was harshly rebuffed by him, who then flew off to his home of Serenus Forest, planning on taking drastic action against the humans. This was also where Duke Tanis had fled, and with Within the massive forest, Ike's group was closing in on him. As these three were making their way through the burnt remains of the Heron's home, unbeknownst to any of them, King Tibarn of Phoenicus was also arriving, having heard of Raisin's fate from an advisor to Nesala. After finding the prince above the trees, the king learned of Raisin's plan to sing what was called the Dirge of Ruin, forbidden magic that only the Heron tribe could perform at great personal sacrifice. Before Raisin could go through with this, an event happened that no one could have predicted. After fighting through some of the duke's men, from out of the trees, very close to Ike, a female Heron Lagoose, speaking only in an ancient tongue, suddenly approached and then collapsed on the ground in front of them. With everyone stunned to find another survivor of the Heron tribe massacre nearly 20 years later, Ike lifted the girl onto his back and began to risk his own life to protect her. Seeing this human fighting other humans, all to protect a Lagoose he didn't know, stunned Tibarn and even Prince Rayson. And despite this going against everything they had known before, without a second thought, they all joined on the battlefield together, fighting alongside Ike and his mercenaries. This nigh unheard of meeting of minds between Bayork and Lagoose, which had been unknowingly brought together by the natural compassion of Ike, was the turning point in the fate of the entire land of Tellius. Following the battle, it was Prince Rayson who approached Ike, stunned beyond words to find the girl he saved was indeed his lost sister, Leon who had been protected by the forest itself after all these years. What shocked the Hawk and the Herons more so was that this act of compassion by Ike was in truth originated at the behest of the Binyan Apostle. And now Sanaki arrived, proving the sincerity of her compassion and her people's regret by prostrating herself before Prince Rayson, an unthinkable act for the Empire's holy leader to do. Through the kindness displayed in the Serenus Forest, a bridge between the two races had been built. After Prince Rayson agreed to his sister to abandon his revenge, the two began a new song, singing life back into the forest and beginning the true healing process. Through Ike's efforts, he had helped to make Sanaki's dream come true, and in return, she pledged to back Princess Alencia, setting what forces she could spare at the command of Ike. Coming along with him would be Prince Rayson, who not so long ago couldn't even bear to be helped by him. And on top of this, even King Tibarn of Phoenicus granted him two of his most powerful and trusted allies. At Princess Alencia's request, Ike reluctantly accepted the title of General of the Crimean Army. They had come a long way together, yet the Mad King Ashnard was still out there. The Black Knight was still out there. It was time to turn this war back onto Dayan. The newly appointed Lord Ike at last was on the offensive. With an army of Binyans, Crimeans, Lagoose, and even some Dayans behind him, the new force set out by land, crossing the border and marching straight into the country of Dayan. Here again, his army encountered Nesala, the king of Kilvis, who had sold his services to Dayan in order to advance his nation. Although the king was a mighty opponent, it was words rather than brawn that bested him, for as soon as he heard that the second heron, Lian, had been rescued by Ike, he could no longer pledge his forces against him, and quickly abandon his former contract. After capturing a nearby fort, the Crimean army found a massive store of gold, and though Ike used most of it to pay and resupply his army, he took some of it and approached the thief Volk, finally giving him the 50,000 he had asked for, for the information that he had gotten for Grail. In truth, there was no information. It was a trick. Yet, in an act of at least some compassion, Volk did provide some very useful information. 
He was not by trade a thief. In actuality, he was an extremely dangerous assassin. He had come to know Grail after the man wished to hire him for his services as a killer, not as a spy. He then revealed to Ike that at one point, his father was known as Gawain, and he was one of the four Riders of Dayan, perhaps the most powerful man of his age. At some point, he and his wife Elena had fled their homeland, with her carrying a special medallion that they wished to keep hidden. This was no mere trinket. Rather, it was an item that contained a sealed dark god. It was known as Laron's Medallion to some, and the Fire Emblem to others. When touched by those without a specific balance of order and chaos inside, it would cause them to become enraged and monstrous in power, an incident which Grail experienced by accident. As he raged, berserk, and killing with little thought, his wife Elena stepped in front of him to try to calm him down. When his mind became clear, he found that he had pierced his sword completely through her. Horrified by the murder of his wife by his own hand, Grail slashed the tendons in his sword hand, purposefully ruining the great sword skills which had made him a legend. Having now been brought down to Volk's caliber, the assassin agreed that if Grail were to ever go mad again, he would be the one to stop him. Like their mother, Mist was one of the few people able to touch the medallion safely. Yet, only a few days after learning the truth, Ike was approached by an extremely distraught Mist. The medallion had suddenly gone missing, as if it had been stolen right out of their camp. Although this was a troubling development, Ike had to keep focused on the task at hand, and before long, he arrived at the Dayan capital of Nivasa, expecting to find King Ashnard within. What awaited Ike was not the king, but instead an ambush of some of the country's finest soldiers, including a young mysterious girl named Inna waiting on the throne. In an act that surprised everyone, even the Dayan general stationed within, Inna revealed herself to be a dragon lagoose, and for the first time ever, the Grail mercenaries faced the terrifying danger of a dragon's true power. Despite her being their toughest opponent yet, eventually even Inna was bested by their group. It was then that Nasir appeared, inexplicably coming to the rescue of the cornered girl. Holding back Ike's company until Inna was safely away, Nasir then allowed himself to be captured, revealing that it was also him who had stolen the medallion and passed it to Inna so that she could deliver it to Ashnard. As a shameful Nasir became silent, he did give the group one hint, saying that they should next visit Palmini, a shrine within Dayan. Before leaving to investigate what this place was, Ike's first group of reinforcements from Binyan arrived, with General Zelgius warmly greeting him. Leaving Zelgius to hold the capital, Ike's group investigated Palmini Temple, and after removing some bandits who were holding the local priesthood captive, they found the reason for Nasir's mysterious hint. At one point, one of the rooms within the shrine had been used to hold a prisoner, and from the ancient writing on the wall, they could tell it was a heron. Through reading the words written, Prince Rayson was able to identify that the unfortunate one was none other than his older sister Lilia, who had spent her days in this room until her death. Amongst the writings, he also found found out that she had been holding Laron's medallion, and had entrusted it, as well as a special song, to a blue-haired, blue-eyed Bayark woman who worked at the shrine. This woman was Elena, Ike and Miss' mother, and with this knowledge, the siblings were finally able to piece together why Grail and Elena had fled Dayan. They had been told to teach the song and hand the medallion to a girl named Altina, but before ever finishing their goal, Grail had mistakenly touched the medallion and gone on the rampage that ended Elena's life. Due to Grail having no leads on who this Altina person was, he then set up his company in Crimea and attempted to eke out a living as the leader of a simple mercenary band. In order to honor both of their parents' sacrifices, Ike and Mist agreed to retrieve the medallion again and find this Altina, all so they could fulfill the promise that both of their parents had died for. After returning to Castle Navasa, Ike passed the sovereignty of the country of Dane to the Apostle through handing powers to General Zelgius, and then he finally set out for his final goal, the return of Princess Alencia to the Crimean capital, and the defeat of King Ashnard and his Black Knight. In order to get back into the country of Crimea, Ike's group had to pass through a bridge connecting the two, and although he suffered a few pitfalls along the way, he was able to confront General Patrine who was guarding it, and arrive back in their homeland yet again. After merging the surviving Crimean forces into their army, that night Ike left his encampment, finding the Black Knight waiting for him outside. Feeling he was finally ready, Ike challenged the man, but quickly found, just like everyone else, he could do nothing to even so much as scratch the knight's armor. 
It was the Black Knight himself who explained why, revealing that his armor had been blessed by the goddess herself, and that only a similarly blessed sword, such as the one he had attempted to give Grail during their duel, could do any damage to him. Giving Ike one more chance to challenge him, but with an appropriate weapon, the Black Knight left, and the following day, they began their approach on the capital, finding a massive number of Dayan troops holding two forts directly in their path. To help them get past this heavily fortified position, King Tibarn reunited with the group and agreed to distract one with his forces while Ike and his troops took the other. When everything was ready, the largest clash of the war took place, with the Dayans of Ike's fort being led by the mysterious Bertram, another one of the four riders. By the end of the day, even he had been defeated, along with roughly half of Dayan's forces just as planned. After reconvening with Tabarn, the Hawk King told Ike of one knight clad all in black, whose power was beyond anything he or the others had witnessed, who Ike instantly recognized as the Black Knight he had been seeking. And Ike knew it was time to utilize the weapon he had been hiding since the night of his father's death. Ragnell. With this in hand, he was now ready to face the knight. And the very next day, Ike assaulted the second fort, eagerly anticipating the moment for him to unsheath the Ragnell and stand on even ground with his father's killer. Finding him inside as expected, Ike intended to duel him alone but nevertheless found his sister Mist joining in to watch his back and to heal him. As expected, the Black Knight was no normal foe. Yet as Ike and the Knight's holy blades clashed back and forth, the seemingly untouchable tank of a man suddenly began struggling to keep his footing, before finally collapsing to the ground. Finding an injured Inna beyond the Knight, whom Ashnard had ordered killed for her failure, Nasir, who had somehow escaped his bonds, had arrived to also assist them, and together the group safely escaped, leaving the Knight to be buried by the rubble. Feeling it was now time, Nasir revealed his identity, explaining that he was one of the dragon tribe, and despite his looks, was actually Enna's grandfather. The girl had had someone very close to her kidnapped by King Ashnard, and Nasir had only helped the Danes in order to keep Enna and her loved one safe. Naturally, Ike forgave his former friend, and with this, the two dragons joined with the Crimean army in order to help them stand up against the remainder of Dayan soldiers and to defeat King Ashnard themselves. As the siege of Princess Alencia's former home began, inside the castle, they found King Ashnard taking to the field himself, anticipating his battle with Ike while practically ignoring the princess. During their fight, King Ashnard revealed his intentions. For many years, he had been seeking to free the Dark God from Laron's medallion, knowing that its release would bring destruction to the world. The Mad King wished to cause such an event so that he could wipe away the weak from the world all at once, and instead lead a new society where only the strong could survive. It was to this end that he had kidnapped Princess Lilia of the Herons during the Serenus Massacre 20 years back, not knowing that only the one known as Altina could release the god. It was also to this end that he had instigated the war now, hoping to cause enough chaos and bloodshed so that the god could still be released even without Altina's song. For as long as he could be allowed to live, he would never stop seeking this goal. And so the only answer now was for the heroes gathered to finally put him down for good. As once again, Holy Blade struck Holy Blade, Ike and all of his friends fought on, until finally a mortal blow had been struck on the Mad King, and Ashnard slowly sank in his seat. Refusing to give up, even with his life draining out of him, Ashnard attempted one final revenge, taking out Laron's medallion and touching it, which instantly sent him into an all-powerful berserk rage, yet somehow he still kept his sanity. After taking on and defeating this berserk Ashnard again, at long Long last, the terror of his reign was finished. Slumped on the floor, away from the king's body was his mount, Rajion, which Inna surprisingly threw herself towards, embracing what the others had thought was a simple wyvern. Rajion was actually a dragon Lagoose and Inna's mate who had been driven mad through Ashnard's Lagoose experiments. Suddenly, the voices of the herons, Lian and Raisin, rang out once more. Through their healing magic, Rajion had been restored. 
At long last, the two dragon lovers had been reunited. Finding Leron's medallion on the ground nearby, Mist safely recovered it, before eventually giving it back to its rightful owners. As peace returned to Crimea, Alencia was named the queen. Speaking with Sephiran, who suddenly reappeared yet again, Ike and Mist were able to learn that the mysterious Altina they had been seeking was in fact the current inheritor of the bloodline of the Apostle, none other than Sanaki. Despite having some journeys still ahead, Ike, Mist, Queen Alencia, and all of their many allies, both Bayork and Lagus, continued to strive to make the future ahead of them a radiant dawn for all. Path of Radiance was meant to be a significant step forward in storytelling and presentation for its series, and without a doubt it was. It was also a lot more. I had high hopes, to be sure, but the multitude of ways in which this game exceeded its predecessors was not something that I was quite ready for. To just get the obvious out of the way. For a series which has primarily told its story through top-down angles without a moving camera or much flair, the introduction of the CG cinematics, which were done by the acclaimed producer Digital Frontier, was a breath of fresh air. And although the English voice acting in these was acceptable at best, each of them was a treat to see. On top of these, as was dabbled with before, still art scenes are used throughout the story, which continue to do a great job at establishing some of the game's most important scenes without resorting to full-on pre-rendered video. I'm a big fan of putting this art into the scenes, and I love how their usage in conjunction with the dialogue gives the game a bit of a visual novel feeling. Although it's easy to talk about this big step up in presentation, one of the biggest challenges with fully covering what intelligent systems came up with here is the sheer scale of this story. Honestly, it's impressive that a plot this dense was also built to set up a second game. There's so much going on here, most of which is resolved satisfactorily, that it gives me great respect for the writers who clearly spent a very long time fitting it all together. Not to mention the translators who just as obviously poured in a lot of love in to bringing this story into English. Since this game is the first in a new setting, there is a ton of world and character building to do, something that this series has actually consistently excelled in. We have the introduction of our protagonist Ike, the fleshing out of his relationships with his sister and the other mercenaries, the introduction of Tellius and its many countries and major inhabitants, which also includes a completely new kind of race that features prominently in the story, which in and of itself is split into multiple tribes and nations. On top of this, there is a lot of backstory to get through through, such as the burning of Serena's forest, and how this played into multiple story threads that we experienced in-game, such as King Ashnard's evil plan which began there. On top of that, we have Crimea's relationship with Galia, the assassination of the previous apostle, the different bird tribes' relationship with each other, the history of the goddess and the flooding of the world, and on and on the list goes. This actually brings me to one of my first points. A lot happens in Path of Radiance. Even compared to most other Fire Emblem games to this point, FE9 is a very long game, and a large amount of that time will be spent on simply reading the story, which is extremely, and some might say excessively, text heavy. I learned this quite clearly in my blind playthrough streams, where I sometimes had to stop reading aloud in order to just rest my voice or from sheer fatigue. Now, I do really love games which take their time to fully flesh themselves out, but the sheer amount of writing here can easily become excessive. Fortunately though, there are some ways where FE9 alleviates this and keeps its story from becoming a twisted mess. One of the best of these comes right away, and by this I mean Ike. During the development phase, one of the most requested features by the male staff members was for the next game's protagonist to be a mercenary rather than a royal, which is why Ike is the first Fire Emblem lead to not be a lord right off the bat. Besides the perspective shift this brought, entering the story from Ike's vantage point does a great job at easing new players into the world of Tellius, without necessitating cramming in the history and its current political climate right away. We spend the opening just doing jobs for Grail's mercenary company. It even takes takes a couple of chapters until we see our first map of the world and find out where we've been this whole time. As Ike's path takes him into Galia and beyond, like us, he's learning about these places for the first time, and having them explained to him in practical terms. Having the solid foundation of a protagonist for players to inhabit like this makes the massive amounts of information presented to the player across an entire playthrough a lot easier to swallow. For example, even if a player 
couldn't quite grasp how different the culture of Binyon was from Crimea, because we know Ike and can relate to his position, understanding can be achieved simply by witnessing his reactions to various aspects of Binyon society. A second way in which Fire Emblem 9 makes its scale more manageable is through the use of info scenes that become available at the base between chapters. These are additional conversations that often have no purpose besides fleshing out characters or each new setting. There are a few of these conversations which actually do give you some great rewards just for checking them out, such as items, new units, or access to the triangle attack. But, in a very wise move, these special conversations are marked and always have three stars. This is a great compromise. Players who are very into the story can read these in addition to all the others, while players who are more in it just for the gameplay can just check for three-star conversations and leave the others hanging. I would definitely recommend checking some of these out, because many of them turned out to be some of my favorite moments in the game. They offer a fascinating ground view look at the characters, and can also cover a wide range of tones. Going anywhere from melancholic, such as the scene depicting Titania's despair following the death of Grail, to outright humorous, such as the scene in which Ike attempts to get Volk to just eat his meals with everybody else so that Mist can stop worrying about it. Considering the amount of character development they offer, these extra conversations could have served as a decent replacement for the support system due to how they allow all players to learn about the cast and also don't affect your deployment options. This was not the case though, and the support system remains in, although with some very significant changes that we'll be getting into here and later gameplay chapters. When it comes to their impact on the storytelling, moving support conversations away from the battlefield and into the base was a very, very wise decision. There always was an uncomfortable suspension of disbelief that players had to do in order to enjoy any of the support content from prior entries. But one knock-on effect of this is that when your supports open up at the same time as info conversations, for players who are interested in reading all these, huge amounts of time can be spent between the battles. In some cases, I would see 30 minutes to an hour go by before actually beginning the next chapters. Part of what made this more than acceptable to me was this game's excellent cast of playable units, who easily stick out in memory due to how much effort is put into establishing each one very clearly. This was an issue that Fire Emblem 8 had. At a glance, its units would almost look like stock characters, but some had great writing to them locked behind support conversations. Thanks to how the Path of Radiance characters are included and fleshed out in the required story scenes, as well as the free development of the info scenes, without even taking supports into account, looking back on the roster now, I can fondly remember each and every one of them, which I think is a really good sign. First impressions should not be so easily thrown away. One recurring topic throughout this game, and seen in many of these characters' dialogue scenes, is the relationship between the Bayork and Laguse, and the history of atrocities between them. Trying to tackle racism is not a goal that many games would try to aim for, but I do think that Path of Radiance at least makes an admirable attempt. First of all, this isn't just some minor side issue. Many of the conversations have to do with misunderstandings between the two races, as well as how prejudice, scapegoating, and willful ignorance about other cultures can take us on a terrible path. This is quite literal in the story. King Ashnard's plan is to instigate what is basically a race war, which will directly lead to global destruction. And although of course we get to defeat his army in the story, special mention should also go to how his ideology is defeated through the peaceful bridging of cultures. Beyond this macro level, we also have smaller scale resolution, such as the conversations between Jill and Leth, which stand out as a particular high point of this game's development. Their conversations wonderfully tie into the progression of the plot, in order to show how both Bayork and Laguse can start to question their previous assumptions about each other after actually spending time with one another. They learn how, in many ways, they are more alike than different. For someone who has spent most of his adult life living abroad, this was very resonant to me. The reason why Path of Radiance is able to approach these kind of topics without becoming intolerable is likely due to its holistic approach to world building. Simple touches like having the Heron Laguse speak their own ancient language, considering what kinds of foods the Hawk tribes would actually eat, or even just giving the Lagoos their own word for humans, show how a lot more thought was put into the small details here, which compares it favorably not only to prior Fire Emblem games, but even to a lot of fantasy writing in general. This is something that a lot of other games and works could learn from. 
Even though the world building and presentation of this game really are on a different scale, there are still a multitude of areas which end up feeling rather underdeveloped that I want to mention. I can only hope that many of these end up paying off in Radiant Dawn, because they certainly didn't do so here. How about we start with the Black Knight? Finally, I know. Much like Darth Vader, in the context of only the first Star Wars movie, he mainly serves as this story's big, tough henchman who kills the mentor and does the dirty work of the villain in charge. It's good that he does have a bit more development to him, especially with how this story sets up the idea that he may have shifting motivations, as well as a history with Ike's father and Sephiran. But so far, I haven't had anything to say about the knight until now, because he's just such obvious sequel bait. You can't have this guy murder Ike's father and just never bring up his identity in this game. Even without having played the sequel yet, I can say for certain that he's still alive and they're not going to just leave this open, even though that would be pretty ballsy. Just as guaranteed to pay off next time is Leron's medallion. But to be honest, for as much time as spent unraveling exactly what it is and what it can do during this game's runtime, I was very surprised and a bit underwhelmed to find out that it built up to nothing more in this game other than adding an extra phase to the Ashnard fight in the harder difficulties. Obviously, this medallion story will go somewhere in the sequel, but setting things up for a sequel should never come at the expense of making a story feel whole right now, especially in critically important sections such as the ending. By this same merit, this also goes with the shooing in of the Rajion plot, which is inappropriately concluded immediately after defeating the final boss of the game. Stealing away the focus of the player's victory over the game's main villain, just to give resolution to a minor plot which could have just come during the epilogue. In a story of this size, a few oversights and issues don't really take away much from the greater whole, especially when it is such a constant joy to experience. Obviously, I really did enjoy the story of Path of Radiance, and though it didn't have any unforgettable gut punches like Genealogy of the Holy War, finally learning about the tale of Ike and the world which was crafted around him was an absolute absolute pleasure, and I would undoubtedly put this story up there as one of my favorites thus far. Naturally, I am really hoping for an equally excellent follow-up plot, but we are a ways off from thinking about that for now, especially when the many gameplay evolutions seen here merit so much more immediate discussion. Even though the development times determined Path of Radiance to be called Fire Emblem 9 and the Sacred Stones to be called Fire Emblem 8, I like to keep in mind that they were mostly in development simultaneously by separate teams within Intelligent Systems. Path of Radiance wasn't built for some of the big new systems of that game, such as adding branching promotions or an extended post-game. You can kind of think of both of these games as the sequels to Fire Emblem 7. But of course, being the big return to console gaming meant that Path of Radiance got most of the attention, which is likely why it brings a lot more new ideas to the table than the average entry. Let's just start off with one of the biggest changes first, the Lagoose, which basically takes the reoccurring Manakeet units from prior entries and broadens the idea. Transforming units like these have used many different mechanics in the past, and the Lagoose here actually work similarly to the Dragons of Fire Emblem 3, a style which actually hasn't been attempted since that game. Rather than being able to manually transform like back then, Lagoose here work instead off of a charging bar that is filled either through turns passing or them being attacked. And although they gain a massive amount of power when transformed, this is balanced by them being unable to fight back while untransformed. In this game, it's pretty safe to say that all of your Lagoose allies join your party extremely powerful, needing zero training to start immediately contributing a lot, some of which start battles already transformed, while others start out with little to no charge, thus giving them different periods of time where they're really effective in. Both the early Transformers and the late Transformers have their uses, but I found in general the characters like Leth, who starts out transformed, ended up being a lot more useful, as you can often finish a lot of maps before their transformation even ends. Or at the very least, keep up with the faster marching pace of your units and guarantee that they can quickly start doing something. Since we're bringing up especially good Lagoose right now, let's talk about Raisin, the only member of the Heron Clan that joins you. Unlike the other fighting Lagoose, he is able to to chant, which reinvigorates your units just like a dancer. But when he enters his transform state, he is able to do the same thing, but now for all four units surrounding him, just like the dancers from FE4. Dancer-type units are already good enough when they just give a single unit another turn. 
and after completing Genealogy, I felt for sure that no other game would bring back this mechanic. Nor would I have guessed that on top of this insane power, they would also just give that unit the ability to fly. Having a unit with this much utility is as ridiculously broken as it is fun just as it was in Genealogy. As long as you have your transform race and in range, you're basically getting four more units to use each turn, which needless to say can drastically swing things in your favor in little time. Getting off perfect four unit chance every time would be a lot more difficult without the one other feature which returned that also shocked me. And of course I'm talking about Kanto. Kanto refers to mounted units being able to use the rest of their movement ability after doing an action. I already covered this in detail on my Fire Emblem 4 video, and I also covered this in the Binding Blade video where I talked about that version, which doesn't give you your extra movement after attacking, was probably the most fair option. Rather than reiterate, I'll just say right now that the return of Kanto has some implications, and these are things that I can't say that I'm a fan of. The short version is the ability to Kanto completely alters the capabilities of mounted units, giving them a ridiculous benefit for little to no drawback. Here's how I see it. Whenever you order a unit to attack, their movement comes with an opportunity cost. For example, if you move your axe fighter forward to swing at a foe, it leaves him in the way of your other units. That enemy can't be attacked again at one range from the same tile. Decision making comes when you have to decide whether to block yourself with that fighter, or send a different unit in, choose to have them attack or not, as well as other details like the current terrain they're both on. Kanto kind of kills this decision making. Rather than using a foot unit, which can only make that one choice, you can do the same action with a mounted unit, and then use that extra movement to either put them directly into the next fight, send them backwards for a healer, or set them up for a race and quadruple play. I realize that there's technically no reason for the Fire Emblem series to try to achieve perfect balance. At the end of the day, it is a single player game, and the computer certainly isn't going to complain about unbalanced mechanics. At the same time, I don't think that a unit should have so much of its value instantly decided by a single factor. Although it took me some time at first, my experience with the series thus far has taught me the true potential of mounted units. Even without Kanto, they were already very, very good. I will never argue that these buffs make them unfun, just that there needs to be a valid counterbalance to make the choice of whether to use them or not an actually interesting one. Flyers are already excellent, but they do have to watch out for bows on occasion. Even with the return to double effective damage in this game, they do still get zoned out from time to time, especially on harder difficulties. Horse-mounted units, and especially paladins, have little regard for any checks and balances on their abilities. It's nice that they're locked to a single weapon type while still cavaliers, but are one of the classes in this game which are given a choice over which other weapon type to gain upon promoting, which allows them all to instantly get around their own weaknesses and continue overperforming. Little changes like this really call into question why they seem so eager to fix what wasn't broken, especially when this game features other questionable ideas, such as the removal of combat stats during animations, half-baked tedious stealth mechanics that only appear on a few maps, the complete absence of dark magic for little reason, as well as the separation of knives as a new weapon type for thieves and promoted mages, which are just uniformly awful. While we're on this down streak, I suppose it's time to bring up Biorhythm, a new feature that plays into absolutely every combat encounter in this game, but was almost something I forgot about when it came to writing this video. There's not too much to say about it really. Your character stats are minorly adjusted over time, following a wave-like trajectory. Their position on this Biorhythm chart moves forward one point with every ten battles, and move forward seven points after finishing a chapter. While it's in the green area, they have minorly improved hit and avoid, and while it is in the red area, the opposite. The intentions for this system seems like it was meant to be a lighter version of the Thracia 776 fatigue, meant to be a balancing force to make you think twice about fielding someone with bad biorhythm currently, and go for a different unit on that map instead. This doesn't lock them completely away like Thracia did, which many viewed as overly harsh, however, its weak implementation makes it easily ignored, which is why it often is. Even with some of these questionable introductions, there is a lot of positives still to get to. 
And before we move on to some of the larger ways in which Path of Radiance impressed, I would be remiss to not mention a few of the smaller improvements which I feel still made an impact. Unit Commands, a mechanic not seen since Fire Emblem Gaiden Return, but this time allow for more specific commands on top of the simple rally, and also have thankfully cut out the suicidal assault command of that game. It's not a feature that I used very often, but in the few moments that I wanted it, such as gathering all units at the end of a map for a safe boss clear, it was an invaluable time saver. Next, a very small change that I really liked, weapons can now be simply unequipped. This is best used for body blocking, such as putting a powerful unit in the way of an aggressor while still saving the damage and experience for someone else. This small feature also helps to remove the danger of accidentally killing recruitable enemy units without the need to go the roundabout way of doing this from before, where you have to remove all weapons from a unit's inventory. Last up, but certainly not least, is the shoving system introduced with this game that allows units who are not doubled in weight by an ally or enemy to push them one space away from themselves. Themselves. I didn't think much of this at first, but once I started putting it to use, the true tactical potential of it became clear. And although it can allow for minor adjustments to positioning, playing this into chains of shoves can allow you to pull off some remarkable plays. If you think about shoving in advance, even units who are unable to reach an enemy can either be made to, or instead use their turn helping another unit do so. Mounted units who cannot shove nor be rescued miss out on this mechanic, but of course, thanks to Kanto, they're just fine without. It. Even though it was the ninth game in the series, Path of Radiance still managed to bring a wave of changes to the battlefield mechanics. But despite the dramatic revivals and small improvements, it wasn't actually the place where this entry mixed things up the most. Roughly speaking, every Fire Emblem map can be broken into three parts. There's the preparation phase, where players manage their convoy and unit inventories, the story phase, which of course continues the plot and justifies the battle, and then there's the gameplay phase, where all the action happens. Despite it seeming like the gameplay section is the part that should receive the most development each game, my experience making this retrospective series has proved that sometimes simple adjustments to the preparation phase can be just as significant. Path of Radiance does this by introducing the base, a concept not too dissimilar from the My Castle system of genealogy. Once the base unlocks early into the game, players always return to this menu after battle, where significantly more can happen than just adjusting your inventory or using stat boosting items. Since I covered the info conversations in the story analysis section, let's start instead with the gameplay modifications to the support system, which is also accessed here. It was Fire Emblem 4 that pioneered the system of building supports. And although the idea of having units wait together for multiple turns was a fine one for a game with very long maps with so much to do and so much travel time on them, its carryover to the Game Boy Advance games was questionable due to the shorter maps and the number of turns required to grind affection points. As I said in the past, I think the system of tiered support levels is a very good one for this series, but passing turns while the objective of the map sits forgotten always felt like a compromise that I can't imagine anyone was really happy with. Fire Emblem 9 has changed all of that, because now support levels are only raised after having units deployed for a certain number of chapters together, a small tweak which has pretty dramatic results. Just by removing this meta system from the battles, we are returned closer again to the uninterrupted classic Fire Emblem style tactical gameplay. I really do love the idea of growing characters together as the story progresses, and then witnessing their private conversations and breakthrough moments, but the place for this support system on the actual battle battlefields should begin and end with how they affect your unit's stats. While we're here, I just have to say that it's a great change for the game to finally just show you how your characters are improved by being close to the support partner. Even though support bonuses still use a complicated system which involves mixing characters' affinities for a solid boost, transparency like this is something that I love. A little bit of information can really go a long way. The changes to the support system here are something that I think is going to seem very, very obvious in retrospect. I'm not so sure if the same can be said for the forging and bonus experience systems. Forging is a new mechanic which allows you to create your own custom weapons, paying pretty exorbitant amounts of gold to tweak them with improved damage, crit chance, accuracy, weight, and even allowing you to name them. Interestingly, you are also able to make a weapon worse, which, believe it or not, there are actually very good reasons 
reasons to do, such as giving a weakened weapon to a stronger unit so that they can reliably set up kills for other units at will. Given how much a forged weapon can push battles in your favor, I do think it was a smart idea to limit them to one forge per chapter, as well as to make it as expensive as it is. Even without an arena, Path of Radiance showers you in money, and forges actually give you something to spend it on. Next up, let's talk about the other big addition to the base, bonus experience. Following each chapter, Soren will give you a rundown on Ike's accumulated resources, including how much of this bonus experience is available to you. Naturally, this is experience that you are allowed to freely hand out as you wish, and though it is gained in multiple different ways depending on each chapter, in general, performing better on maps, such as finishing them with less wasted turns, will see a higher payout. The amount of experience gained varies with difficulty, but it isn't uncommon to suddenly find yourself with loads of it, allowing you to use it to power up or catch up whichever unit you wish. Like the skirmish battles of prior games, bonus experience is a powerful and easy to use tool, but proves itself the much better system due to it A being a limited resource that B actually rewards players for trying hard. The one downside of bonus experience is just how much it can cheapen the game's already pretty light difficulty, especially when used in conjunction with weapon forging. Add in the fact that this game introduces auto promotion, which means that any units who would be hitting level 21 go ahead and class change without needing to use a master seal. Combined power systems like this can allow any player to take a bad unit like Rolf and turn him into some kind of nerd slaying ubermensch that can really take over your game. Not that anyone would even bother doing such a stupid thing, of course. Even with this potential, I really do appreciate systems like this over innate buffs like Kanto, due to it giving decision-making power back to the player, rather than arbitrarily handing out extra value. This is why an item like the Night Ring, which sees its first return since Genealogy, is such a fantastic addition. This is an item that can grant the benefits of Kanto to any other unit, and there's just such a feeling of gravity and importance when you yourself are handing out such an enormous buff, not to mention a feeling of attachment to that specific unit. After all, you are the one that chose them, not the developers. Clearly, intelligent systems were aware of this kind of thinking, because the skills system here is built on this whole premise. Skills in Path of Radiance are mainly an evolution and nerfing of the same system that Thracia 776 used, with the potential to learn more through specific items. FE9 alters this by giving each unit a maximum skill capacity. A lot different costs to different skills. Skills can be removed, but when you do so, they are lost forever, which means that while you are encouraged to invest into your favorite units once you get a skill that works well for how you're using them, you can never make that decision lightly. New to this game are mastery skills, which can only be learned through the use of the rare occult scroll, which teaches a very strong skill to any promoted unit. These masteries are very expensive in capacity, but they have the potential to make your unit a lot more powerful, with one example being the Aether skill that can activate both Soul, a healing strike, and Luna, an attack that ignores defense. Not all skills are this powerful though, and there seems to have been an effort to balance these much better than before. And in some ways it does work. If we look at genealogy in Thracia's version of Astra, it basically just meant an instant kill on almost everybody. In FE9, successive strikes from this skill are now reduced in damage, toning down the previous damage total by about half. As far as I'm concerned, this is a fine change. Even if it was only double damage, this skill would still be more than welcome. While we have reasonable examples like that, other skills in this game can have much more questionable value. Something that we can see in the Sniper's Deadeye, which costs 20 capacity to allow one of the most accurate classes in the game to always hit, and have a skill divided by two chance to put an enemy to sleep. This is definitely not one of the more desirable skills out there. Cases like this make it feel like the developers were being way overly cautious to not let skills take over the combat, which although is definitely a wise course of action, it is one that happens to be very ironic due to the existence of Wrath with Resolve. Both of these skills work off a unit being at half health or less, which means that after a small setup, you'll be getting a nigh unkillable unit who is constantly landing critical hits. This combo alone practically contains enough potential to suddenly have one unit carry the late game. And I really don't think this is a developer oversight. Toroneo, a late game general who is perfect for such a combo due to his high defense, already comes with half of this puzzle. Another good target for this combo is Ike, but it's actually impossible to get him to learn both of these skills in combination until after a critical boss fight very late into the game. 
This whole situation shows a little bit of mixed priorities. While Intelligent Systems was willing to introduce great power with a steady hand keeping it in check, just in general, interesting cases like this are the exception, not the rule. Clearly, there has been a lot to bring up when trying to cover Fire Emblem 9's significance. It has taken me longer than any video I've ever created previously on this channel. But I think, at last, it's finally time that we wrap these myriad of topics into one conclusion. Fire Emblem 9 Path of Radiance was envisioned from the start to be the game that would launch the new era of Fire Emblem. And after examining everything that it brought to the table, I can say nothing to deny this. After a series of safe bets with the Game Boy Advance entries, it was incredibly refreshing to see intelligent systems bring out so many new ideas at once. In a way, it reminds me of the Super Famicom days of the series, and just how much Shozo Kaga and his team dared to innovate with every sequel. Like those early games, not every new system or story beat perfectly lands. But when considering my overall experience here, the blemishes that do exist blur painlessly into the background. What I will remember about this game is its fantastic main character, who gave a very fresh perspective for once. Plenty of memorable allies and villains who inhabit the most fleshed out world in this series. Of course, we have a huge wave of gameplay improvements, particularly in army management, and a great collection of maps which challenge the player in a variety of settings. I wish I could say that fair balance between the classes and snappy, satisfying animations were a part of this picture, but that's something that I can't. Compared to the rest of what this game brought to the table, these complaints are petty. Like Genealogy of the Holy War, this game suffers most from over-ambition, which I think is a noble fault to carry, and one which time and experience can rectify, which is why this is yet another entry that is perfect for a remake. Just like with Genealogy, whether it gets one or not, experiencing Path of Radiance in its original form is a journey well worth undertaking. I am very happy to say that my years of curiosity about Ike and his companions really did pay off. Discovering the depths of this game's accomplishments was an absolute treat, and Path of Radiance was yet another game for me to treasure on the wonderful path this series has set me on. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us back into Tellius, three years after the events of Path of Radiance. Be sure to join me next time as we jump into the tale of Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade, on their quest to save their homeland in Fire Emblem 10, Radiant Dawn. <laughs> On November 19th, 2006, Nintendo released what would become one of its most successful home consoles ever. From the moment it hit shelves, the Nintendo Wii took the public by storm, and over time, it accumulated one of the most diverse game libraries on the market, flush with both casual and more dedicated experiences. During the Wii's early explosion onto the market came the 10th entry in the Fire Emblem series, Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. This was a game with many priorities. On top of being the second 3D entry in the franchise, it was also the first truly direct sequel in the series. Over the years, Radiant Dawn has gained the reputation of being one of the most difficult Fire Emblem games. While few would call it as brutal to new players as a game like Thracia 776, it can be similarly unpredictable and unforgiving. Just as infamous as its challenge is its length, with a weighty yet surprisingly fast-paced story. Split into four parts, it is jam-packed with dialogue, events, exposition, and plenty of new characters and story revelations. After finishing what became one of the most enjoyable games in the series for me yet, I have been eagerly looking forward to getting to this entry. And at last, that day has arrived. As I always do, I went through this game twice. However, this time I actually bumped up the difficulty for the first time ever, meaning I went through once on normal and once on hard, for a very specific 
specific reason. With my experience from both of these playthroughs, on this episode of the Fire Emblem Retrospective, I'm going to be breaking down everything that I found. This is going to be an interesting one, and I definitely have a lot to say about this experience. So I hope you're ready for a long one today. Let's go ahead and get started on it. The creation of what would be the first planned sequel to a Fire Emblem game naturally started during the development of the previous game. I'll have to go back a bit in order to best set the stage. After Intelligent Systems felt they had thoroughly established the Fire Emblem brand through a series of three highly regarded Game Boy Advance entries, the debut of Path of Radiance on the GameCube was meant to be the first step towards becoming an even bigger Nintendo RPG staple on the home console. The gameplay, graphics, music, and story were all meant to be more epic than ever before, with the expected result being a tremendous return on their investment, and the gate being opened for many more console Fire Emblems to come. Sadly, this is not what happened. First of all, Path of Radiance released on the GameCube, which sold poorly, especially compared to its direct competitors. Microsoft's Xbox, and the highest selling console of all time, the Sony PlayStation 2. On top of being released late into the GameCube's lifespan, the amateurish seeming graphics and animations would have also made it less appealing to general audiences. It really is a shame, because Path of Radiance has definitely gone on to be very beloved by those who picked up and played it. But in so many ways, this was one of the worst times ever to release a major game on a Nintendo home console. It's no surprise then to learn that Fire Emblem 9 became the lowest selling game in the franchise, even selling slightly worse than Thracia 776. Although the sales numbers were not a total disaster, this was definitely not the big return to console gaming that Intelligent Systems had been hoping for. What's worse is, this was the game which they had hung everything on, including implementing multiple sequel hooks into the story, which essentially guaranteed that they could not change course now, and that their next game would have to follow up on it. At the very least, that sequel would have the benefit of not being developed for the GameCube, as it was instead planned to release on Nintendo's next console, which was then known as the Nintendo Revolution. The game's release date was planned to be as close as possible to the console's debut. Although, unlike a lot of other early Wii games, such as The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn would not be receiving both a Wii and GameCube version. This was due to a step up in the graphics, which they stated the GameCube was unable to handle. Other features of the Wii, like motion controls and Wi-Fi, were considered, but ultimately not implemented. With the benefit of hindsight, it's really easy to see how this whole plan was destined to fail, both by bad decisions at intelligent systems at the time, as well as completely unforeseeable market trends. Development for the 10th game went pretty much as expected. Directing this time was Taiko Kaneda, while Sinri Kita, who had given Path of Radiance's cast such a signature flair, returned to help help redesign not only its huge returning cast, but the many new characters who also made their debut. Digital Frontier once again worked on the CGI cutscenes, which this time focused on having a much more epic scope instead of depicting smaller scale scenes with only two or three characters. Proper translation was a huge focus in Path of Radiance, with translators working in tandem with the developers in Japan to make sure that everything came across with the same intent while still being accurate. There's no doubt that a lot of effort was also put into translating Radiant Dawn, but unfortunately this time a lot of errors slipped through. These would include things like skill descriptions listing wrong numbers, such as the text for the skill Resolve, stating that its benefit would only happen if a unit were at 20% or less HP, despite the actual number being 50%. This isn't all, however. Radiant Dawn, in Japanese, actually had two different scripts. Thinking that younger players would tend to choose the normal difficulty, the script for that mode was simplified, reducing the dialogue and overall complexity of the speech. Hard Mode and Above used an extended script, one that would appeal to older Japanese gamers able to understand it and enjoy more elaborately written scenes. Having different reading difficulty level options actually does make a lot of sense in a Japanese game, given how all students there spend years from elementary school and beyond learning hundreds and hundreds of kanji in order to get a standard reading level. Understandably, the English translation team didn't want to create two different scripts, or maybe they didn't want to split the scripts like the Japanese version did. 
Unfortunately though, the script that they chose to translate for all difficulty levels was the simplified version, something that remains a sore spot for many to this day. Just a quick note here, I'm not going to be going deeper into this script issue than this. Despite there being a lot more to break down here, the reason is quite simple. I only played the English versions, and my later analysis can only be built from what I myself experienced. So, as bad as these issues are, both of them seem trivial compared to one of the most horrendous oversights I have ever seen in translation. One that has continued to affect perceptions of this game for its lifespan. And of course, I'm talking about the complete mistranslation, arguably on purpose, of this game's difficulty options. This does require some explaining. Path of Radiance originally had three difficulty options, Normal, Hard, and Maniac. When bringing that game to the West, Maniac Mode was removed, and a new Easy Mode was invented and put in place. Radiant Dawn had no such changes to its difficulty modes. Instead, the names of the original difficulty modes were merely translated to be something different, seemingly just to keep its difficulty mode names congruous with what came before. So this meant that Normal was translated into Easy, Hard was translated into Normal, and Maniac was translated into Hard. The result of this change isn't hard to predict. The majority of players chose normal for their first runs, and were immediately thrust into an experience that was built around its players already being familiar with the game, to the point of almost expecting you to know what was going to be coming just around the corner. The text describing this difficulty mode does state as much, but this was likely not enough to persuade players to start with the option listed as easy. Following its release, in general, review audiences were quite mixed on this entry, with almost every reviewer bringing up its intense difficulty. While it would eventually surpass its predecessor's sales, it would not do so by much, only selling about 15,000 more copies, placing it squarely as the third worst selling game in the franchise. Yet again, Intelligent Systems had tried to immortalize their series on the console, and yet again they had failed. This is what a disaster looks like. The ramifications of Radiant Dawn's failure are a story for next time, but one thing that I feel needs saying is that sales have never been a marker for a game's true quality. There were a lot of improvements to be had here, and despite the lost franchise opportunities that mistakes in its planning and marketing strategy led to, the fact remains that nowadays, for many, Radiant Dawn is one of the most beloved Fire Emblems out there. At the same time, for many others, it's one of their least favorites. I guess I'll have to see where I land on this debate as we go on. Anyways, I think it's about time that we start breaking down the story of the game, and as always, I'll offer a spoiler warning here. The following synopsis of Radiant Dawn is going to be broken into four parts. However, these are not necessarily cut in the same way as the game's parts. If you already know the story of this game, or you don't need a refresher, then you can skip to the timecode at the top of the screen to get right to my story analysis section. On the other hand, if you want to avoid all story spoilers, you can use the timecode at the bottom to jump right to the start of my gameplay analysis, which from that point on will be totally spoiler free. Alright everybody, let's get started! In three, two, one. In the wake of General Ike's victory in the Last War, the country of Dayan had fallen apart. Ashnard, the Mad King, who had instigated the previous war, had finally fallen. And after his country was ceded to the Benyon Empire's rule, it had unfortunately gone through three years of turmoil, with many of the people struggling against their new authority and Benyon abuses of power becoming more and more frequent. Even as the situation in the north worsened, hope still remained for the battered populace, in the form of the silver-haired maiden. Mikaya and the Dawn Brigade she led. With the goal of freeing their homeland and restoring Dayan's independence, they struggled against the Holy Empire's control, utilizing guerrilla tactics to deal critical blows before disappearing with nary a trace. Protected by her close ally, the thief Soth, this band of heroes would often rely on Mikaya's strange power of foresight in order to help guide them. This along with a strange voice that she could sometimes hear. After avoiding yet another attempt at capture, Mikaya was led by this voice away from the civilization of Dayan into the nearby desert. At the end of her road, she eventually met up with another small group led here by a similar voice. Here she met Raphael, 
the older brother to Prince Rayson and Princess Leon, and yet another survivor of the Serenus Massacre. Along with him, they met his two protectors, members of the Wolf Tribe of Laguz, who originated far to the east of Tellius, in the Lost Kingdom of Hatari. After promising to guide their group towards Gallia, Micaiah made her way back into Dayan. Along the way, spotting a conflict between more Binyan soldiers and a small group of Dayan fighters. After coming to their aid, the Maiden found many of Soth's former comrades, all of whom were guarding a blue-haired young man. This man was Peleus, the supposed son of King Ashnard and heir to the throne of Dayan. Also backing this prince was the cunning, depraved Izuka, and the prince's mother, the Lady Almeida, who was the secret lover of the Mad King who had bore him a son many years before the war. Due to this remarkable meeting, Micaiah was naturally asked to join their effort to crown Prince Peleus, to which she ultimately agreed. With Micaiah at the head of the prince's forces, the resistance began to gain ground against the Empire's occupation. Soon, the group found Tormod, another friend from the Mad King's War, who was serving as a messenger from Benyon's ruler, Empress Sanaki. From him, they learned that much of the troubles in Dan were against her wishes, and in fact, she was ordering her forces to now stand down. Gerard, the leader of the Binyan occupational forces, who had been working with the senators of Binyan until this declaration, refused to follow Sanaki's orders. To try to gain control of the Dayan situation again, he went so far as to try to assassinate Micaiah personally in the dead of night, a vile plan that was only thwarted by the shocking reappearance of the Black Knight, the unstoppable armored warrior who had served the Mad King in the last war, who here apparently had survived his duel with Gen General Ike. After Micaiah was rescued by him, the Black Knight joined their cause, helping to pursue Gerard right up to the capital of Navasa, where he was finally taken down. In the wake of this victory, with Benyon pulling out, Dayan was finally free. In a short time, Peleus was crowned king, and after he signed an official document from Binyan recognizing their independence, his rule was legitimized across the continent. One of his first acts as king was to name Micaiah the General of Dane's military forces, a role which she accepted. Under the care of the silver-haired maiden and its new king, the nation of Dayan seemed safe at last, eagerly looking forward to the road to recovery ahead. They did not know that this victory was merely a stepping stone in someone else's plan altogether. Though the return of the King of Dayan was a cause for celebration in the north, throughout the rest of Tellius, and especially within Crimea, the return of the Dayan monarchy was a cause for concern. After surviving an unprovoked invasion three years prior, the long shadow of the Mad King's actions still hung over the people. The rebirth of Dayan raised the question. Were they planning to invade again, and if so, would their queen, who many viewed as weak, be up to the task of defending them? As these questions ran rampant through the country, a revolutionary army arose, with the intent to force Alencia to step down and allow their leader, Count Ludvek, to take the throne instead. Without the assistance of the Grail mercenaries, whose whereabouts were currently unknown, Alencia was forced to deal with the revolutionary plot herself, and sent two of her most trusted knights, Lucia and Joffrey, to stop Ludvig's plot. While the two knights managed to best some of the revolutionary army's allies, ultimately Lucia was captured by the enemy while Joffrey was lured into a diversion. This left Alencia all alone to defend against a direct siege, from which she did come out victorious. Although the traitorous Ludwig was jailed, he had arranged to have Lucia executed unless Alencia immediately stepped down. Despite the knight and the queen being as close as sisters, Queen Alencia proved her strength as a leader and made the hard call. She refused to cede power to a man such as Ludwig, even if it cost her friend's life. As the noose was strung around Lucia's neck, from a tree nearby, an arrow was suddenly loosed, cleanly cutting the rope. Although the brave knight Lucia fell from the execution stand, she landed in the arms of Ike, who had been waiting for just this moment for his mercenaries to burst out of hiding and finish off the rebels in one swoop. With an incredible swiftness, the revolution was quelled and Ike and Alentia were reunited at last. It was here that the queen informed her dear friend of the recent goings-on within Dan, 
and, quite critically, of the reappearance of the Black Knight. With the Crimean conflict settled, Ike and his mercenaries returned to their compound, but it was not long before they were soon approached by Ranulf, a Gallian warrior who had become close friends with Ike during the previous war. Ranulf brought news of Gallia's alliance with the other Laguz nations of Phoenicus and Kilvis, and of the conflict that would soon be underway against the forces of Binyan. The Heron Prince Raphael had returned, and revealed how his tribe had been framed for the former Binyan Empress's assassination, which had been used to justify the slaughter of his people decades prior. After an envoy from the Laguz nations had been shockingly murdered by Binyan, war was inevitable, and it was for this cause that Ranulf was here, requesting Ike's help. After agreeing to assist them, Ike joined with King Tabarn of the Hawks, King Nesala of the Ravens, and the King of Gallia's nephew and next in line for the throne, Skrymir. In the series of skirmishes that followed, the Laguz alliance inflicted heavy damage on Binyan while avoiding their main force, managing to cleverly outwit their commander, the tremendously powerful General Zelgis. Though the war seemed to be going their way, the tide of battle shifted suddenly when the Ravens of Kilvis betrayed the alliance and enacted a massacre on the people of Phoenicus. After losing the support of both allies, the remaining Gallians also suffered a heavy blow when the extremely hot-headed Skrymir accepted a private duel with Zelgius, a duel which he promptly lost. This resulted in a huge loss of morale for the Gallians, sending them into a mass retreat. During this series of conflicts, they also had to fend off the military movements of Dayan and its general Micaiah, who had inexplicably joined the fray on the side of Binyan. It was now up to Ike to lead the survivors of the Alliance away, choosing to take them through a dangerous cave system which they knew the majority of Binyan's forces would not be foolish enough to pursue them through. After breaking away from their pursuers, the group ended up in the Laguz nation of Goldoa, land of the dragons, and here they met the king, Degencia, who ordered them to return the way they came, despite this meaning their certain death. It was here that Anna and Nasir, allies of Ike in the last war, came to their sudden aid, convincing the king to let them pass through their country as a personal favor to Prince Rayson and Princess Leon, after using their powers to restore the king's son Rajion to sanity just before his death in Anna's arms at the end of the previous war. With their safe passage assured, the battered forces returned to Gallia, but it was not long before the Binyan army would catch up to them and finish them off in their own own homeland. Without any other option, the remnants of the Lagoose Alliance headed out to meet them, confronting the Binyan army within the land of Crimea, where Queen Alincia could only watch in despair at the violence that was about to happen. Before any new blood could be shed, the Queen made her move placing herself between the two armies and refusing to let them fight. With neither side agreeing to back down at this, Alencia then went so far as to lower her own sword, and place her life in both of their hands. If they still wanted to fight, they would have to cut through her first. Alencia's extreme commitment to peace impressed both sides, and soon both the Gallians and the forces of General Zelgius were willing to walk away from this conflict. Unfortunately, this was not true of the Senator Valtome who charged his forces forward anyway, even if it meant spilling the queen's blood. After his vile assault was stopped by Ike and the others, Baltome's forces retreated, and the enraged senator had General Zelgius seized, ready to have him executed for his refusal to assist them in the previous battle. Before this could happen, Empress Sanaki herself suddenly appeared, intent on halting the war at last. She revealed to all around that the senators had set this conflict into action on their own, and in fact had started claiming that she was a false apostle which had forced her to flee her own homeland. Binyan's military had effectively been split into two, with one side loyal to the senators and the other loyal to the empress. As Valtome fled, Sanaki joined her forces up with the Laguz alliance in the Crimeans, who all realized they now had a common enemy in the Binyan Senate, the perpetrators who had been responsible for all of the irrational violence that had thus far taken place. As the only man on Tellius who commanded respect from all of these different factions, Ike was elevated to the rank of general yet again. Much blood had been spilled in order to get to this point. Too much blood. As the new combined army began their march east, the medallion of Leron began to glow more and more. If the violence were to continue for much longer, the Dark God's release would certainly come soon. Stay 
Stepping back for a moment, following the successful revolution in Dayan, the ascension of Peleus seemed to signal a new era for the struggling country, but in truth was another trap by the senators of Binyan. The safety and freedom of Dayan's people was in fact even further out of reach. In ages past, a magical document known as the Blood Pact was sometimes used by the wise to control foolish leaders. This document, when signed, allowed the pact holder to see their will be done by the signer, with the consequences of refusal being the death of every citizen in the ruler's domain through a magical curse, which was in fact presented before Peleus. And after it was too late, the senator Lycane of Binyan revealed to the foolish young king his terrible mistake. It was due to this document that Dayan had joined the recent battles on the side of Binyan, who otherwise would have been their bitter enemy. Following multiple unnecessary battles with Ike and his allies, Soth and Micaiah were able to pry the truth from their king. After learning the details of the Blood Pact and their true threat, they knew they now had little choice but to continue fighting against Binyan's enemies, with the only thing they could do at the very least was to try to drag out the fighting so that they could have more time to research the Blood Pact and a possible way to get out of it. After King Peleus searched the archives, finally a secret way to cancel out the pact was learned, but it was a method that came at a tremendous cost. It stated that in order to nullify the contract, the document needed to be destroyed, or the pact maker themselves needed to die. Upon learning this terrible truth, King Peleus accepted his fate, and directly asked Micaiah to kill him. Although this method could have been tried, at the last second the maiden refused, stating that this method was too hasty and they couldn't be sure if it would work or not. Ultimately, they resolved to continue resisting Ike's group and obeying their callous masters until a sure solution could be found. Ironically, such a breakthrough would soon no longer be necessary. In one massive battle, the armies of all of the nations of Tellius met, pushing the chaotic energy of war to its breaking point. Princess Leon, who had been guarding Lebron's medallion, suddenly became overwhelmed by the chaotic energy and collapsed. As others similarly sensitive to this power also began to fall, Micaiah strangely wandered away from the battlefield, following the mysterious voice once again to the location of the medallion. As the leaders on all sides gathered at this site, they realized that at this point they had gone too far, and they had only moments until the Dark God would emerge and destroy the world. To avoid this fate, the current descendant of Altina, the Empress Sanaki, stood before the medallion and sang the Galdir of Release, which at the very least would release the god peacefully rather than at the fault of the bloody war. For some reason though, her song did nothing. After this, acting almost on instinct, Micaiah herself next stood before the medallion and sang the same song. There was no great eruption, however, something great and something terrible had just happened to the world. While the others struggled to comprehend what had happened, it was Soth who noticed that something was very different about Micaiah. Soon, he realized what was going on. The Dark God had escaped, and had been welcomed into the body of the Silver-Haired Maiden. Elsewhere on Tellius, a separate goddess, Ashera, had also just awoken. She was immediately greeted by a devoted follower who had been waiting for her return, who then informed her of the current state of the world. The people of Tellius, both Laguz and Beork, had not kept their promise to her. Only a short time after she had begun her slumber, conflict between the races had returned and so her judgment would be swift. While the possessed Micaiah could only exclaim for Ashera to stop, all throughout the land, the light of Ashera rained down, turning the masses, both innocent and guilty of the violence that had led to this moment, into stone. Within mere moments, the entire population of Tellius had become cold and still. Only the most powerful individuals throughout the continent had avoided this fate. As the survivors stepped out into the midst of a frozen battlefield, the being residing within Micaiah spoke. She explained that, in truth, she was not a dark god, but neither was she strictly good. She was Yune, the goddess of chaos, the counterpart to Ashera, the goddess of order. As she had slept, so had Ashera, and the same applied to their awakening. 
During Yune's sleep in the medallion, she had been around people very much, and had often been comforted by the heron songs, and over the years she had gained a much clearer appreciation of life. Ashera, on the other hand, had remained alone, resting within Benyon's Tower of Guidance, growing more and more unfeeling and detached over the years. They were meant to meet before passing judgment on the land, meaning Ashera had firmly set herself against her counterpart, and would violently oppose those who survived her judgment. With all other concerns put aside, the two armies who minutes ago were trying to spill each other's blood now stood side by side, ready to do whatever they could to bring back the world they had once known. The march to the Tower of Guidance was not going to be an easy one. Split into three groups, each army was forced to cut through waves and waves of Ashera's defenders, who had been made even more threatening through their goddess's blessing. After defeating anybody who stood in their way, the heroes of Tellius arrived at the tower, but found it fiercely guarded from within and without. With a massive army of heroes holding off Ashera's troops, Ike, Mikaya, Sanaki, and a small force stormed into the tower. Within, they found Senators Lacane and Hetzel, who had both played a major part in the wars that had been engulfing the continent before the Goddess's Judgment. With the defeat of Lacane and the destruction of his Blood Pact, the power that he held over King Peleus and Dayan was ended. Also on his person was a second Blood Pact, the one that had been used to force King Nesala and the Nation of Kilvis to betray its allies during the previous war. After moving up the next level in the tower, the group found themselves confronted by the one man that Ike knew he would eventually meet again the Black Knight. By now, the group knew who he truly was, none other than General Zelgius of Binyan. Having played both sides in the Mad King's War at the behest of his true master, here Zelgius wished for nothing more than a final battle with Ike, one which the hero eagerly obliged. This time cut off from all support, Ike and Zelgius' skills could truly go toe-to-toe, -to -toe. and as Ike's Ragnell clashed with the General's Allendite, at last the Son of Grail struck true, delivering a fatal blow. Despite their rivalry, the two departed on somewhat good terms, with Zelgius admitting that he he had only been seeking a chance to face the swordsmanship of Grail at its top form, something that he had longed for ever since his days of studying under the man. After both acknowledged the strange respect that they had gained for each other through striving to best the other, the Black Knight Zelgius finally took his last breath. Picking up the knight's holy sword, the group continued on stopping before the chamber that held their next opponents. Loyal to the goddess since times of old, the dragons of Goldoa and their king Degencia had chosen to fight for Ashera, creating an obstacle that no mortal power could overcome. To prepare them for this, the goddess Yune bestowed her blessing to all those present, and soon the dragons of Goldoa made their last stand, but ultimately all of them faced their defeat at the hands of Yune's champions. Before his death, Degencia left his kingdom to his son, and also apologized to Yune, revealing that it was him, through his long life, who had purposely rewritten history and tricked the current population into believing that Leron's medallion had housed a dark god of destruction instead of the truth of Yune and her connection to Ashera. Now, it seemed that there was no one else to stop their confrontation with the goddess. However, when arriving at the top of the tower, they found the door locked, and only one man guarding it. Sephiran, a figure who had cared for Empress Sanaki since her birth, had also been the man behind behind all of the Black Knight's actions. Through his abnormally long and mysterious life, he had orchestrated everything, including pushing King Ashnar towards his goal, and the Binyan Senators after the King's failure. A loyal follower of Ashera, Sephiran, or as he was known in ages prior, Leran, was ancestor to the current Heron tribe and the lover of the original Altina, the founder of Binyan. He had been alive since that time, faithfully serving his goddess, but over the years without her had become disillusioned after witnessing the Laguz and Bayork continue their history of violence. To stop the group now, he had linked his own life to the door which kept Ashera's chamber sealed, and with no other choice, Ike and his company were forced to cut him down. As his life left him, the door to the goddess began to open, 
Just before Sefiran's last breath, Yune and Mikaya acted quickly to bring him back to life, spending much of their energy to keep him alive. Yune had known Sefiran for very long and deeply cared for him, even as mistaken as he currently was. All she could do was ask him to reconsider, and to do what she had done, give the world a second chance. With Sefiran left stunned, the remaining defenders of humanity stepped into Ashera's chamber, ready to confront her at last. True to her nature as the goddess of order, Ashera was unwilling to be swayed from her judgment, and quickly threw up her own defenses against the gathered fighters. Shortly into this battle, Sefiran chose to join them, putting his life on the line to give humanity another chance, just as Yune had wished. Working together against the goddess's intense power, the group successfully managed to break through her barrier and were able to strike at her body. Using every last bit of power she had left, Yune empowered Ice Blade, and now the hero charged forth, successfully destroying the goddess with one final strike. With this blow, the fate of Tellius was changed. Those frozen slowly began to move, and even the Lagoos and Bayork who were still in battle lowered their weapons and now understood. Having gone all out to accomplish her goal, Yune realized that she too would soon be gone. Wishing farewell to those who had saved the world, the goddess of chaos disappeared, leaving Ike, Mikaya, Sanaki, and the many others to return back to their nations to try to pick up the peace which they had just secured for everybody. With time now to finally think and discuss, Sanaki at last realized Mikaya's true identity. She was, in fact, her lost older sister, and therefore the true empress of Binyan. Despite her right to rule above her, Mikaya instead returned to Dan, the land which she viewed as her true home. Upon returning, King Peleus stepped down, having realized his connection to the Mad King was little more than Izuka's deception. As the rulers of the various nations returned back to their lands, ready to guide those who followed them to a new era of peace, the hero Ike set off instead to seek out places unknown. Eventually, many, many years into the future, once again, a goddess walked the earth. United and reformed, the one known as Ashunera, the true combined form of both Ashera and Yune, found the one known as Sefiran waiting for her. No longer afraid of her power, or of those who inhabited her world, she was ready to guide her beloved creations towards a new radiant dawn. The same one which the Maiden, the Mercenary, the Queen, the Empress, and the many Bayork and Lagoos heroes of that time had shown her how to reach. Never before in this retrospective series have I been so torn on an entry story. To me, the plot of Radiant Dawn is a fascinating mixture of successes and failures. It is both overly verbose in its task of giving resolution to every last hanging thread that was put in place by the previous game, yet simultaneously slapdash in how these events were built up or take place in the game. Like Path of Radiance, there is a lot of story to go through here, but this isn't from its overly long info scenes and support dialogue on top of the mandatory story like that game. Here, the conversations are pretty straight and to the point, at least up until the final quarter of the game. For the rest of it, it's not hard to see how the simplified script really did direct the dialogue towards just justifying the immediate conflict rather than fleshing out the characters or the world at large. In the previous video, I wondered if the info conversations which were available between chapters could make for a decent replacement for support conversations altogether. Radiant Dawn has shown me that the answer to that is a big no. One of the biggest changes to get to here is the significant shift seen in the support system which serves now as a gameplay system rather than anything for story or character development. Characters now can only have one support partner, but can be paired with anyone in the entire cast, replacing the personalized dialogue scenes between supports with what are basically filler comments. Character development for the non-essential cast, especially for the brand new characters, is nothing more than a shadow of its former self. In the last game, even outside of support conversations, we had plenty of great scenes and writing to flesh out the greater cast, with a pertinent example being Leth. I did bring her up last time to talk about her great relationship with Jill and how it develops throughout the game, but even without this, she still made a big mark, 
From her first appearance with Mordecai, you instantly understood what her personality was. Here we just have so many characters to shove in that no time was spared for that. Comparing Effie 9 Leth to Effie 10 Leth paints a terrible picture, but putting her next to a Radiant Dawn original character like her sister Liar or the new Raven Laguz Vika definitely puts the degradation in character writing sharply into perspective. It really is a big shame too. I know I haven't gotten to my thoughts on the main plot yet, but the massively lowered effort in character writing really is a big deal to me. There actually aren't that many games that attempt to flesh out an entire ensemble of characters. It's far more typical to just give them paper-thin personalities and little to no development. Chrono Cross is one of my favorite JRPGs ever, and there are a few other games that better typify that trend. Still, after experiencing the great casts of games like Genealogy of the Holy War, The Blazing Blade, and Path of Radiance, I guess you can say that I've developed higher expectations for this series now, since I've seen it do so well before. So without really satisfying characterization, it is up to the plot to carry the weight of making this game a satisfying narrative, which is definitely something that Radiant Dawn has a greater focus on. I guess I'll just state my overall stance on the plot right now. I really do like the thrust of the story, and I found the surprise escalation into the apocalyptic scenario at the end extremely welcome. I really had a lot of fun experiencing this story, but this is not where my take ends. The more I think about it, the more I realize that a large amount of my enjoyment stems from the sense of attachment I gained to many of these characters in the last game. Ike may very well be the best protagonist thus far in the Fire Emblem series. I had a natural curiosity to see what became of him after finishing that tale, and that's part of why seeing him here as a fully grown, ridiculously muscular, absolutely beloved leader is really endearing. A big problem that I have with how this game was written is that this is where the development of Ike and others stops. If we take away the context of a player having experienced the previous game's story, then in Radiant Dawn, Ike is just another generically heroic, absolutely milquetoast Fire Emblem Lord. In fact, he may be even worse than this. After defending his homeland of Crimea, Ike actually has very little reason to be a part of the conflicts which we experience from his perspective. Despite how much time we spend with him here, he isn't the protagonist of this game. Mikaya is. Mikaya, unlike Ike, does have a direct connection to all of the major events that this game builds up. Part 1 is a great introduction to her life, the current situation with Dane, and the struggle of the Dawn Brigade to overcome their oppressors. It's basically an entire Fire Emblem game in miniature. All of it makes for a fantastic Act 1 and introduction back into this world. After all, in the last game, we had almost no perspectives from Dane. Starting things out here feels totally natural. Act 2 then takes this great opening and immediately muddies the water with an unnecessary yet shockingly brief section covering Alentia's handling of a Crimean revolutionary plot. I've heard this section of the story simply being called a setup for the introduction of the Grail mercenaries, or that it was just a way to show that Alencia has become a strong ruler. I appreciate the fact that people love Alencia. She definitely was one of my favorite characters from the last game, and from this series so far. Still, I recommend putting aside nostalgia for her arc in Path of Radiance, and thinking about just her in this game. Why is Alencia being focused on here? Just like they'll do with Ike over Micaiah, Jumping to Alencia here is the game focusing on completely the wrong character. Alencia isn't very important to this plot. Sanaki is. She is the character who should be having her perspective displayed here. Empress Sanaki is critical to this plot. She plays an important role in every part of it, and she's naturally one of the few characters who has to go into the tower at the end of the game. Alencia is not. Instead, she's developed here, which is at least fun to see, but she will then go on to have one major action later on, and then slink into the obscurity of being an optional army unit for Chapter 4. To me, it seems like she only gets the spotlight here due to her being so important in the last game. That, or because she's cute. Neither of those can justify this bizarre focus on her here. As I said, no other story in the series thus far has left me more conflicted than this one. And I believe the root of my problem lies with the two different priorities that the story writers seem to have. Radiant Dawn is both A, devoted to depicting the events in the game which lead to the release of the goddesses and the battles thereafter, and B, giving everybody something to do, no matter how trivial. 
The effects of this dichotomy are obvious. Everything related to the first goal is pretty uniformly fantastic. The struggle of the Daeans, the war between Gallia and the Empire, the exile of the Apostle from her own country, the release of Yune and then the judgment of Ashera, broken down to its skeleton, this is a really great plot, and a fitting sequel to the last game. Minus the Blood Pact. The Blood Pact thing is really stupid. As for the latter of these goals, all it pretty much does is bloat what would have otherwise been a very well-paced journey. Radiant Dawn is one of the longest games in the franchise, and yet when sitting down to write my synopsis, I actually found it easier to summarize everything that happens, just because so much of it is filler, and I could just go ahead and cut that right out. Seriously, I was amazed that I could cut out the many, many hours you spend in Part 4 before the tower in just about a paragraph. Let's put this in a nutshell. After finishing Path of Radiance, I was worried that the next game wouldn't be able to properly pay off the events depicted in that story. And I'm happy to say that I was wrong. Other than the Blood Pact and finding out that Rajion had actually died at the end despite it really, really not seeming so in the previous game, I was totally happy with where Radiant Dawn took things. However, I appreciated Path of Radiance so much for how fantastically structured it was, and how wonderfully written the character dialogue and scenes were. It seemed to have a clear perspective and a single goal, to tell a good story. This is part of why that game's plot was elevated despite its overall simplicity. Seeing its follow-up both adhere to this practice while also throwing it away was beyond disappointing to me. So I guess that's where I am at. I enjoyed the story, but I also find its structure very, very frustrating. So while we have a step back here, there was a place where the previous game had a lot of room to grow in. And of course that was its gameplay, which is precisely what we'll be looking at next. In order to best quantify everything that this game brought to the table, I'll be splitting this gameplay analysis section into two parts, and I'll be leaving the very unique facets of this game to the next section. For right now, I'll be covering the ways in which Radiant Dawn improved on the gameplay of Path of Radiance, and in my opinion, nearly perfected it. Let's just get two of the biggest improvements out of the way right now the gameplay speed, and the animations. Despite containing some fantastic maps, Path of Radiance could really become a slog to play through. And with stats hidden during the actual battle animations, the enjoyment of watching your characters fight would quickly become dull and pointless. Somehow, even the feature meant to alleviate this, the map-only animations, still could drag on and on, with infamously long turns that encouraged many players to just go do other things until it was their turn again. Right away, I'm very happy to say that Radiant Dawn has fixed all of this. Not only are battles much better animated if you choose to watch them, with buttery smooth animations that are a pleasure to witness, they also just move at a much faster clip. Map-only animations are likewise improved, but the ability to turn off all animations after finishing the game once is a really big incentive to go back for a second run and try out different strategies without wasting any time. Going back for that second run also allows you to have a slightly altered story experience, with certain characters only being recruitable in the second run, who just happen to be the only dark magic casters this time. While the prior improvements are definitely the most significant, since they make the game in general just a lot more fun to play, there are a lot more other improvements to the mini systems that Path of Radiance brought. For example, though Biorhythm in my opinion still remains a superfluous addition, that's more there for thematic reasons than a really noticeable spin on the gameplay, at least in this game it feels more purposeful in the battles, since you now have the ability to adjust your current biorhythm status. Heron Lagu's characters can learn a Galdir that can set all affected units biorhythm at max. This is almost never as useful as a rejuvenation in moving your unit again, but it does come in handy when you're trying to get your unit ready for the next big attack, especially against some of the late game bosses who require a very thoughtful and thoroughly prepared approach. Speaking of the changes to the Herons, of which there are now three who all contain their own strengths and weaknesses, it's worth noting here that Lagoos in general have seen some updates, starting with the addition of Kanto to all the Bird Tribe units. We also have two new controllable Lagoos races, the Wolf Lagoos of Hatari, who were previously unseen until this game and basically function the same as cats, and one single controllable Black Dragon, who also functions like the regular dragons but has the ability to fly. No Kanto, though. On top of this, the variable charge level starts of the Path of Radiance Lagoos have been spread evenly here. Now, all Lagoos start at zero charge without any special ability attached to them. 
but they do now have the capability to learn skills like Half Shift, which can allow the user to always remain transformed, but at half the stat benefit as usual. Due to the Lagoo's transformations now doubling their stats, giving improvements to them in their base forms is now more important than ever, which plays into the bonus XP system, which returns from FE9 with one huge alteration that has some unforeseen consequences. Rather than simply giving a standard level as it used to, levels gained from bonus experience will always result in exactly three stat increases. At first glance, this seems like a worse deal, and early on in my initial playthrough, I was really hesitant to use it, especially when levels in the field could give me five or more stat increases, with plus twos or plus ones happening really infrequently. I really wondered why so many people tended to refer to this bonus XP system as broken. I only wondered this until I came to realize what the always plus three rule really meant. As it says, levels gained with this experience are guaranteed to always give you three stat increases. But what they don't say is that these increases never land on a stat that is already capped. This means that once a unit has maxed out one of their stats, usually the ones their class is most geared towards, these bonus XP levels can force the other lower growth rate stats to go up. As an example, if we take an Armor Knight and raise them normally from level 1 to 15, there's a high chance that they will have max defense and strength, as most Armor Knights have high growth rates in these. Their other stats, like skill and speed, will be much rarer to receive increases. Leveling them in battle from 15 to 20 will not give them any higher chance to raise those other stats, meaning that it is usually more worthwhile to just use an item to promote them and get your promotion bonuses earlier, rather than using up so much potential experience experience to give them five disappointing levels. That is not the case with this bonus XP system. Here, if you can afford it, using bonus XP to level them will definitely give them three stat increases without even worrying about their growth rates, which would be a huge increase. On top of this system, just like the last game, auto promotion has returned, but now all Bayork units will have a third tier class. When promoting, these units automatically learn an advanced skill, which are a lot more useful this time around. These attack skills, on top of their normal effects like cancelling defense stats or healing the user, also do triple damage, giving access to what is effectively a second critical hit chance. Due to the kind of attack ratings that most tier 3 units have, the activation of these will almost always mean a one-hit kill which is kind of needed given how massively populated some of the later maps can be. The incredible strength of these tier 3 skills lowers the necessity of things like the forging system, which returns essentially unchanged, only with the small alteration of your gold coins now being able to be used to take a chance on some random bonuses. These coins also happen to be one of the few things that carry over from Path of Radiance, but there are also some small stat bonuses for any units that you got to max level, as well as potential access to one of the most obscure base conversations in this series history. On top of all this, we also have the rather large overhaul of the skills system to get to. While Path of Radiance toyed with the idea of letting you teach skills to your units, it was rather stingy, requiring you to fully commit, since removing any skill would make it and the item you used to teach it disappear forever. This has been revamped in a rather ambitious way in Radiant Dawn. Quite simply, all restrictions have just been eliminated. Now removing skills simply turns them into items again, ready to be reused for any other qualifying units at no extra cost. While having free reign to move skills around like this could have made the cast a bit too homogenous, giving certain units starting skills which don't play into their capacity cost is both a great way of differentiating them and also giving the player an irreversible choice that isn't too punishing. Removing these starting skills can allow them to be taught to a different unit, but if you ever want to put it on that original unit again, it will no longer be gifted at zero capacity. The punishment of just losing a little bit of potential capacity isn't nearly as strict as permanently deleting it, but I don't think this is done just to be generous. This is a necessary change required by the sheer size of the cast and how this game constantly encourages swapping out your team members as more and more powerful units join you. I've spoken at length in this video series about the imbalance between mounted and unmounted units, and while Radiant Dawn keeps the infamous Kanto ability, not only is it much less egregious in this game due to its map design, it also isn't even close to where comparative unit scaling starts to get troubling. Let's just address my stance on Kanto for any newbies in the audience. It is an incredibly fun mechanic that invariably gives certain units undue amounts of value chosen at the discretion of the developers, not the player. 
Various methods have been used to keep it in check in the past, usually by removing features from it bit by bit. We've seen it in its most neutered Game Boy Advance appearance to its barely restrained version in Path of Radiance. Rather than changing it up in any significant way, Radiant Dawn uses a clever workaround to deal with this issue, while actually changing very little. The solution, it turns out, was quite simple. Rather than changing the skill, just design the maps around it. Whereas before there was nothing an infantry unit could do that a mounted unit couldn't, the long overdue introduction of scalable cliffs into the gameplay here really does go a long way towards keeping footlocked units in the fight. It turns out that this was really all it took, although it doesn't necessarily fix everything, which I'll get into a little bit later. On top of adding vertical design that mounted units can't take advantage of, Kanto is now listed as a locked skill, which has a permanent cost of 10 capacity. If you think about it, that's actually rather cheap for the value of its effect, but it's still nice to see its absurd value be in some way numerically recognized. To me it seems like, at long last, intelligence systems maybe had a realization for how broken mounted units can get. Maybe since both Seth and Titania from the previous two games are very clear examples of this. It's because of this that it is then so confusing that Har and Jill exist as they do here. Wyvern Riders have access to Kanto, and and the ability to fly up cliffs from any point. Unlike Pegasus Riders, they have no weakness to arrows, with only the terrible thunder magic of this game serving as their weakness. This basically makes for two units who can quickly dominate huge portions of this game easily. By part four, and especially the end game, this is less of a problem. But it really wasn't surprising when Hard ended up having the most kills on both of my playthroughs. When listing all of the improvements out that Radiant Dawn brought, it does become more and more apparent that, as always, the Fire Emblem team really is capable of learning from their mistakes and trying to refine things further. They don't always do a perfect job at this, hence the Wyvern issue, but I really do respect all of the other things that they improved in this entry. If we were going from the Binding Blade to the Blazing Blade here, this is probably where the gameplay discussion would end. However, Radiant Dawn isn't just Path of Radiance, but with improvements. No, no, no. Radiant Dawn is weird. Let's get into exactly what I mean next. <laughs> As I covered in the development section, Radiant Dawn had the unenviable task of being the sequel to an underperforming GameCube game, while also being the first entry on a new console that was particularly famous for bringing in a whole new audience unfamiliar with the GameCube era. The decision to split the game into multiple distinct parts was chosen in order to make the story easier to follow for anyone jumping in at this point. But this change also had an enormous effect on the gameplay, in particular concerning the value of units. I first covered the concept of a Jaken quite a while ago now in the Mystery of the Emblem video, seen in how Book 2 of that game highlighted the distinct differences between pre-promoted units who start out already strong with the so-called growth units, who need a good amount of training before they start to match and surpass the former. Throughout the course of a normal Fire Emblem game, where you take the same army from Mission 1 to the end, growth units follow a trajectory, starting out as a bit of a burden, then transforming into unstoppable behemoths of your army. Due to how easy it is to lose a growth unit early on, most games pepper in lots of pre-promotes who are ready to go from the moment you get them, allowing even the most tactically challenged players to still scrape their way to the end. Although there are fans for just about every Fire Emblem character, growth units seem to be much more popular amongst most players, with the endless grinding system of the Sacred Stones and the training units from that game built to specifically cater to that audience. Raising your characters from zero to hero is a big part of the appeal of RPGs in general, which is why it's so surprising to see how the structure of Radiant Dawn flies completely against this idea. I always want to make these gameplay sections spoiler free, but I don't think that anything I'm going to say is too shocking. It's important to understand the general layout of this game and how it works for the points that I'm about to bring up. I will be avoiding specifics to keep this as spoiler free as I can. So if we break down Radiant Dawn, we have Part 1, Mikaya and the Dawn Brigade, Part 2, Alentia and her Guard, Part 3, Ike and the Grail Mercenaries with a few Mikaya chapters interspersed, and Part 4, an even number of 
of chapters split between Micaiah's army, Ike's army, and a third army, followed by a marathon finale that includes whoever you choose. As you go through this game, your point of view character is constantly being shifted around, and after control of one group is taken away, it might be quite a long time before you get back to any particular character. As the chapters continue, unused characters from earlier parts of the game will stagnate. But regardless of this, the power of enemies still steadily creeps upwards. This can make returning back to a long, unused army rather jarring. And this is nowhere better illustrated than with the strange case of the Dawn Brigade. Controlled right from the outset, the general makeup of these fighters are instantly familiar. We have the thief Soth as our pre-promote, basically the Jagan, with some other growth units who have varied starting power. For example, we have the weaker Leonardo and Edward, and the decently strong Nolan. Part 1 essentially plays out like a miniature Fire Emblem game, and it puts its players in very familiar territory. By the finale of this section, if you didn't depend too much on your pre-promotes, you're likely to have at least one of your growth units to their first promotion, and I imagine that things are feeling pretty good. And that's when, well, plot happens. Micaiah suddenly promotes, and the unique structure of the game kicks in hard. Part 2 transfers you over to a new group of units who would be pretty close in power to where you left the Dawn Brigade. And while this section of the game is too short to get in too much development, Alencia's group does still climb in power, and will end at around where the Dawn Brigade would have been if you were controlling them for that time. Of course, Part 3 brings in Ike and the Grail mercenaries who start out rather powerful, even compared to the units we were using in Part 2. Meaning at this point, the Dawn Brigade, though they have been unseen, have fallen really, really behind. Chapter 6 of this section, where you suddenly return to controlling them, is widely seen as one of the most challenging levels in this game. Not only from the power imbalance between them and the Lagoos you'll be facing, but also from the fact that this level is a swampy, fog-of-war defense map with very little defensive terrain. This map is also where I suffered my one ally death in both of my runs. And for both of them, it was Eren. In order to make this and the later Dawn Brigade chapters more doable, Radiant Dawn brings in a somewhat janky form of scaling, which comes often in the form of sudden artificial boosts. Shortly before this chapter begins, Micaiah and her soldiers are rather unceremoniously gifted the National Treasures of Dayan, three powerful weapons which become the personal weapons for the three starting growth units. These new weapons are specifically here to try and make up for the power gap that has already developed, and it happens to be a gap that these weapons are woefully inadequate for, nor do they help the further widening of this gap as time goes on. This isn't an accident, it's a byproduct of Radiant Dawn's core design. As the difficulty level continues to climb, the only way around this for units that you don't use for long stretches of time is to keep gifting them new items and pre-promoted units. Whereas before pre-promotes were intended to keep struggling players going, here they are a necessity to keep even skilled players on par with their enemies. Since a lot of the time you'll be facing units that you yourself raised, this can lead to justifying some very bizarre player behavior. For example, in higher difficulties, you'd be wise to purposely nerf the Grail mercenaries by intentionally giving them all the wrong types of weapons before starting a mission where you go back to playing as the Dawn Brigade. Part 4 of this game is almost entirely dedicated to giving you the chance to try to even out the disparity in power yourself before reaching the very, very end of the game, which is done by subjecting you to a series of shockingly drawn-out Rout the Enemy missions, which are flush with powerful foes and way too many reinforcements. These encounters contain very little story progression, and are just big, elongated fights, similar to the Clash mission from Path of Radiance, but stretched out even longer and put on repeat. I really hate how much these missions hurt the pacing of the story, even though, in gameplay terms, they are absolutely necessary. These missions finally give players the chance to raise the units that they want to raise. Or at least that's what they want you to think. Raising your units during this time is absolutely not worth the investment. Literally right at the gates of the finale, the game asks you to select 11 characters total to bring with you for the remainder of the end game something which they do just after giving you full access to every Royal Lagoos in the game. These are abnormally powerful units who right out of the gate can single-handedly take you to the end. 
So, since including them is a pretty natural and recommended choice, out of the 11 units you can select, of which one has to be a Heron, it only really matters if you raised 6 units out of this entire cast. For me, it sort of feels like all that time in part 1, 2, and 3, where I was trying to raise some specific units that I liked, feel a little bit wasted. It's hard to say whether this journey of constantly having your best sources of power be gifted and not earned is a positive or a negative. As I stated before, the structure of the game is part of what makes Radiant Dawn so unique. Calling this a good or a bad thing depends on perspective. I came to this game after playing through all nine prior entries, which, even with a few black sheep or oddities mixed in there, all stuck to the same general structure as the first game. That definitely isn't the case here, and there are benefits to the system. For example, I really do like how constantly having your resources shift around does make this feel more like a standard strategy game, where your on-the-fly flexibility and using what you suddenly have, even if you weren't raising it until that point, is just as important as any future planning that you hope to be doing. On the other hand, if you really like investing in some units and watching them form into a cohesive team in the late game, which I'd say is a reasonable expectation given the direction of every other game, then the ultimate path of playing Radiant Dawn and having all your best work replaced all the time is likely going to feel a bit frustrating or underwhelming. For some people, this could be the best Fire Emblem, while to others, it could be one of the worst. Much like my time with Gaiden and Genealogy, I found this change to the formula to be refreshing, but if I were forced to pick a side, then I'd have to say that this whole structure really isn't for me. I really do like how, up until at least the final part of the game, segmenting the units and constantly handing out new characters helped to keep the gameplay moving at a really fast pace. Doing so almost completely removes the need for the planning and maintenance phase of each chapter, and due to there being little reason to stop and do too much planning and army management, this massive game actually moves along pretty quickly. At the same time, as slow as the planning phase can be, there's still something irreplaceable in all of that. In my in my eyes, it's part of the joy of playing Fire Emblem and not just any other strategy game. Well, I think I've said just about everything that I want to say about this game. It's finally time that we wrap up both this entry and our adventures in Tellius. It's strange to think that, little over a year ago, the Fire Emblem series as a whole was not much more than an enigma to me. I couldn't have said anything about the series before undertaking this project, nor could I have described the lands of Arcania, Yggdrol, Elib, Magvil, or Tellius. Out of all these places, I have been most anticipating getting to the Tellius games, because they were around on the shelves when I was just starting to get some disposable income and begin buying games on my own. I can still remember seeing Path of Radiance with a used sticker on it, and I recall seeing Radiant Dawn on the shelf. Due to my propensity for always playing games in release order, I never picked them up at the time, and given how rare and expensive both of these games have become, it's something that I guess I'll always have to regret. Even as hungry for RPGs as I was back then, I, like many people, never bought them. To be honest, it makes me sad when I think about that now. It's funny to see where I am now at the end of the Telia saga, and think about just how much I robbed myself of something that I would have especially loved at the time. These are two games that I can only regard with an incredible amount of respect. Path of Radiance was a flawed beginning to 3D Fire Emblem, and Radiant Dawn was a flawed follow-up. Yet, both of these games have resulted in some very special memories that I'd never give up. Speaking specifically of Radiant Dawn, it's rare to see a sequel try to do so much all at once. Simply updating systems and improving gameplay is respectable, and can make for good, even great games. But striking out so much on your own, even if some mistakes are made, is so much bolder a path. One thing that I can only say for Radiant Dawn is, if I felt a sudden longing to play a traditional Fire Emblem game, I would have to likely debate within myself if I wanted to play Fire Emblem 1, or 3, or 5, or whatever. On the other hand, if I want to revisit any of the feelings that I got from playing Radiant Dawn, well, then I only have one place to go. I can't say that I love this overambitious mess of a game, but I can say that I recommend it. 
In places, it did come extremely close to what I'd call almost the perfect sequel, paying off much of the story setups and coming up with some fantastic ideas for rebalancing and improving on the last game's strengths. Even if that isn't where the game ultimately stayed, I know for certain that I will never forget my time with it. And I also know that my time spent in Tellius has been, without a doubt, extremely satisfying. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us back into handheld gaming. Once again, we will join Marth as he takes on the forces of Medius in Fire Emblem 11 Shadow Dragon. This month, April 2020, will mark the 30th anniversary of the Fire Emblem series. To celebrate this occasion, I'm starting this month off by covering a game in the franchise that seems to have been mostly forgotten by the internet at large. During its development, it received very little coverage, despite it being the long-lost project of Shozo Kaga started briefly before his departure from Intelligent Systems. Without a doubt, Fire Emblem Ultimate is a hidden gem. This series is no stranger to spin-off games, and naturally this game doesn't play like a typical Fire Emblem. Even though there is some serious depth to get into with its battle mechanics, its very easy to learn nature makes it a game that can easily appeal to almost everyone. Seriously, you could just drop Mario himself into this game, and it wouldn't feel out of place. Even though FE Ultimate only contains a roster of 8 characters, there's actually a lot to get into here. Today, on the Fire Emblem Retrospective, we're going to be taking a look at this forgotten classic in detail. We'll be examining its development history, breaking down its complex storyline, and finishing by taking a look at its story and gameplay, and how it deviated from the strategic RPG systems that this franchise was known for. Let's get smashing! Following the release of 1996's Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, Shozo Kaga envisioned a game that would combine the many lords and lands he created into one. During the development of Kaga's fifth Fire Emblem, Thracia 776, in his spare time, he created the first prototype for his idea, an early build which merely consisted of Marth and a simple sandbag character. This was as far as the game ever got before Kaga's sudden departure from Intelligent Systems. And though he did take his early work with him, he was unaware that he had left a copy of this early build of the game on his office PC, an oversight that would actually save this project in the long term. Though Kaga could see the the great potential of this game, which he had originally named Super Fire Emblem Saga Bros, he had left his former employer under the idea that he could continue his work on it at his own company, Tirnanok. Despite no longer owning the rights to his former characters, he stated at the time that he hoped he would still be able to add Alm, Celica, Jagan, the corpse of Sigurd, Selif, and of course, the iconic Leaf to the project. A wonderful idea that would never come to pass due to legal threat by Nintendo. It thus became up to the current staff at Intelligent Systems to continue where Kaga had left off which, unbeknownst to him, they did. Due to the extra time gained by reusing assets from the Binding Blade for two more games, the board staff at Intelligent Systems took what remained of Super Fire Emblem Saga Bros and renamed it simply to Fire Emblem Melee. They even managed to add in the character of Roy. Although Fire Emblem Melee never got off the ground, citing a lack of enough Fire Emblem characters, the next build, codenamed Fire Emblem Brawl, cut Roy out of the game and replaced him with Ike. When the higher ups at Intelligent Systems heard about this, they were furious, angrily stating that Roy was their boy and this project would never get off the ground. Thankfully, this mistake was rectified with the following build, codenamed Fire Emblem for Wii U and 3DS, which not only returned Roy to the game, but also introduced Lucina and Robin from Fire Emblem Emblem Awakening, as well as Corrin from Fire Emblem Fates. The final build of this near 15-year-old project would finally see release as Fire Emblem Ultimate. With the addition of Krom, the roster had grown to seven, and the very few people who knew about this game rapidly debated who the eighth final entry would be. 
Fire Emblem Ultimate Reddit threads were tense, with some in the community hoping for Master Chief, some hoping for Waluigi, and even some hoping for Dante from the Devil May Cry series. After over a year of anticipation, the final character was revealed to be Byleth from Fire Emblem Three Houses, a choice that everyone in the community could be happy with. Before getting into the following story synopsis, I feel it's best to preface that the story of Effie Ultimate is really quite unique. Rather than having just one lord which you follow throughout the story, the game instead has many chunks as you play as each of the eight characters. Somewhere, on a cliff facing the sunrise, Prince Marth of Altea stood to face a new foe. The enemy, known as Casual Hand, had come to spread his influence to Arcania, just as it had done to so many other worlds before. In an instant, a blinding flash of light spread over the land, and Marth awakened to find himself standing on the battlements of an unknown castle, fighting an unknown enemy. After swiftly dispatching the strange-looking Manakeet, Marth ventured inside the castle, clearing out a wave of lesser dragons before encountering a familiar foe, the Earth Dragon Medius, looking different from before. Without a word, Marth engaged his old enemy for the third time, but this time, Medius was ready for him. After losing the first round, Medius assumed a vile new form, launching himself at Marth again. After the Hero King came out victorious here as well, Medius took on one final form, that of the legendary dragon Rathalos. After much effort and save scumming, Marth defeated his foe, and as Medius' body crumbled, Marth looked out at the horizon, wondering how he would ever get home. Marth set out on a new journey for the first time without a destination. Following the assimilation of all worlds by casual hand, Roy found himself suddenly atop a strange castle, standing alongside three blue-haired warriors. Despite these four all being fighters for good in their own worlds, upon seeing each other and the swords they all wielded, they quickly took up battle with Roy and his Binding Blade ultimately coming out victorious. From atop the battlement, Roy spotted a mysterious round figure also holding a sword. Already feeling that there were too many sword fighters in this world, he came down from the castle and followed the mystery knight inside a nearby fort. Within, the little warrior turned his sword on Roy, and during the battle, the platform they had been standing on suddenly launched itself into the sky. After finishing his first fight, Roy found that he had been taken elsewhere, and each time a new sword-wielding foe would board and challenge him. After coming out victorious three times in a row, the platform he had been unintentionally riding came to a rest in a sandy arena, where three more sword fighters approached him, as sword upon sword upon sword upon sword clashed! It was Roy who claimed victory in the end. Despite being the winner, Roy felt he could not rest. He knew that he had been put through a trial, but why and by whom were still a mystery to him. Finding himself suddenly on a strange castle in a strange land, the story of Ike picks up after his being flung from the walls by Roy. After plummeting far below, Ike found himself unharmed after landing near a small dreamlike fountain. Before he had time to admire his surroundings, he found himself under attack. After fending off the black-clad knight and his henchmen, Ike set out on the only path he could see, a cliffside that eventually led him into another confrontation with more black-clad figures. As he cut through the enemies on his path with ease, Ike was able to arrive back at the castle from which he had fallen. Instead of finding Roy here, he instead found a different boy with black wings, seemingly yet another survivor of the Heron Lagoos. Without warning, the Lagoos boy sang an unknown Galdir, which crumbled the castle beneath Ike's feet and sent him plummeting back down again the way he had come. After arriving at the bottom, Ike found himself standing on a lonely bridge, facing two more dark challengers. After defeating them both, he looked out at the horizon, wondering how he would ever see his friends, or even Tellius, ever again. Though the first time we saw Lucina in this tale was in the battle with Roy and the others, in truth, she was not in this world by accident. 
coming from a future where her father Krom, as well as the other great fighters of Yelise had suddenly disappeared, Lucina had grown up in a world under the rule of the Hands. Now, having successfully traveled back to this moment, she knew exactly where she was, a world where battles were ever-present. But permadeath was impossible. Casual Hands Domain. As planned, she did arrive at Krom's location, but her journey soon went off track when her father, along with the other heroes she intended to save, all began fighting each other. Unable to stop these three at once, Lucina found herself flung from the castle walls, and upon landing safely, she set out on a quest to defeat and recruit each of the heroes one by one. She first found Corrin, who, after being defeated, was the first to learn the truth about their current location and the devious plans of Casual Hand. Following this, Lucina set out to do the same for the others, next successfully locating Krom, Robin, Ike, Roy, and even King Marth, before beating them in combat and talking sense into them. With these seven heroes united, she knew that there was only one thing left to do. With the truth of this world revealed thanks to the work of Lucina, the seven assembled heroes, as well as the alternate versions of Corrin and Robin from other timelines, met to discuss their next course of action. After learning that a mysterious eighth hero would be needed in order to break the seal and confront the hands, Robin devised a plan. Krom and Lucina would travel together in search of this mysterious last hero, while the others prepared themselves for the final battle. With this plan agreed to, the male Robin immediately set out to try and achieve new levels of magical power by challenging some of the most powerful creatures of the land. After battling rats, cats, rats, and even a turtle, the tactician found himself confronted by his alternate self, who revealed that she too had come from a world taken over by the hands, and was secretly the dark vessel of classic hands power. As Robin faced Robin, it was the male who prevailed. With the other Robin's last words, she wondered if fighting really was the answer, and hoped that, in another world, the two of them could have been friends. It was then that she died, so that you would feel bad. Just as Robin had done, Corrin and her alternate self set out on a training journey, and along the way, they each found new friends. Shortly after recruiting these allies, each immediately started calling Robin Big Brother or Big Sister, as well as pledging their undying love for them. When the two Corrins finally reunited, to their surprise, the two groups they had recruited suddenly started to fight each other, revealing that they were in fact bitter enemies. A massive battle broke out, with Corrin stuck in the middle, and after some initial fighting, at last, everyone calmed down. Due to loving Corrin so much, both sides agreed to forgive each other, end the war, and start being best friends. In order to maintain this peace, female Corrin agreed to stay with both groups and keep the peace, while the other Corrin returned back to the agreed meeting spot to await the return of the other lords. Compared to the rest of the series, Corrin's story seems to have had a significant drop in the quality of writing. This is due to a large amount of the plot having been cut at the last moment for unknown reasons. Picking back up with Krom, as planned, he set out with Lucina in order to find the last hero they needed. As the duo fought through more of the otherworldly creatures inhabiting this world, during their journey, Krom and Lucina discussed the terrible fate of the world under the control of Casual Hand, and that this was only half of the picture. Other lands had been conquered by a different being, Classic Hand. Both of these beings had their own blindly devoted followers, leading to a constant pointless war. As Krom and Lucina arrived at their destination, a dark castle outside of the influence of Casual Hand, Krom promised his daughter that he would never let such a future come to pass. Within the castle, they found what they were looking for, an altar which housed the one tool they needed to free the final hero. Standing before this altar were two powerful warriors, who introduced themselves as servants to Classic Hand, and warned them that no turn wheel could save them now. Krom and his daughter engaged the pair, and though they both suffered terrible injuries in the fighting, ultimately, they bested the two guardians. Arm in arm, the two heroes approached the altar, finding the legendary Fighter's Pass resting atop it. As they reached out, a link to the Nintendo eShop was triggered.
With the fighter's pass paid for, Byleth emerged, finding the critically injured Krom and Lucina before her. Together, the three made their way back, and at long last, the eight heroes needed to challenge this world's masters were finally assembled. Though Krom and Lucina had recovered much of their strength on the journey back, they knew that they would only be a burden fighting in their condition, and agreed that they would have to stay out for now. As the eight heroes put their weapons together, a sudden reaction occurred, transporting them all to their final destination, where both Casual Hand and Classic Hand emerged, ready to face the assembled fighters. With Krom and Lucina looking on, Byleth, Marth, Roy, Ike, Robin, and Corrin all engaged the pair of deities together, and through their combined might, finally destroyed them both. As the world around them faded away, the eight heroes had only a moment to say their farewells before, in a flash, they all returned home. At long last, the dominating influence of Casual and Classic Hand was eliminated. People were free to enjoy their fun without arguing which way was right, and across many lands and many Reddit threads, peace had finally been restored. As the culmination of decades of work throughout the series' turbulent history, it's refreshing to say that Fire Emblem Ultimate is a worthy inheritor. Other than a few Warriors games, I really can't think of any other big Nintendo games that bring characters from so many different worlds together into one place. This is why I have to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. As you may have noticed in the gameplay clips I used, various characters from throughout Nintendo's history also appear in this game, taking the place of the faceless soldiers you would normally fight in your typical Fire Emblem. This is strange for all manner of reasons. Despite these other characters being completely unplayable, if you look very closely at them and their animations, you'll see that every single one of them appears to have been intricately designed with a unique playstyle all their own. Now, I'm not saying that these characters should be playable. This is a Fire Emblem game first and foremost. But what makes this sting a little bit more is that somehow we still have clones within the playable roster, specifically Marth and Lucina, as well as Roy and Krom. To me, it just seems strange to spend so much development time to give a nobody like Bayonetta, who I know for a fact never even finished Thracia 776, her own totally unique and awesome fighting style. The strangest part of all of this isn't something that just stops with Bayonetta. If you go through the trouble of examining all possible enemy fighters, you'll find that their number actually completely dwarfs the roster of eight Fire Emblem characters that we got. Now, even though I think this would never happen, it really does make me wonder what it would be like if all these characters were suddenly made playable, and we just had one incredible fighting game that allowed you to match up not only the Lords of Fire Emblem, but heroes from all throughout Nintendo's history. They could even throw in some third-party characters as well. Now, I know that's impossible, but it just makes you wonder, what would you call such a game? Big thank you to my top patrons, DW7 Still Rules, Henry Gutierrez, John Morrison, Ryan Poe, and Shin Lu, as well as to all my other patrons. If you'd also like your name to join this list of people supporting the channel, please check out the link in the description. Thank you all very much.